Hello again, everyone, and welcome. I am Mike Montagna, original 1968 architect of Mathematically Perfected Economy and founder of People for Mathematically Perfected Economy. This program, Mike Montagna on Mathematically Perfected Economy and Absolute Consensual Representation, pertains to a vital, long-standing fact of singular monetary solution. This weekly broadcast begins regularly at 3 p.m. Pacific Time each Saturday, today on November 27, 2010, from TNS Radio, tnsradio.com, that's TNS, Tir Nassar, Land of the Free. Original material copyright and trademarked by Mike Montagna, all rights reserved. This broadcast is the sixth of a set of introductory programs which are best negotiated in order as previous material develops a vital background for what follows. Links to archives of this and previous programs are available at tnsradio.com and through the domain perfectedeconomy.org. In our preceding programs, we covered the serious issues that the purported banking systems which have been imposed upon the world are not truly issuers of credit, that they are not actual creditors at all, how they merely intervene upon our commerce to merely publish evidence of our promissory obligations to each other, how their first monumental crime against us is that they launder all the principle ever created into their possession, and how their second, even more monumental crime against us is that by an, an implicit obligation to maintain a vital circulation subject to interest, interest multiplies initial artificial indebtedness into terminal artificial indebtedness as we are forced to maintain a vital circulation only so long as we can by perpetually reborrowing principal and interest as ever greater sums of debt perpetually increased even at an inherently ever escalating rate of ever greater sums of periodic interest on an ever greater sum of debt until we succumb to the present terminal sums of artificial indebtedness. We taught how the singular solution of the categoric faults of these pretended economies is mathematically perfected economy. How mathematically perfected economy and mathematically perfected economy alone solves the categoric faults of inflation, deflation, and maldisposition of systemic manipulation of the cost or value of money or property, and of inherent, irreversible, and therefore terminal multiplication of artificial indebtedness by interest. We covered, therefore, how the terminal consequences of the present artificial, wholly avoidable monetary failure are engendered by a purposed obfuscation of the currency, embodying an irreversible process by which the purported central banking systems of the world multiply exploitation into terminal exploitation, imposed, therefore, by an irreversible multiplication of artificial indebtedness. We taught how the resultant failure is averted and how the consequences are immediately rectified by a prescription for immediate and virtually costless transfer transformation of usury into mathematically perfected economy. In today's program, we have promised to teach implementation. Largely, we can understand the general implementation of mathematically perfected economy as the only true economy, only true free enterprise, 
and only true free market, in all of which what I have called a common monetary foundry replaces the purported banking system and restores the sovereign right of every individual to issue their promissory obligations free of exploitation, subject to an obligatory schedule of payment, retiring principal at the rate of consumption or depreciation of the related property. Altogether then, the CMF certifies our creditworthiness, maintains our accounts, performs and enforces payment, and, if money is to be issued in physical forms in the chosen implementation of any given nation, the CMF, therefore, issues money in the common forms we are familiar with. As the common monetary foundry is compelled to deploy practical automations, the common monetary foundry largely exists as software and data, performing its functions automatically, including deposit of pay, payment of bills, receipt of payment, and delivery of payment in electronic commerce. Instead of carrying money, we might only carry a card similar to a debit card. Physical money, automated teller machines, and the like might largely be considered no longer necessary, but these are discretionary issues of implementation to be decided by the people under our worldwide mandate for mathematically perfected economy and absolute consensual representation. The principal obligation of the common monetary foundry, therefore, is simply to embody our two vital facets of solution, eradication of interest and an obligatory schedule of payment which together, as we have demonstrated, preserve an immutable value of money, eradicate inflation, deflation, and maldisposition, eradicate systemic manipulation of the cost or value of money or property, and eradicate inherent, irreversible, and therefore terminal multiplication of artificial indebtedness, the cause of the present failure. Under mathematically perfected economy, therefore, a $100,000 home with a 100-year lifespan costs us only $1,000 a year, or $83.33 a month. In rectifying the consequences of usury, our transformation to mathematically perfected economy necessarily refinances all debt under mathematically perfected economy, counting all prior payments of interest instead toward principal. Thus, the basic implementation of mathematically perfected economy is something like a bank, but without any banks at all, with only the in internal accounting system administering to our affairs by simple arithmetic bound to the few indispensable principles of our fact of singular monetary solution. In all this then, we are simply monetizing our production at virtually no cost. Mathematically perfected economy is practically the monetary equivalent of barter except, of course, that, in, that it enjoys the further universal tokenization of a currency. Mathematically perfected of all fault, and which allow us not actually to assume debt, but to pay for our consumption of production with no more than equal production as we consume of it. 
In today's program, Carl Jones of Ottawa, Canada raised some of the general questions any diligent person would want to grasp that a sufficiently informed people may so equip themselves as to soon establish mathematically perfected economy. The following was our discussion. If we can recall where we were, you were you were explaining the basic problem from um, your perspective of uh, starting back uh, several hundred years, five hundred years or so. Yeah, the the way I look at it, and I think the way we probably have to explain it to everybody that may or may not understand it is that uh, four or five hundred years ago. You know, gold and silver was the only way that you could purchase anything. So you had to have one or the other to be able to buy anything. So that was how that was how you know the economy was. What banking did uh, at a later stage, it it brought in the idea of credit, which allowed people to. Well, in essence, buy now and pay later, um, or pay in stages until it was all paid off, which is all well and good. Um, but the, I think the whole idea of it was that that was still based uh, on gold. We will give you a certain amount of gold, but because we're giving you gold and we can't use it, then we're going to charge you extra because of that. That was the interest portion of it. Um, now, as the time's gone on and gold has been removed, all we're left with is the, the credit system. So what, uh, what's happened is that the, the interest has remained and the credit is still there, but it's not backed by anything, gold or silver. Um, and I think even then it was probably uh, morally correct maybe to charge the interest because you know i was using somebody else's gold but when it got to the stage of credit only created out of nothing there's absolutely no requirement for interest whatsoever uh, and that's the problem we found ourselves in and you've adequately explained over the um the period of your broadcasts for the last several weeks well um i uh you know uh I'm uh, I'm not really comfortable with this idea of uh, you know gold or silver being the origins of money. Um, in fact, uh, you know I've done uh, I wouldn't say by any stretch of the imagination exhaustive uh, research on ancient economies, uh, including. Uh, you know, barter systems of the Native Americans, for instance, they used um, different kinds of uh, um, trinkets, we might call them, as uh, uh, a medium of exchange. Um, and these things appear to me to have arisen in human history at, at many times in many ways. Um, largely, I myself, I, I tried to put myself in the, um, in the role, so to speak, of, of, a, of a person, say, in, in the different circumstances of ancient societies to attempt to intuit how you know, currencies may have arisen. And the, the, the general idea that sticks in my cross, so to speak, uh, is, is the idea of, of that virtually everyone was faced with in um, any system of, of barter and markets. And uh, I, I wrote some articles uh, to this effect uh, many years ago, and they, like all the rest of my work, have been substantially plagiarized. But, if you will, what I did was imagine myself going to a market and, and, 
and um, confronted uh, with the regular circumstances of the market, which basically are um, that given a lack of currency, we have uh, substantial difficulty in effecting any intended trade. That is, uh, we might go to, to a market with uh, perhaps uh, three goats and uh, 20 chickens, and uh, what uh, we really desire to have perhaps is a, is a very good herding dog. And uh, we figure that what we've brought to market ought to be worth um, such a dog uh, as we conceive and, and aspire to have. But uh, nonetheless, it may not be at all uh, what uh, the owner of such a dog, should we find one, uh, may want in, in, in turn for, for their dog. So... Um, what would happen, as I conceive this, is that uh, you would go to market and, uh, well, say your neighbor goes with you and you have him watch your, you know, your, your assets while you quickly uh, make a dash through the market attempting to find the kind of dog you, you want. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, you discover the very dog you, you, you'd wanted. Um, but the owner, um, he wants a cow. And uh, so what, what do you do? You, you, you run around the market and you, 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 f you find, oh, whatever, three or four people who've brought cows of, 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 uh, which reasonably answer to, you know, what this owner of this dog has wanted. And uh, uh, yet none of the owners of the cows want your three goats and 20 hens for the cow. So you still can't affect the trade. But each of them wants something else. So you dash about the market looking for people that ha possess those items who might want to trade for a cow. And finally, you find one. And so what do you do? You issue this person a promissory obligation that you will deliver your uh, three goats and 20 chickens to this person. If this person will deliver whatever they have to the person who has the cow, who will deliver the cow to this person who has the dog so that you can have the dog. And uh, then you go to the person who has the dog and you, uh, um, you uh, inform them that you've arranged for this trade. Uh, should this cow be um, to meet their standards? And uh, so, as I see it, there would have been a regular inspiration to create the very kind of currency which we still need to abide by, <clears throat> and that is uh, a mere promissory obligation. In truth, these things are not actually debts, even. Uh, a promissory obligation is simply a promise to give up something in turn for something else. And uh, the obligation of a promissory obligation is, is to fulfill it. So that's still the situation that we have. And I can see uh, how it would have been uh, an irregular, uh, a regular occurrence at a market, at, at, at all markets that ever arose into existence, to adopt um, such a manner of trading. So I don't believe at all, and I don't believe there's any historic record of such a thing, that banks, in fact, introduced the idea of credit. What I believe actually happened was that Given that such a manner of trade would have arisen virtually anywhere and everywhere in the world as a natural uh, consequences, a co consequence of the shortcomings of not having a currency, that is, a, 
a medium of exchange, which is an immutable tokenization of value, which serves to trade any wealth for any other wealth. Lacking that, um, I can see that this would have been a, a prevalent manner of trading, the actual um, individual invention, if you will, of, of currency. And what I think actually probably happened was that at later times in different places, someone um, uh, took over the property that the market was held in. And in other words, you brought your your goods every Sunday or or Friday or whatever to this market, and or every day of the week or whatever. Um, and this person that owned the property decided uh, um, that uh, um, they would they had a a, a a a better idea. They would they would issue these promissory obligations. Um, uh, on behalf of the person who's the actual obligor of the of the arrangement, and um, so instead of you issuing a, a, an affidavit or a, a, a receipt for the fact that you possess three goats and twenty chickens that you wish to trade for a dog, they instead um, issued that same obligation and eventually sought to charge for it and um, in the case of interest sought to charge in a way which forced everyone to um, to give up property at an ever escalating rate um, merely to participate in the market and when the profit profitability of that was discovered um, however unwarranted it, it might have been, um, I think this would have been the beginnings of what we today call banking, which, of course, is not about banking at all. It exists merely um, to impose this obfuscation of the currency. This person who's issuing this third party who gives up nothing, uh, no consideration of of, of, of lawful concern um, is not a true issuer of credit. Um, all they're doing is, is issuing evidence of, uh, of, of our promissory obligations to each other, just as is happening today. So I see this as more or less an incidental um, uh, invention or discovery. Uh, however, intentional or inadvertent, um, which, of course, um, can be in understood from its very beginnings to be uh, a means of, 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 of vast dispossession. So the next step in this evolution of this thing would be uh, that, uh, you know, you would, you would seek to... Uh, uh, proliferate to extend the domain uh, over which you were the third party who is a falsified creditor who merely publishes evidence of our promissory obligations to each other and first then um, as is the case with the present central banking systems of the world, launders the principal into their possession. When you pay the, uh, you know, the three goats and twenty chickens, um, you you pay them to me, and and I get to uh, launder those into to my possession. And when you're doing this with paper, you can do that. And uh, so that's how I see all this evolving. I mean. After all, I, I, I frankly, I see no uh, original inspiration for uh, an extrinsic party to intervene upon our commerce uh, ostensibly uh, to our benefit when, in fact, um, the only power and therefore the only possible purpose of what they're doing is to take from us. I never see it as a... Uh, 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 as a uh, a beneficent innovation. I, I see it only as a, a de device, um, an imposed device, generally, most likely, 
of of uh, of unascended um, dispossession. Yeah, the um, the more I thought about the the initial uh, uh, start, let's say, uh, of how money was used in banking, it always brought me back to uh, the old England as well with the uh, uh, the tally sticks. Uh, now again, that was the similar in in concept to the receipt system. I mean, that worked apparently for around 700 years in uh, early English uh, history. Um, and, and that was just basically a stick with notches across, split in two. And the bank, or in this case it was the king, the treasury, kept one half and the... Um, the person who was lodging the money or wealth, whatever it might be, got the other part, and then that, well, that was done the same way. Um, so it's how we got from that to the Bank of England in 1694, um, and how we we then started getting the the issue of paper receipts, uh, and how fractional reserve started. Um, and why? I mean, you alluded, obviously, that uh, it wasn't really to help people. It was more of a case of somebody realized um, they could make more money from doing it this way and, and steal actual property and wealth from others. Um, and I'm trying to remember, there was a specific, uh, I think it was a Scotsman, uh, uh, I can't remember his name, whether it was Bell or something similar. There was a Scotsman that came up with a uh, an idea that was very similar to like the Ponzi scheme and the initial banking. And I don't know if you remember the name of the guy or if you were aware of him, Mike, but um, if I can find it, it would be helpful because I think he came up with uh, some of the early uh, idea about how this fractional reserve and the initial banking system came about. Now, he was found out and uh, I think he was sent oh, to prison. Oh, I think but... I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I can't recall his name either. Um, yeah. Rather than um, rather than go to all those places, which are you know, that was a scheme, and and it's a famous. Yes, it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, is that the one that manifested in the in the expression the theft of teapot dome? I believe it was. Um, in any case, let's connect the the first dots. Uh, how we got this this Bank of England and 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 all. Um, my research uncovers uh, uh, let's say um, a basic uh, flavor of of events, which which. Uh, Established more or less that, um, well, on the one part, there's this uh, religious connotation of the ramifications or implications of, of improprieties of, uh, of many systems. Um, and yet, uh, no fact of absolute solution ever emerged out of the difficulties. And, you know, getting back closer to present history, it strikes me, um, I often wonder, it, it seems to me, that uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson, first and foremost, um, Abraham Lincoln, secondly, um, and other men such as uh, James Madison, um, all of whom um, spoke uh, quite profoundly uh, about... um, let's say, the developing principles of, of monetization, it, it, it's often a great curiosity to me that somehow uh, they never uh, resolved the iniquities that they perceived into 
um, a fact of, of, of solution. Uh, and, and probably, I think, uh, Benjamin Franklin's paper, uh, A Modest Inquiry into the Nature and Necessity of a Paper Currency, is a great example of that because um, as I read it when I discovered it, you know, I was on the edge of my seat, so to speak, uh, you know, rocking back and forth in my chair. And I'm thinking, my God, why can't you ask the next question? Because there is a question that resolves this issue. Why can't you answer? A- ask it. It's so easy to answer, you know. And I, I marvel um, that so many people of of such marvelous uh, stature and intelligence um, nonetheless uh, cut themselves short somehow of 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 developing um, their perceptions into solution even as they saw an an obvious need for solution in the case of Franklin for instance we can develop the question right off the top of our head if if he if he if he noted that uh, the colonial uh, economy in Pennsylvania benefited from increases in paper circulation then we should ask uh, you know I mean any time uh, uh, a proposition, and particularly a, a mathematic proposition, is cast our way, um, how do we uh, determine uh, that it is valid or not? Uh, we put it to the test. Uh, the first thing we ask about a possible range of values is what is the upper limit? Of, of 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 the range and what is the lower limit of the range and and what is the exact amount it may best be governed to be and so in the case of this proposition that uh, the Pennsylvania colony benefited from an increase in circulation the questions we should ask is well what's the upper limit of the circulation he he, he postulates very roughly, um, that uh, that an increase in, in 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 circulation would have been beneficial, but too much would be adverse, and too little would be, to use just any general word which works, encumbering. Um, and so, the, a question should, or a set of questions, should be devised immediately. To answer this, because uh, he's obviously pondering an issue which would benefit all humanity if there were, if a solution was realized. So we ask, what would be too much solution? And we evaluate um, prospective possibilities. Start with the proposition of infinity, for instance. Well, it would seem obvious that infinity couldn't possibly even exist because what would we have issued money for? And if everyone had so much money as infinity, why would anyone produce? It's only when we need to procure further production um, than what we have so far that we produce further so that we can trade for production. And what does that mean? That means itself that the volume of circulation can only equal um, the remaining value of production if it's representative at at all. And so immediately we, 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 we basically realize another issue, and that is that, well, if that's the case, um, then... Um, what is money? Uh, we all perceive it to be a tokenization of value, but if its volume changes inappropriately somehow, that has a proportional ca- capacity to affect its relative value. So what is the proportion 
that we're after and what is the nature of money that we're after. We bring in another question, and, and all of these things naturally lead to the same answer. No matter where you start in this thing and where you dive into it, it all leads to the same answer because then you start thinking, okay, so what is the nature of money? And you, you, you may not even have a refined idea to begin with, but you can examine every possible uh, manifestation or implementation of a, a, a definition of money. And when you do this, for not very long even, you realize that any form of money which is mutable, which can change, can damage someone. So, uh, you know, if the value of, 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 of money increases, uh, then, uh, uh, you know, property uh, holders are offended. Um, uh, if, if the value of money decreases, then the opposite happens. So we realize that if we're to have a just money, our very, very first rule of, of, of for what money must be is that it must be an immutable token of value if it's to inflict no injustice whatsoever on anyone. Then we realize further <clears throat> that if there is an insufficient circulation to represent all wealth, that there's one particular instance which uh, is, a, is a prospective case of trade which could never be performed, <clears throat> and that is that all wealth couldn't be traded all at once. Well, to a person who doesn't take these principles seriously, that may not seem like such a great offense. But it has tremendous and even uh, um, uh, devastating um, ramifications. How can we understand that? <clears throat> we make a model of it. And let's make a model of it. Let's suppose there's a thousand of us and we're all in a circle. And uh, every day uh, we produce something. Uh, which is worth $10. And to begin this model, we all have $10. Somehow it doesn't matter at this point because that's not what we're, we're not illustrating anything but um, the ramifications of a deficient, of a potentially deficient circulation. So if each of us had $10 and every day each of us produced $10 worth of whatever it is that we produce, and at the end of the day, um, um, we turn to the person on our left who sought to purchase our production from us. For the $10 that they have, our production would be transferred to them. Their trans $10 would be transferred to us. And likewise, we would be consuming the production of the person on our right, which would be transferred to us, and our $10 would have been transferred to them. <clears throat> So long as there is the money in circulation to represent all of this production and consumption every day then, the entire uh, system of production can be readily exchanged at any moment or conclusion of any period, such as our model day. But now, <clears throat> if we go around this circle of a thousand people, and in the case of every fifth person, we m remove five dollars from them, such as um, for the prospective reason that they might have paid interest for our promissory obligations to each other, we can readily see what happens. Beginning at person one, we go five people, 
four, the first four transactions can be affected, but when it gets to the fifth person, the transaction cannot be had, nor can the one after it ensue. In fact, the fifth transaction cannot be executed until that person then goes about the circle and earns from someone else the five dollars that they have been ta that has been taken from them so that they can complete the very next transaction and so this happens in every fifth person and of course around a circle of a thousand people it takes far more than a day for all of these uh, voids or nullifications of the necessary volume of the circulation to be fulfilled so that the former commerce which was sustainable only by a system of unexploited immutable tokens of value was readily conveyed so this example itself illustrates the principle that the only um, sufficient circulation which can inflict no injustice at all itself is, e is e equal and capable of representing all the remaining value of all production at all times. So in those few questions alone, Franklin could have answered uh, this paper, uh, you know, finished this paper, uh, modest inquiry, uh, into the nature and necessity of a paper currency could have become uh, an absolute inquiry and resolution of the nature and necessity of a paper currency. In a few minutes, it could have become a com completely different thing. And in just these few questions, we've uh, resolved everything but uh, uh, the... Uh, necessary and indispensable uh, life cycle of a promissory obligation. And that is that uh, as every immutable token of value then must represent the very property for which it is issued, its life cycle must itself parallel the life cycle of the represented property and therefore the inherent and necessary nature of a promissory obligation must be to pay the principal out of circulation or retire it as the represented property is consumed by the person who consumes of it. And in just that little time, we've eliminated uh, every possible injustice of, of the system. Of course, I can say that because I've, I've, I've gone through this cycle so many times, so many ways, uh, before so many audiences who've raised every question over and over again um, uh, that, in fact, we have already answered for if, 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 if anyone is listening carefully to this explanation. Um, so, this little alone uh, represents the nature of a of a promissory obligation, and in effect, a perfect economy is merely a system of accounting, which um, says, "Okay, um, so and so built this house over here, and so and so over here wants to possess that house. They commit to paying for it." as they consume of it, and um, uh, we issue evidence of this obligation to the producer of the house, who therefore, being as this is the token, is, is our instrument of tokenization, um, is therefore paid in full in what it becomes a spendable currency, which is just in respect to every case every instance and every conduit possible. Um, and, 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 and so such an economy is, is not just an eradication of inflation, deflation, 
maldisposition, systemic manipulation of the cost or value of money or property, and inherent multiplication of artificial indebtedness for the whole purported economy. It is it is that even for every case and every affected individual. So um, I still see it as uh, uh, the, the the that this would be the the natural um, evolution of uh, of relations between individuals, as I give in my parable of perfect economy. Um, whereas we have, you know, two agricultural producers who issue promissory obligations to each other, and these are traded about the community, and of course, because they represent an obligation to pay and we have integrity, um, they're collectible and they serve as genuine, um, enforceable uh, instruments of, of, of value and, and, and tokenizations of, of value. Um, whereas uh, what what a banking system would do it, it comes in and 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 and, and, it, and it and it gives up no uh, uh, you know lawful consideration and merely publishes the evidence of our promissory obligations to each other um, and then collects the principal and then multiplies that um, into terminal artificial indebtedness by interest um, the ostensible risk of which is the principal which they never gave up. In fact, uh, the, the purported banking system uh, only risks uh, the mere negligible costs of publishing the e evidence of our promissory obligations to each other. So the whole thing is a lie when this, this third, third party comes into it. And, and so we go back to connect the dots that you first mentioned here. Uh, the... You know, the banking system never arose out of some beneficent character who was trying to do well for the world. Mayor Amschel Rothschild, who began this so-called Bank of England, um, was perhaps the most notorious and ruthless embezzler of all history. You know, this is where his beginnings come from. And that's what kind of person uh, started uh, this thing we call banking, which is hardly banking at all. The next thing you mention is this basically uh, an abandonment of the of the gold standard and uh, uh, an inception an inception, if you will, of of a fractional reserve system. Well. In extrapolating the natural consequences of the obfuscation of the currency of this pretended banking system, we can only understand that a fractional reserve system is an inevitable consequence of um, the coexistence of mutually exclusive purported principles of a precious metal monetary standard and a so-called banking system, which is imposing interest on um, its unwarranted authority to merely publish evidence of our promissory obligations to each other. Specifically, what I mean by that <clears throat> is your first issue when you uh, attempt to sustain a precious metal monetary standard is that what you're really trying to accomplish with such a standard is a safeguard against the eventual case of uh, devalued currency, which case of devaluation always is engendered by this lie that we call a banking system, which is simply usury. So, based on a deception that banking is a real creditor, it's not a real creditor at all. It's merely publishing our promissory obligation to another in a standardized form, as if it was an issuer of credit. We are the real issuers of credit, the obligor, the person 
who agrees to a promissory obligation is the actual issuer of the credit. And the real creditor is not the banking system at all. The real creditor gives up property in exchange for the promissory obligation. The banking system is redundant to this whole arrangement. Um, if we insert anything into this equation, it would be uh, government to standardize the form of promissory obligations, but they would still be issued by um, by the by the debtor or, or obligor, as it would be more properly called, and uh, they're accepted again by the real creditor, who uh, gives up the property which is exchanged in the in the arrangement. The problem with the uh, uh, precious metal monetary standard is that it's a relatively finite quantity. And a circulation of that quantity um, can't possibly preserve the relative value of a circulation um, which is required to sustain vacillating uh, uh, magnitudes of industry and commerce. The, the general tend to, tendency of industry particularly back in the day when, when uh, uh, of, 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 of gold standards was, was prolific uh, increases in, 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 in industrial production. Now, to sustain all that, you need further circulation if you are to maintain the value of the units of the circulation. The gold standard or silver standard or any precious metal monastery Terry standard or anything even parallel to it in any way um, is actually forced to compete for the gold and all the industry and those those quantities as they are vacillating they might go up perpetually um, or they might go down and up it doesn't matter but you have because you have any vacillation in the volumes at all. Um, which results in a disparity between um, production and commerce and uh, gold, the sum of all that, and the circulation results in a dis disparity in the relative value of the circulation. So you're, you're actually violating the very principles you're purporting to uphold. The gold standard is a farce. It, it never could work. And it is the, um, in my view, it's the greatest shortcoming of the Founding Fathers. It is their worst mistake. They didn't give us a monetary system. They gave us a, they bound a volumetric measure to the abstract value of money in such a way which made it impossible to abide by the standard if we were to sustain intended industry. So the lack of money which would exist itself is a need for further money which so long as it's allowed to coexist with this purported banking system, the lie of banking, the, these falsified creditors who merely publish evidence of our promissory obligations to each other and launder the principal into their possession and multiply that artificial debt, which isn't even a debt to them, into terminal debt by interest, by the fact that we can only maintain a vital circulation by perpetually reborrowing principal and interest back into circulation as ever greater sums of debt until we suffer a terminal sum of debt. The, the tolerance for coexistence between those two conflicting sets of purported principles is itself further destructive because then, uh, especially if you marry the two, as we have in the first, second, and second, uh, you know, national banks of the United States and practically any other bank of the world, Canada has a different arrangement. Um, uh, 
if you marry uh, interest, uh, uh, this falsification of, of, of credit, um, this falsification of the role of creditor, um, this laundering of principal into the possession of the falsified creditor, and this perpetual multiplication of initial artificial indebtedness into terminal artificial indebtedness, if you attempt to marry that to a gold standard, <laughs> you have you know, mutually ex- e- exclusive um, uh, uh, falsified principles uh, which can never uh, work together and uh, because the purported banking system multiplies artificial indebtedness in proportion to uh, circulation or remaining capacity to service debt, then you have um, an accumulation of, 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 of indebtedness, which we ultimately and inevitably requires borrowing beyond um, a uh, collateralizable assets, the value of them, and so uh, uh, all these things that you know, derivative scandals and all these kinds of falsifications of, of property uh, assets um, are actually natural consequences of the obfuscation of the currency because. The system needs to borrow more and more and more beyond collateralization, beyond redeemability, and um, a purported gold standard, which can never be upheld because of the inevitable consequences of this obfuscation of the promissory obligation. So at the bottom of this, uh, it's the fundamental obfuscation of the promissory obligation which causes all this to happen. You you cannot but resort to uh, a, a, a fractional reserve uh, uh, if uh, the currency is subject to interest. No ifs, ands, or buts about it because you cannot maintain a vital circulation comprised at most of some remaining principal by reborrowing principal and interest as an ever greater sum of debt beyond all the value of all the assets that are related to this circulation and dedicating ever more of the circulation to servicing artificial debt at the expense of sustaining the industry which is obligated to do so you know it's 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 the worst imaginable imaginable uh, recipe and Frankly, because its only powers are to take unjustifiably, without justification. There is nothing in the bodies of law of any country of the world and every country of the world which justifies the first fact that the debt isn't even owed to the bankers who merely publish evidence of our promissory obligations to each other and launder all the principle ever so created into their unjustifiable possession. And then the second fact, the only other thing and power of, of, of this obfuscation is to multiply that first artificial indebtedness into terminal artificial indebtedness. This was never an, a great innovation. This was never beneficent. It was never, uh, it was never devised to uh, serve mankind. It was instead devised exclusively to exploit mankind unless its innovator had exactly the wrong uh, conception of what they were doing because all, it, all its powers are is, is to exploit. So when you when you connect the dots and you see okay well the 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 the, the basic prototype if you will for the first central bank of the modern world might be rightly said to be the Bank of England, and it was created by one of the most notorious embezzlers of all history. Well, we understand these things then. Okay, so if. Um Obviously, we accept uh, the banking system is um, uh, is not beneficial. Uh, wasn't really set out for any benefit uh, for us, the people. 
Um, you've gone into descriptives of why the gold standard cannot work or any other precious metal uh, type standard either because uh, there just isn't enough out there to uh, uh, maintain the, the credit requirements of the uh, of the world itself um, what I think has happened though at some point um, because of the explosion of the fractional reserve and the, and the increase in the credit there was a point where it must have had some benefit to industry and the world as a whole because of what seems to have happened over the last you know, 100, maybe 150 years, there's an expansion and an explosion of productivity uh, right. based on all of this, you know, this, this extra credit and fractional reserve capability. So I believe some good has come from it, but the implementation of it is wrong, and, and that's the next step we need to settle. But do you agree that there no, was no, some I benefit or not? I absolutely disagree. Okay, that, go ahead. That there's any benefit at all, ever. Um, and let's illustrate this. We'll go back to my uh, parable of perfect economy where we had a man who raised fowl and he, he built the facilities to double his production the next year and he approaches his neighbor who, who grows feed and he had been growing feed um, to, uh, you know, uh, sufficient feed to uh, serve his, you know, indus industrial production up to that time, but didn't have suitable further land or for whatever reasons. He approaches his neighbor and he propositions his neighbor to grow additional feed for, in exchange for so much of the additional production of his um, um, crop of chickens, fowl. Well, now, here we have, likewise, an increase in production. And if a third party, a person that neither of these two men knew, intervened upon their arrangement, their contracts to deliver to each other, their promissory obligations, made evident on promissory notes, the actual contracts, if this third person intervened, as a central banking system does, and it uh, uh, it said, no, 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 uh, uh, you over there and you over here cannot issue your promissory obligations to each other on your paper. They have to be issued on our paper. And... Uh, uh, when you pay them to each other, we get to keep what you pay, and um, uh, uh, we uh, uh, impose interest upon you because, of course, uh, earned wealth is at risk, and, of course, no earned wealth is at risk at all. We have two pieces of paper, and... Um, this requires us to maintain a vital circulation by perpetually reborrowing uh, interest in principal as an ever greater sum of debt until we suffer a terminal sum of debt. And we look at all history. Um, the very reason that Kondratiev had a pattern to observe is the pattern of failure. Nothing whatever is contributed to the arrangement by the purported banking system. Nothing augments uh, industrial uh, production by imposing uh, this intervention upon our monetary affairs. Now, um, so likewise, not only is there a cost, there's substantial cost. First of all, in the fact that all the principal isn't retired from circulation. In other words, I'm just I'm not you know disagreeing on a personal level. Level I'm I'm giving you all the math of this. You know just it's just basic simple elementary accounting. And so what happens is uh, the 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 principal, being as it's not retired from circulation as it would be when a promissory obligation is fulfilled. When I paid off the chickens to the fellow I asked to, to grow the feed, um, he's collected the chickens for the note. The note is null and void. We 
draw a big X across it, rip it into whatever, you know. He signs it as fulfilled, however we mark it. But it is no longer uh, uh, applicable. It is null and void. It is fulfilled. And that's the natural um, life cycle of a promissory obligation. And that's very in- important to preserve, to have a proper economy, because if you don't do that, you can't possibly have a circulation which reflects the remaining value of, of, of all related property. So that's the first principle that we've already abandoned in this. Moreover, we're allowing it to artificially enrich the banking system by this principle, which we're allowing them to launder into their possession, saying, quote, unquote, that it's helped us. It hasn't helped us at all. That doesn't help us. Now, they're... The, the money that has been laundered into their possession competes with us for our own possession. And it affects, because it stays in circulation, and because that obfuscates the, the proper life cycle of circulation, it adversely affects the value of money, being as the fact is that it's empowered them to compete with us for our production while they don't contribute anything to production. Thus, taking from the pool of production without giving into it uh, diminishes our even even our potential to be justly rewarded for production. This is something all of us have to understand: is that the pool of wealth is created by production, and just reward being to be uh, uh, rewarded by equal production. If I build a house, the house is mine. To trade the house for something equivalent to the house is another matter. But So I've built a house, and I have so much as a house. And that is the principal object of, of true free enterprise and, and true free markets. To have this third party intervene upon us and to be taken uh, from us isn't just uh, a possibly devastating um, intervention it, and, and exploitation. It's, it's an extremely phenomenal, uh, monumental crime against us. Um, in the case of every building of a house, uh, if it's a $100,000 house, uh, the banking system has enriched $100,000 just in the, in, the, in the principal, which is laundered in, into its possession. Then to make us pay two or three or four houses on top of that in interest is a further crime of, uh, against us. So if we say that across our neighborhood, uh, the neighborhood was filled with uh, new construction under a banking system, that isn't by the benefit or the blessing of the banking system. We accomplished that despite the adversities of it. We would, we would accomplish far more with the same efforts if it weren't for the banking system in terms of realizing such uh, prosperity ourselves. And so, um, if this were to be said to benefit us, in time as the obfuscation of the currency inherently, irreversibly, and therefore terminally multiplies artificial indebtedness in proportion to capacity to pay, and the ultimate consequence of that is complete dispossession. <laughs> what we're saying is we're multiplying a benefit into complete dis- dispossession. The fact is, from day one, it is adverse to us. It is, is, it is an obstruction and an impediment to realizing prosperity. Oh, because it introduces money into circulation isn't to our benefit. It's doing that only to take from us without giving anything up in return. We can can and should do that ourselves. And if we did, then and then alone would we realize our, our, our complete potential to prosper. The banking system can only deplete that to an ever-escalating degree, extent, until ultimately we suffer terminal failure. So... No. In, 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 in all the math of all of this, there is no benefit whatsoever at any point. From its inception, it is a concept of exploitation, 
uh, imposed upon the unwitting. The very reason that we have central banking systems across the world is the perpetrators know that there is no benefit whatsoever. If all of this were subject to um, exhaustive, uh, comprehensive uh, debate, there would be no central banking systems in the world because never in a day of their existence did they ever, ever, ever benefit us once. And worse than that, um, to perpetrate this crime, they're obligated, in as, as much as obligated, to uh, subvert and deny us representation because the mere chance of, of, of developing justice at any time uh, would spell their end. So there, the ramifications of this crime are, 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 are vastly extensive and desolating um, in, in va- virtually uh, every uh, avenue and corner of, of, of life. So, um, you know, we even have, uh, you know, world events, you know, uh, the United States invades Iraq, you know. Well, Saddam Hussein had done the work. He'd, he'd served a purpose that uh, the quote-unquote West, the United States, had wanted of him for a long time. And when we watch those events, understanding this obfuscation of the currency, what do we see? We see that Saddam Hussein was taken down only when he committed and announced that he would do this, that he would uh, um, quit trading oil in in dollars. He would create this oil bourse, which would trade uh, oil in other units of currency. Well, this signals, of course... Uh, a lack of faith and a rightful lack of faith in the quote unquote dollar, which isn't a dollar at all, doesn't conform to the definitions of a dollar at all, and long hasn't. It's gone through many, many changes, and 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 it's all, uh, uh, all of them are are inevitable consequences of this obfuscation of the promissory obligation. So we take Saddam Hussein down then, and and we're we're uh, ostensibly li- liberating Iraq. Iraq, but when you watch the history, you see that they got a central bank long before they got a government. And so this is a further consequence of central banking, of what we call central banks, uh, which is a lie. They're not no more banks or storehouses of value than than they are beneficent. um, catalysts of industry. Um, and this isn't just one uh, exception in, in, in the historical record. You know, you go back to uh, our Revolutionary War and, and Rothschild uh, paid for Hessian mercenaries to, uh, you know, to, to uh, put down the uh, colonial revolution. When uh, George Washington um, uh, made his f- famous crossing of the Delaware, you know, it... Uh, it was to it was to defeat Hessian mercenaries encamped at Trenton, New Jersey. You see, so there is no such thing as representation under a central banking system. There isn't any such thing as a, a fact that they've benefited us, and we can say that with absolute cer- certainty, because all its powers are is are to take from us without justification. And if we were to say, just for instance, that some amount of taking might somehow be justified, that doesn't matter. But because tomorrow, interest multiplies that taking into further taking or unjust taking. But there's no justification for interest in the first place because the only risk and cost that the central banking system endures is the mere cost of publishing the evidence of our promissory obligations to each other. And for that, and that alone, owing to this obfuscation, purposed criminal obfuscation of the currency, 
they become the possessors of all wealth in the world. There is nothing right about that. There is nothing beneficial about that whatsoever. Okay, so that answers the question uh, <laughs> or responds to any of the uh, supporters of the banking uh, sector and how they supposedly uh, assisted the Western world into its rise into greatness as we currently find ourselves in with the production and productivity and technological marvels that we find ourselves with. Um, so basically, uh, you're, you're confirming that the banks pretty much had nothing to do with that. In fact, despite the banks, we managed to do it anyway. Um, and and that's, that's true. Um, uh, on a personal level, um, anyone who is a, a producer of, of anything... Um, who excels at their craft um, knows this full well. Um, no matter what you do, um, you produce a, a, a given product. Every day, um, you are, um, under natural circumstances, you're, 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 you're compelled always to maintain or improved quality, um, not in not in all cases, because, for instance, anything is only as good as its weakest part. So, say a, a, a certain thing has um, a, a, a potential lifespan of, of 40 years, owing to um, the lifespan of its uh, weakest least enduring uh, element or part. And, um, and there's some parts of it which might last a thousand years. Well, we can compromise the quality of those things to make them in sync with the lifespan of the weakest part, which we can't improve. But otherwise, we're generally competing with other people in terms of, 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 of quality. And the general thrust of uh, development uh, that is industrial development is to increase um, the quality of the weaker link, especially if we can do that with almost no work. So what happens in a in an in, in an industrial development situation? This happened for Henry Ford when he built cars, and it happens for for everyone in this real situation. Is what you're really faced with is is your if if you've got a pound out of fender, you figure out a way to do it better with one less hammer hit, or whatever the case may be. And so we we basically refine industrial processes constantly. Um, and the result of this is more efficient production per person hour invested. And this is the natural evolution of, of, of all industry. Um, it isn't compelled by the fact that the bank charges us interest. It's compelled by the fact that of free enterprise, of just reward for production. If we make a better thing with less work, we are enabling ourselves and justifying a fact the, of, of greater reward to ourself for effort. And this is a principle that virtually every person comes to naturally recognize on a personal level. It doesn't matter if you're working for somebody else. Uh, because you are justifying them paying you a higher wage for your production. If, if you're producing three times uh, what a, a usual w worker of your responsibilities does, you're a, you become a very valuable person, especially if at the same time you increased or sustained at least quality. So these are principles that we, we, we all realize and we actually all naturally strive for regardless of a banking system. The banking system doesn't have anything to do with it. 
Now, it's true we might be scared to death. We're not going to be, we're going to be dispossessed of our house next month. So today we're doing the work of, of three people because our company is laid off, you know, two out of every, you know, f- five workers already. And, uh, this week's paycheck may be our last unless we are so valuable that they're, they're going to put us last, they're going to make us last on the less list to get X'd off, you see. Um, but the truth is that the banking system isn't the compelling factor for that. Um, if you took away the banking system, you could sit in your chair and you could, you know, whatever it is you do in your little shop, you know, you might produce just one a day instead of ten because, you know, that might be your case. But um, truth of the matter is um, uh, most of us uh, would prefer to get our work done to do what other things we uh, want to do in our life. And the the truth of the matter is a banking system instead compels us to keep our nose to the grindstone merely to meet the ever-escalating requisites of of an ever-escalating sum of artificial indebtedness, which is even owed to the banks. They're not our driving force. They're our destructive force against everything that we do, and it's all in the math. You know, it's not a matter of personal opinion at all. Um, The fact is, um, you know, if we say the banking system has benefited us, how? That has to be at least gauged in respect to um, the potential to restore uh, the uh, uh, right to issue our own promissory obligations to ourselves. And if we did that, why would we need banks? Why do we need banks? Why don't we do that? Why do we allow the banks to launder principal into their possession for merely publishing evidence of our promissory obligations? No one in the world has a good answer. So uh, we can't say that the banking system has uh, benefited us or, or, or even compelled us um, to do better than we would otherwise because, in truth, when you look at that same shop where a person might be compelled to do more because they're, they're, they're afraid their house is going to be dispossessed, at the same time, that shop probably lacks a tool or a piece of equipment that it can't afford which would have allowed them to, to produce even further on less effort, and that might very well have been something that they would have accomplished um, than if the banking system didn't exi- exist at all or intervene upon our fair affairs to take from us to an ever more oppressive extent. Well, do you actually believe now that uh, the banking system itself or uh, our current uh, corporatism um, is is what's responsible for... Um, I think a, a reduction in the quality of the products that we get at, at the end because there's a requirement for, um, for, for more and more consumerism and consumption and that there's a built-in lifespan for these things well, uh, a failure and because and it's done that way simply because the banking system is is pushing that you know you you can't pay these loans back without continued sales and without the continued sales you can't pay them back you can't stay in business etc cetera, etc cetera. it's a it's a kind of a, a merry-go-round situation i mean is that what you think or is it something else well it, the answer to that question is in the math in other words <laughs> I'm 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 funning a little bit here, but um, uh, you know, if I weren't here, you know, you could ask the question to the math, and what does the math tell you? The math tells you this. Now, um, before I start to answer that, I'm going to say, you know, I'm going to give us a little bit of a summary of it, and that is, yes, there are evil corporations in the world. Yes. There are evil corporations which exploit this idea of um, oh, a number of ideas, um, such as uh, peddling software uh, with uh, not only with just known faults, um, 
But known faults that uh, are extremely uh, costly uh, to the users who depend on that software um, so much as we depend on a car running. You know, uh, what kind of uh, a day it would make for you if, if uh, you know, you had to go uh, to uh, whatever, five different places uh, across the city, to different corners of it constantly throughout a day. And, uh, you know, at 10 o'clock in the morning when you left one spot, you took stuck the key in the ignition, your car didn't run. You know, it had to go to the shop for two days, you know. Um, we know that corporations exploit, let us say, the leniency which has been developed toward um, uh, just uh, marketing of, of, of products. You know, I mean, when I was a kid, if you went to the butcher and bought two chickens, and the guy stuck a wet diaper in the bag and counted that as part of the weight, you'd have drug him outside and beat the crap out of him. You know, that's how things were dealt with in those days. And so, yet, and I'm not absolving um, deviant uh, corporate presences from uh, culpability, but again, it's all in the math. And the problem is that as this unjustifiable imposition of interest multiplies artificial indebtedness in proportion to a circulation or remaining capacity to service debt. This is, A, the thing which drives up prices because in order to maintain margins of solubility, industry which is the only engine of, of, of fulfilling um, this obligation to service this uh, ever-escalating sum of artificial indebtedness, is ever more compromised by the ever greater cost of servicing an ever greater sum of debt. Its workers demand higher wages because their debts are going up. Government demands more taxes because its debts are going up until, of course, the industry can't afford to pay any more taxes and it can't afford to pay its workers anymore. And so somehow the additional debt has to be assumed somewhere so that the mo money can come back into circulation or reflate the circulation to maintain a vital circulation so that in the final days of this this lie of economy which which can only impose artificial redundant cost upon us and multiply it into terminal failure eventually fails but so it's this multiplication of artificial indebtedness which is the fundamental cause or the obfuscation of the currency in other words which is the fundamental cause of the increasing cost of industry which drives prices up to the meet a ceiling that markets can afford, and that's that, you know, after that. So, but since afterward, um, costs nevertheless increase beyond uh, what can sustain margins of solubility, industry is inevitably expatriated to other countries. What is, why does it, you know, why does a tractor producer leave the United States and move to Mexico? Because it can get the same labor for one third the cost. You see, so since that's the only avenue w in which it can reduce its cost, it resorts to exploiting uh, labor. Now, yes, uh, that's not right. We can call it evil, and uh, we might be absolutely correct in doing so. But the fact of the matter still is that the fundamental obfuscation of the currency required all this. Now, in the case of corporations, um, I don't really see the corporate entity itself as inherently evil, and I don't see uh, that it is necessarily compelled to do this. I, I know that um, uh, people in certain corporations um, actually have uh, stellar represent, uh, 
uh, stellar uh, reputations um, for uh, doing their utmost to, despite the fact that owing to the inadequacies of, of management of a corporation, uh, all hell would be breaking loose. But the, 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 the corporate employees take responsibility for the integrity of their products and the uh, stellar uh, performance and, uh, and, and powers and virtues of their products. Um, so, nonetheless, because this obfuscation of the currency transmits so much wealth to the central banking system, and because that wealth is wielded by people who are motivated to take unearned profit without limit, what inevitably happens is you will have the same people or their close associates who are responsible for this evil thing, evil obfuscation of, 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 of the promissory obligation, which is actually one of the most destructive things which has ever been created in history. Destructive and unjustifiable things which have ever been created in history. Okay, so we, I think we agree. Well, Sorry, have go them, ahead, carry on, Mike. have them... Uh, when you have them uh, um, saturated with more wealth or representations of wealth, quote-unquote money, than they know what to do with, um, they're going to become major owners of uh, not only corporations, but they're going to buy currency. They're going to buy commodities. They're going to do all of the things which are so destructive to us. And so in the end of this thing, as it multiplies artificial in indebtedness to terminal extents, and you have this need to re reflate the circulation, these guys are become the owners of everything, either by dispossession or outright buying or whatever. But because they seek what they do without principle and without limitation and are so empowered to take it in every way, this is why the world is the way that it is. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so we uh, we obviously agree that uh, the banking system itself, in its current and, and past forms, is definitely uh, uh, bad for us. So unless there's something else that you want to cover as far as the history is concerned, or maybe the current, what I might want to switch over to is ask you questions about um, now what the alternative fixes are for this problem. Of course, uh, mathematically perfected economy um, is your number one choice, but of course there are many other uh, proponents of monetary reform out there, um, you know, not least of which uh, Ron Paul and Stephen Zarlinga. Um, Alan Brown is a proponent of state banking with, again, some interest attached to it. Can we maybe discuss the... Uh, well, let's start with Ellen because I've spoken with her recently. Um, she is the proponent of state banking with some interest uh, associated or attached to loans basically to cover for defaults because no matter what she believes that defaults will still occur and we still have to deal with going to the free if money you have interest you know interest mm -hmm. is the cause of the defaults so you preserve the f the cause of, of, of defaults you're going to have defaults so you know uh, that sort of rules her out pretty quickly now I'm quite familiar with Ellen's you know, ever vacillating uh, positions. He's all over the map. But um, in truth, uh, if when you bring up uh, Zarlinga, um, uh, and you know, we can add a million names to these: uh, G. Edward Griffin, uh, you know, um, uh, Edward Flaherty. Do you know who he is? 
Actually, I don't know that one. I've heard it, obviously, of Ed <laughs> Griffin and, that's and many others. he disappeared but... a long time ago. He was a professor of a university in, um, in the southeast of the United States, so in the early 90s. And uh, uh, back then, uh, of course, my, my pages were the only uh, monetary reform presence on the Internet. And... Uh, uh, if you did any search for the Federal Reserve and whatever, uh, my page is ranked number one, even above the Federal Reserve itself. And, uh, of course, even then, that was ten years after I first appeared on what eventually became the Internet because, of course, I released uh, you know, the computer models and documentation that I produced uh, for the Reagan administration, which uh, documentation um, uh, proved uh, a thesis of inevitable failure and singular solution. And so from the beginning, and actually this extends to clear back to 1968, um, mathematically perfected economy is a product of a Mathema actual mathematic proof of singular solution. Now, uh, this fellow Flaherty was a you know a professor, and I, I don't recall what university he taught at, and uh, he had a uh, a website um, that uh, came popped up a couple years after the formal beginning of the internet, uh, and if I believe uh, I recall correctly. Yeah, the name of his pages was um, Federal Reserve Conspiracies Debunked. <laughs> and uh, what happened, uh, I, I, I did notice his pages at one time. I, 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 I frankly found them uh, not just preposterous, but about as irritating to anyone who was interested in the truth as irritating could be. And uh, what happened was, uh, I, um, after quite some while, I, I heard over some span of time from several of his students, and uh, they claimed that, uh, you know, he basically taught that uh, the Federal Reserve was this entirely uh, beneficent entity that only served the people that was responsible for all our industrial expansion and so on and so forth. And uh, these students asked me about my ideas. And uh, as people find who write me, uh, I'm uh, you know, quite accessible and I give uh, qualified answers and uh, um, you know of course my page is uh, you know uh, embodied this mathematic proof of inevitable failure and singular solution and and uh, his students were were quite impressed with it well <clears throat> after about a year or so I started getting not just the uh, fairly regular email from his first, you know, uh, semester or two of students who had written me, but uh, uh, a substantially increasing number of his further students, who, uh, all of whom, were entirely convinced that I was absolutely right. And, of course, um, if I weren't right, it's... Uh, an incredibly remarkable uh, coincidence that the models I provided the Reagan administration, which merely reborrow principal and interest as is necessary to, to maintain a vital circulation, projected all the debt that we would accumulate and, 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 and an inevitable failure at approximately 2010 AD from 1980s data in 1983 and 84, you know. And, of course, these students are writing me 10 years later. Um, so a year and a half or two, I'm getting so many emails from this person's, uh, you know, students that uh, um, I decide, uh, as I often often am forced to do, to uh, you know kill every bird with one stone. So I put up a page. Um, uh, 
this person's name, Edward Flaherty, debunked. <laughs> His page was Federal Reserve Conspiracies Debunked. And he purported in a you know a paragraph or two to have debunked my website um, in the same manner that uh, G. Edward Griffin and uh, and this fellow uh, William B. Ryan of the um, so-called Capital Ownership Group of Kent State University had attempted to debunk my work by saying, um, uh, and you know these papers that in, in which I invalidate their attempts to disprove just a cause of, 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 of failure that mathematically perfected economy solves. I, I have articles, of course, still online about all these things. So I produced a like response to Edward Flaherty, and uh, um, I titled the page Edward Flaherty Debunked. This is years before Stephen Zarlinga and, and, or, or even Jacques Jacaran ever even appeared on the scene. You know, I was the first guy, and and I and I was there as a, you know, um, uh, I'm not going to say I'm a mathematic genius because I, you know, I've forgotten more math, far more math than most people were ever learned, um, but I was considered a, a mathematic genius as, a, as, a, as even as a young child, and. Um, uh, this idea of mathematically perfected economy is no casual idea. It's a, it's as if you know, and I was doing things uh, like proving the Pythagorean theorem off the top of my head. There aren't many people that can do those kinds of things, and yet, then when I say, um, in effect, uh, that the square uh, of, of the hypotenuse equals the sum of the square of the sides, and I've proven this, then we have Stephen Zarlinga and Jacques Jacaran and uh, Ellen Hodge and Brown come along, who are not even, uh, you know, serious mathematicians or 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 um, authors of solution, who say, oh no, a solution can be this, or oh no, a solution can be that. Well, what happened in the case of Edward Flaherty? Um, uh, all his students said, just I made it, it. It wasn't just critical; it was a little bit humorous, but it really made quite a, you know, an ass of this person who is claiming that the Federal Reserve is, you know, the glory of mankind. And uh, without, you know, justifying a, a single ostensible principle, um, including particularly the fundamental nature of money, uh, as we did in the you know, beginning of this discussion here. Well, anyway, uh, so uh, that page got a lot of traffic, evidently. Um, quite a lot of the students of that school um, spread the word, and uh, I'm sure it wasn't just the quote-unquote economics students um, that eventually came to that page and learned a lot from it, I hope. Um, then, um, oh, I forget what he was, his official, official position was, but the, the president of the University eventually writes me, and he says, uh, "Dear Mr. Montagna, um, I very much appreciate the uh, thought and work that your page, Edward Flaherty debunked, represents. Um, I would like to confess to you that Mr. Flaherty's page, uh, Federal." Reserve conspiracy theories debunked has proven a great embarrassment to the university, and so we have had him take it down. Um, would you be so kind and gentlemanly as to do the same with your page as uh, we will do our best um, not to promote uh, such falsehoods in the future? And uh, I gladly condescended. I took the page down. It's been gone ever since. So what happens uh, right about the same time there and it, people don't understand this but you know I've been going through this plagiarism thing for you know for um, uh, in a major way for 20 years and it's 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 absolutely completely out of control and who are all these people who are advocating alternate solutions well uh, Jacques Jacaran you know, he publishes this book, uh, The Debt Virus. Um, he writes me. He writes me. Oh, 
a long time before he published the book, early 90s, and uh, corrected me on a spelling error, which I make very, very few of. And uh, uh, he wanted to know about my story of this, uh, you know, which was Parable of Perfect Economy. Evidently, he had some misunderstanding. It was actual history. And uh, I don't know, I, I didn't really care for the tone of his, uh, you know, initial communication. So I, you know, I didn't go very deep with the guy. But um, um, the next thing you know, he's produced this debt virus. And the very first page of it is a blatant plagiarization of my parable of perfect economy. Of course, he obfuscates it so that you know it's 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 like his in his own words, but this is a a, a thing that never even transpired, <laughs> and he's proving what a what a jerk he is, uh, uh, in the very first page of his his work. Well, you know, many years later, Stephen Zarlinga comes along, and and he's basically you know b- b- plagiarized the crap of my work too. Why do I say this, plagiarize? Well, you know, we've talked about Ellen Hodgson Brown, who's who's a particularly pathetic case. Um, but it's as if, all of a sudden, when ideas that I introduced to the world as a proof of inevitable failure and singular solution, When those ideas gained traction, all of a sudden, everyone and their mother perfectly understood that there's an implicit obligation to maintain a vital circulation subject to interest, which inherently and irreversibly multiplies artificial indebtedness, which isn't even owed to an actual creditor, into terminal failure. And everyone understands that. And could call it something like a Ponzi scheme, as Ellen Hodge and Brown does. Well, to do that is 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 something which is a, a blatant, indelible mark of pretension, because a true diligent thinker who resolves solution from the facts at hand, especially when they are so subtle as the things that I've been repeating for 40 years have proven to be so difficult for people to understand, and then to suddenly have actually even millions of people advocating the parts of these things that they think they understand, however entwined with their own mistakes of interpretation, as if they developed the thought, and you can't even find the original author any longer, and people like Ellen Hodge and Brown are advocating first one solution, and then another thing becomes solution, and then another thing, and then another thing yet. We don't have to dig very deep into each and every one of these cases, and we, I can see immediately, even if I weren't the author of you know, original architect of, you know, this thesis of inevitable failure and singular solution, I can see that these people are as phony as phony gets. Why? Stephen Zarlinga writes me. He wrote me after he uh, published his book, The Lost Science of Money, notifying me that we're of like mind and asking me if I would help him promote his book. Well, here's my problem with that. I haven't met a person yet who actually figured out the actual fundamental cause of the issues that we have to solve, and therefore none of them could have had even the tools to develop actual solution. And here is this person suddenly out of nowhere pretending that he's resurrecting the lost science of money. So I write him about this. Well, he doesn't answer me back because he doesn't have any answers and he realized he made a big mistake to write the guy that he had plagiarized in order to help him promote a book, especially 
when that book itself proved this man to be such a preposterous imposter, what did he advocate? He advocated what he called the Chicago Plan. The Chicago Plan reduced interest rates to something like 4 or 5%, which, of course, they've been reduced even below now, and we're still failing. And the reason is the very math that I gave when I was in high school in 1968, you know, is that uh, as, the, uh, as interest multiplies the ever-escalating sum of debt into a terminal sum of debt, you have to reduce the interest rates. But because the debt is so great, it's grown at an ever-escalating rate of ever greater increments of periodic interest on an ever greater sum of debt. The escalation at the end of the cycle is phenomenal. So, even in, interest rates have to be reduced to near zero in the end of that, and so long yet as a single penny has to rebar- be reborrowed back into circulation, and far more of that is in fact reborrowed back into circulation at virtual zero so-called interest rates because of all the other rates that are floating out around, floating around out there, um, uh, you still suffer terminal failure. And so what has happened after he published his book, you know, interest rates have been reduced below that. We're still in failure. Of course, the failure is only escalated. It requires more uh, rescue efforts all the while because interest inherently multiplies debt at an ever-escalating rate. And so his own work disproves that he was ever the authority to speak up about this. And yet, we still consider this a, a, a proposition of solution. Ellen Hodgson Brown, she used to call this Pennsylvania currency um, the most brilliant banking model in our nation's history. Those are her exact words is given to me by other people, people who know my work, um, jammed her up about it, you know, and uh, eventually pointed me to an article at Op-Ed News where I challenged her myself. Now, why would a lawyer know about a special currency which funded government without taxation? Well, she never did. She never discovered it herself. It's a story that Mike Montagna made up. And issues out of out of the mouth of Bank Ben Franklin, Mike Montagna's words. You see? That's how phony these people are. Now, we can answer to all of them at once. What is solution? I've said for forty plus years, since nineteen sixty eight going on 43 years now, I have said there is one and one only solution. And I've repeated this literally tens of thousands of times. There is one and one only integral solution for the categoric faults of pretended economy, which is also the solution of any potential categoric faults of any potential concept of economy. Why? Because... There are two basic fundamental faults, those being, uh, number one, volumetric or dispositional, and I'll define that so we understand what I just said in a moment, and the other being this uh, inherent irreversible and therefore terminal multiplication of artificial indebtedness which we could just call cost, except that we need to understand it in the terms that I just expressed it, because those terms explicitly certify that the process is one of ever escalating and therefore inevitably terminal debt. If we don't understand that, we don't understand anything about interest. So our third possible category fault then may be any possible combination of these two powers. One, to corrupt volume and disposition. Three, to corrupt uh, cost through interest, which is inherently terminal. And two, any combination of one and three. So those, in effect, perfectly, commensurably equate to what I've given for 40 years as the three categoric faults of this lie of economy. 
explicitly <clears throat> where interest is the means of imposing uh, cost, or our third categoric fault then, the categoric faults of such a system as we suffer by imposition without assent, as this central banking systems which have been imposed upon the world then, is, um, number one, uh, inflation, deflation, and maldisposition of the circulation. And by maldisposition, I mean to refer to the fact that as interest inherently and irreversibly multiplies any sum of falsified indebtedness into a terminal sum of artificial indebtedness, all along the route, ever more of the circulation is dedicated to servicing the escalating sum of artificial debt versus sustaining the industry which is obligated to do so, which is what I call maldisposition because it is terminal to industry. And why do I group it with inflation and deflation? Because it isn't just right to get the volume of the circulation equal forever perpetually to the remaining value of represented wealth under a purported economy, a live economy subject to interest, because you don't have a proportional disposition of the circulation, which maintains the relative value of the currency and the remaining value of the wealth because of a volume that's a whole volume that's equal to the remaining value of the wealth, only some of that can be dedicated to conveying the wealth in commerce. So that's why those three things are grouped together in our first categoric faults of uh, any purported economy subject to interest. Our second categoric fault is systemic manipulation of the cost or value of money or property. And our third categoric fault, again, is inherent, irreversible, and therefore terminal multiplication of artificial indebtedness by interest. Now, so somebody somewhere out there has um, um, actually proven an alternate solution? Absolutely not. It hasn't happened once, ever, yet, anywhere in the world. Believe me, I hear from all parts of the world. I know where this money is debt objection comes from. It comes from my parable of perfect economy, misunderstood by every amateur imposter who thinks they understand what's wrong with money now, that it can't be a debt. The truth is, the only possible existence for money is a debt, and we can prove this, and I've proven it many times, and we'll get to that later if we want. But, <clears throat> so, what are the solutions of each of these categoric faults? Well, the only solution for inflation, circulatory inflation, not price inflation or deflation, the only solution for circulatory inflation, deflation, and maldisposition is to maintain a circulation which is not only at all times equal to the remaining value of represented wealth, but which likewise is at all times fully disposed to convey the remaining value of represented wealth. And of course, there is absolutely one and one only way to accomplish that, and particularly in the case of all wealth and all affected persons. And that is to pay and retire principal at the rate of consumption or depreciation of the related property. Anything more uh, is deflationary, any rate less is inflationary. So, there is one and one only solution for inflation, deflation, and maldisposition. Skipping to our third categoric fault now, which is inherent, irreversible, and therefore terminal multiplication of artificial indebtedness. Likewise, there is one and one only solution for this category fault, and that is eradication of interest. Now, 
Ellen Hodgson Brown, one of her preposterous uh, claims, assertions, a thing which she can never prove, is that if you introduced the interest with the principal, there would be no issue. Well, I've chased her down on that one, and she's always exited the uh, debate because she knows she's in a corner. And the truth is, uh, you can't answer that question. You can't answer for that assertion, um, and uh, probably the best thing to allow to happen would be um, um, uh, to have uh, Ellen Hodgson Brown defend it to me, and this would demonstrate, you know, uh, uh, to our satisfaction, uh, you know, the the fact of of, of uh, that. She fell off the wagon on that one. Um, both oars are not in the water. Uh, uh, and to make a long story short, I can give you the answer for it. By the time that she answers for every possible, um, they're not anomalies, um, uh, they're variations of uh, the course and life cycle of circulation, the only way she will morph her 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 purported uh, solution into an actual solution is to morph it into mathematically perfected economy itself. And this happens regularly uh, amongst all these people who claim to have uh, alternate solutions. There's a another fellow in Canada, for instance, who's 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 um, crying out against money as debt. Money cannot be a debt. And uh, he had a YouTube channel, and I. Uh, you know, uh, somebody called it to my attention and uh, asked me to, to set this guy straight. So I visited, I saw, I answered to him. And I basically proved to him that uh, all money has to have uh, its life cycle uh, in order for it to be a, an immutable token of value. Its life cycle has to p parallel the represented wealth. And that if you just spent money into circulation, I uh, cited numerous conditions under which you would suffer inflation. And that he had provided no means, if he was advocating simply spending money into circulation, that as so many of these people who cry out against money as debt, that uh, he was actually advocating something then which was inherently um, inflationary. Um, it furthermore uh, precludes um, issuing promissory obligations, um, uh, if we can't assume debt, um, uh, uh, to fund uh, further industry. And so it requires this preposterous cycle of uh, unwarranted uh, 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 governmental largesse um, to spend money into circulation um, as if that justifies the way that the money is going into circulation either. Then it requires taxation, which is never linked to the introduction of the currency, um, or who should be spending, paying what for whatever. And so basically, uh, under the guise of uh, uh, as if you had justified the fact that debt is the problem, when debt isn't the problem at all, inherent irreversible multiplication of artificial indebtedness is the problem. This is the same thing that uh, Jake Rand misunderstood from the very beginning. That's what you have. What you have is, 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 is just... <sighs> a plethora of plagiarists who don't even understand the problems that they're ostensibly resolving into solution and therefore couldn't possibly give you a solution but claim that it is one and you don't even find the qualifying material on their site which proves that it even 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 solves these things you don't hear you don't you don't visit these sites and and find that they're proving how spending money into circulation solves inflation deflation maldisposition systemic manipulation of the cost or value of money or property and inherent irreversible multiplication of artificial indebtedness of course they copy me in eradicating interest so it doesn't cause inherent irreversible multiplication of artificial indebtedness by interest and it does eliminate it 
some systemic manipulation of the cost or value of money or property, but in their own obfuscation of of all the promissory obligations, they're causing systemic manipulation of 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 money or uh, the cost of money or property in many other ways, which aren't even introduced by the current system that we're 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 crying out against because it's destroying us by these same powers. So what are we after? Are we after eradicating all these things or not? So we understand we have two solutions, the first being to inflation, deflation, and maldisposition, and the third being uh, eradication of interest, solving inherent irreversible and therefore terminal multiplication of artificial indebtedness by interest. And our second categoric fault is systemic manipulation of the cost or value of money or property. And the fact of the matter is, is that the only powers to uh, corrupt um, the cost or value of money or property are the volumetric metric and cost powers, affecting powers, of, uh, uh, that we have already solved in our first and third solutions. So, in fact... Uh, in mathematic fact as well, of course, um, the fact of the matter is the integral combination of our first and third categoric solutions of, of, of our categoric, first and third categoric faults is the solution of systemic manipulation of the cost or value of money or property. So we have already solved that in mathematically perfected economy. So now, what could be an alternate solution? It's mathematically impossible for there to be an alternate solution. And the reason is simple, that anything but the obligatory schedule of payment of mathematically perfected economy is inflationary or deflationary. And these people who are advocating spending money into circulation in order to... um, uh, eradicate inter, uh, inflation or deflation, they simply answer to you they, they, uh, with a retort that, well, there is such a thing as, as um, um, you know, uh, a, a way to pay this money out of circulation. It's called taxation. <laughs> well, indeed. So they're admitting that they have to morph their solution into mine because it wasn't a solution at all. You can't simply spend money into circulation and have it be an immutable tokenization of value. It has to be paid out of circulation, and it needs to be paid out of circulation but at the rate of consumption or depreciation by the consumer for it to be a just economy. And that is exactly what mathematically perfected economy does and mathematically perfected economy alone does. So in all the time that I respond to all these people who've come up since I promoted the idea of a singular solution starting 42 years ago, all of these people are merely purported authorities who so poorly understand the very issues that they're plagiarizing that they can't possibly give you a solution but by saying so. And with these tools alone, each and every one of us can analyze the work of these purported authorities and realize that, hey, they deviate from this obligatory schedule of payment at all, and we have either inflation or deflation. To a penny, why would you make it a more complicated thing to emulate my parable of perfect economy, which had a fault embedded in it in, on purpose as a teaching device, and all these plagiarists have just picked it up and run with it as if, oh, money can't be a debt. See, Benjamin Franklin showed us how to, to spend money into circulation and fund government without taxation. Well, no, that's not true. You don't have a beneficial situation then, and this is what I would explain to everyone after I told my parable of perfect economy. I would explain to them, the problem is... If you're not paying that money out of circulation, it just sits there, and it sits there. 
Well, that's not inflationary, they would say, because, you know, we could, as, as the bridge depreciates, we could build houses with that money and we could s- sustain all this uh, activity at these mills that you've described. And I said, well, yeah, you could. But the problem is, to build that house then, you have to earn that money from a circulation which, if there are many, many more houses than the bridge, doesn't even exist. So if you preclude this vital capacity to monetize our production by assuming that debt itself is bad, when you don't even understand that this debt is not even the kind of debt that you're reacting to, I'm sorry, but you are yet in kindergarten of learning about these things. And so these people, I'm sorry, but that's where Bill Stills, Ellen Hodge and Brown, Stephen Zarlinga, all these people are not only in kindergarten, they, for their own purposes and their own glory, standing up as if they've uh, developed a, a, a solution, when on every page of my website, it said from the beginning of time, singular solution. All that they have accomplished is division for their own attention. And now what am I doing? I'm 42 years later. I'm spending most of my time answering to the preposterous assertions of plagiarists who don't even understand the problem. The thing is, a promissory obligation or a note is the only vehicle for just economy. I've actually published a mathematic proof of that. And it's a good thing that people like Ellen Hodge and Brown can't get their hands on it because I have to explain it. And basically the explanation we've already covered. When a person develops a solution, they identify the issues conclusively and those then are abided by, so to speak, in effect to allow the conditions themselves to prescribe the solution. That's how math works. If you if you have an equation and you've got one thing on one side of the equal sign and you want to solve for a a variable in the equation, what you do is you apply uh, equally to each side of the equal sign in such a way that you transfer the unknown, what you want to solve for, to the other side of the equal sign by itself. And that's basically how mathematically mathematic solution is always performed. Well, the thing about this then is one of our early observations is that in order for quote unquote money never to inflict any justice on anyone, it must be an immutable token of value. Why? Because if the value of money goes up or the value of money goes down, it inflicts justice, injustice on someone. Now, so in the, in, in the idea of solving all these problems, which in effect is to perfect economy, um, we must abide by this principle, an immutable token of value. Well, that means many things in very elementary mathematic terms, which all of us can understand, and not only then, which all of us can understand, which disprove the fact of any alternate alternate solution whatsoever. There is only one answer to the question, what does 3 plus 5 equal? There is only one answer to the question, what does 4 plus 3 equal? Likewise, there is one and one only solution to the question, what is just? actual economy. Number one. Okay, before, Mike, sorry, I don't know if you want to, uh, if I can just maybe uh, interject there a little bit. Um, I don't know if you want to elaborate further on that or if I can just briefly mention that uh, uh, all of the um, 
the the people that you've mentioned, uh, the Stevens Arlingas, the Bill Stills, the Ellen uh, the Ellen Browns, and and so on, they are not offering any kind of real solution uh, to the problem that we face with our monetary system. They are offering partial, maybe, uh, solutions and suggestions that. Uh, in essence, are really just put up for discussion. Um, what they are doing, I must admit, is raising the awareness of the people out there more and more. Uh, apart from the fact of what's going on in the economy, I think is is opening people's eyes. Uh, but they are certainly uh, uh, informing people uh, the the problem, and that you rightly say is that they are not only informing, they're offering. Uh, suggestions for a fix which is not a true fix. Uh, now, of course, your mathematically perfected economy, you have done the math on it, and you can say, uh, in probably no uncertain terms, that it is a fix. Well, um, it isn't just that I've done the math to prove the principles of mathematically perfected economy. I've also done the math for... Um, transforming the resultant state's state of affairs into a, a rectification of the crimes against us. And I've resolved that to likewise to a solution, meaning explicitly to indicate that it is likewise absolute. Now, there are some people who 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 um, who don't understand what the scope of this term solution is. I mean, it's funny how this comes up. Um, people will ask what solution even means. You know, even people who are advocating that something is solution have asked me, even on a fairly regular basis, what solution means. You know, and it's a preposterous thing that we should ever explain that to anyone. Now, I personally um, see in every one of these plagiarists a motive of personal gain, um, uh, not always strictly monetary, um, but the fact of the matter is the very work of each and every one of them, and I mean, I, mean, I can name names, I have, I have hard drives full of material collected from these people to prove their plagiarism, hard drives full of it. And, I mean, I can spend all day, uh, every day for a week, on what I can collect in one day on Ellen Hodgson Brown alone. I could take her work, and I can go on and on. Everything that comes out of her mouth is wrong. And I can explain this. Now, why did that person stand up advocating solution? And she has advocated solution. She's even told me in debates with her, that her solution was, quote, a trillion times more likely to be passed by Congress than, unquote, mine. A trillion times. I asked her for her math, as if Congress wasn't going to realize that she, too, was taking away the interest of the banks and still calling it interest and introducing it into circulation for some reason, which follows a pattern which is disproven by the very initial observations a true researcher would do of the nature of the currency, which observations would, would disprove any justification for interest, whatever. The debt isn't even owed these uh, pretended creditors. They only absorb the minimal negligible costs of publishing evidence of our promissory obligations to each other. They launder the principal into their possession and then pretend that that much is risked and that justifies interest. The whole thing is a lie. And so the, a person that has done even the very most rudimentary uh, uh, analysis of these things from their root core would have discovered that and never, ever, ever would have sought to preserve interest as a purported solution. That's absolutely, it, it is, is so blatantly neophytical 
that it astonishes me that anyone reads her work or listens to her her at all. Now on the contrary what they've accomplished by spreading the word is they've they've raised these huge factions which we likewise must now overcome who advocate that money can't be a debt. And I mean I can name people um, from Ron Paul forums for instance who just no matter how exhaustively you explain the fact that money can only be an obligation which equates to a debt. They simply come around when you go full circle with them, they come around and say they just reassert the same thing that you've just disproven. And there aren't just ten of these people in the world. There aren't hundreds, there aren't thousands, there aren't tens of thousands, there are millions who have the wrong idea because people like Ellen Hodge and Brown went out to seek fortune for herself on ideas which not only are not even hers, but which she still to this day doesn't even understand. And so these people need straightened out so that we ourselves can eliminate this crime from us. We're going to suffer all kinds of other problems if these people got their way that money can't be a debt. So it's important that we understand this this f- fact that money, in fact, can only be an obligation if it has integrity at all, because integrity is a commitment to an obligation. What is the obligation? The obligation, in the case of a promissory note, is to pay out of circulation for our consumption of others' production as we consume of it, in the case of mathematically perfected economy. Does this mean that we are going to go into great debt because mathematically perfected economy licenses us to borrow more than we do now? Oh, absolutely not. First of all, we could only borrow, we're not borrowing at all. You're not even borrowing from a central banking system. Second of all, you are not necessarily going into what we call debt at all in issuing promissory obligations. What do I mean by that? The extent of the commitments that you can make is certified in certifying your creditworthiness. So we cannot overborrow for the mere fact that we certify creditworthiness under mathematically perfected economy. But we must overborrow under the present obfuscation of the currency because interest compels perpetual a perpetual escalation of borrowing until we suffer a terminal sum of debt. So those are the those two differences. But are we going into debt in mathematically perfected economy? Let's just say that uh, I made a hundred thousand dollars a year for. 20 years, um, let's see, I made more than that. I made $125,000 a year under mathematically perfected economy, and I put away $100,000 a year out of a $125,000 a year salary. So in 20 years, I saved $2 million. Now, <clears throat> suppose I bought a new car. I don't have to borrow any money at all to buy that car. I could pay for it cash. Suppose, on the other hand, under mathematically perfected economy, instead of paying cash for it, and I understand that I'm advocating something which is self-destructive under the present obfuscation of the currency. We have to understand a further thing about money, and I've already mentioned it. I raise the fact that the only proper circulation is representative of all wealth. Now, under mathematically perfected economy, that's accomplished in two ways. Uh, We allow the individual, we restore the right of the individual to issue their own promissory notes, and this, of course, is how all production can be financed, if we so choose, to... um, 
to engage in issuance of a promissory note. But in the case that I'm just describing, I've got $2 million saved up and I can pay cash for the brand new car. Which, which betters the subjects of the economy? Well, in fact, what's, what betters the subjects of the economy is for me to issue a promissory note for the car. Why? Because the value of the car is necessary to be introduced into circulation to sustain all of the related economic activity, what we call industry and commerce. So, uh, the producers of the car get their bills paid and so on and so forth. Instead of introducing currency back into circulation for my savings, which already represents something else and is committed to be paid out of circulation for that thing. So, the issuance of a promissory note is an enablement of the participants of the economy, uh, so which it enables them um, to sustain the production which has been delivered to me. Now, when I issue the promissory note, does it put me in debt to the degree of the car? Absolutely not. Why? <laughs> it's not a debt as we know debt at all. On the contrary, it is explicitly an obligation to pay for the car as I consume of it. So it's going to come out of my savings, you see, because if I'm not earning anything further, or it's going to come out of further earning if I am. But the thing is, by issuing a promissory obligation, it doesn't cost me one penny more, and it sustains all the further economic activity, which is necessary to sustain to continue producing cars. You see, if we have a minute circulation and we all saved out of it and there's nothing actually circulating around anymore, nothing can happen. You see, it's by introducing uh, the circulation respective to further property which is created, which sustains the conveyance and, and further production of such property, which allows us to prosper. So it's not debt that we're discussing here. It's, it's an obligation to pay as we consume of, of, of something. Uh, if a new couple uh, gets married and, and want to move into a $100,000 home with a 100-year lifespan, uh, at a linear rate of depreciation, mathematically perfected economy allows them to do that. If we don't introduce the money into circulation, then the money doesn't exist in circulation relative to sustaining the industrial activity which produces such homes. So they, don't, they can't be produced because we can't afford to do that. So effectively, we're not really talking about assuming indebtedness. We're actually talking about monetizing our production. And we're doing that by committing to pay for the production as we consume of it, which is not actually to, to consume a, assume a debt. It's the same as, as um, hooking up your house to the electrical power company. Okay, So my, uh, say my, my electric bills are going to be $60 a month or whatever they are you know, uh, after we do this. Have I assumed a debt for all the electricity I'll ever consume? No. I've committed by subscribing to the system, to paying for the electricity as I've consumed of it. And under mathematically perfected economy, we monetize the consumption so that the electric power company can be rewarded for it, can afford to produce it, and so on and so forth. The thing is, these people who are reacting um, to debt are simply saying that one thing or another thing or another thing is debt, and all other um, obligations are debt as well. Well, that's not true at all. But as we prove in these forums where these people who, who assert that money cannot be a debt 
um, unless uh, the life cycle of the tokenization parallels the life cycle of whatever property it, by intention, uh, would represent, then, and, and thus, if, if, unless it has an obligation attached to it to pay for consumption at the rate of consumption, we have inflation. So there's no such thing as spending money into circulation without inflation unless you attach an obligation to the circulation, which is no more than to pay for it as you consume of it, which is the only right thing to do. What are we trying to do by creating what we call an economy? Are we trying to create a license to be rewarded without production? Absolutely not. That's not an object of it at all. So, uh, therefore, uh, we've reduced issues to exactly what they have to be in mathematically perfected economy. And the reason that the uh, a promissory obligation is the only vehicle for tokenizing wealth have been made perfectly clear by this. I mean, you might have to listen to it a few times before you understand it, but it's the only thing which makes, the, as Jack said to me the other day, which makes the, the equation work. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's the obligation to pay for things as, as you consume of them is an unavoidable uh, obligation in a just economy. Otherwise, we would have a class of consumers who don't produce likewise, and that's not something we desire to have at all. You see, um, Mike, can I just uh, go over that again then with uh, maybe a real world example, so sure. to speak? Because I mean, a lot of people um, are going to be listening to this. A lot of people uh, are, are going to have to try and figure out how this mathematically perfected economy is going to work in the real world. Now, I mean, you're, you're putting across um, plenty of examples. Um, so let's try doing something um, in such a way that uh, listeners can maybe understand how it would work in their, their life. So let's just flick maybe next year, let's hope, <laughs> to mathematically perfected economy running throughout the system. So, I mean, is there a reason for us to be working 40 hours a week, for instance? How much are we going to be paid uh, for doing that? Um, and if there is uh, a reduction in, in production, because, of course, we don't need to produce quite so much because hopefully we're producing quality goods that last two and three times longer than the current ones anyway, um, I mean, this is this partially what would happen, and how would we then purchase items? I mean, obviously, you've mentioned you could be saving. You could work, and you could save, and just pay outright uh, cash uh, for any uh, any purchase that you had. Whereas now you can't because there's just no way of saving. You have to go into debt pretty much to buy anything. Um, so how how would this work for you know a real man, real woman next year when mathematically perfected economy? What would be the scenario that you could think of uh, as as uh, explainable and as understandable as maybe you could make it to well, we the average make, person? We can make a, a number of examples, uh, you know, uh, for which. Which cover the bases. I mean, we just put people in as as if they're mathematic variables, in which they, in truth, are in in in, in a true economy. Um, what we have is a way of monetizing all production and desirable prosperity, um, which uh, reduces our issues to, uh, you know, if we don't want someone to do something, we um, we prevent them from doing it, and by regular legal. Uh, channels or channel other channels of influence, but uh, we don't do it by p penalizing them by uh, uh, imposing improprieties on an economy or whatever like that. Um, mathematically perfected economy is an eradication of 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 all irrelevant issues, um, and it's a way to monetize uh, prosperity. Um, um, uh, all the prosper desirable prosperity that we're capable and, and willing to uh, uh, to uh, deliver to ourselves so um, we can take uh, 
let's just take a typical example a, a family um they are uh, you know whatever their their salary is uh it's uh, all absorbed in um in uh servicing their own private debts and uh, the government, uh, um, under a lie of fiscal austerity, is uh, discussing uh, um, uh, enforcing uh, payment on uh, its uh, ever more ominous uh, deficits, which are a further extension of this obfuscation of the currency. That alone is threatening uh, terminal uh, monetary consequences upon them. Uh, furthermore, uh, this artificial multiplication of artificial indebtedness um, is uh, jeopardizing the, uh, their employers. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, jeopardizing their jobs, in other words. Um, it's forcing the costs of all things upward. Um, and so as their jeopardized employer cannot afford to pay them commensurably or to increase even its own uh, charges um, for its own production um, to a, a, a market strapped by the same factors, um, the industry is possibly going down um, while prices are going up. They're not going up enough for industry to meet margins of solubility. Everybody is is marginalized um, to a critical extent where in this uh, what's often called a house of cards um, the first card to go down affects immediately adjacent uh, sectors and the whole thing comes down uh, like the proverbial house of cards so um, this family is living under a great deal of stress um, uh, artificial stress um, uh, and let's put some real numbers on this um, let's just say um, well let's just say the husband and the wife both work and together their salaries are five thousand dollars a month and uh, let's say uh, twenty five hundred dollars of that is dedicated to their mortgage and uh, it's actually a uh, $35,000 home built in 1963, but uh, they bought it, oh, let's just say five years ago for $350,000. <laughs> and the rest of their earnings are dedicated to car payments, uh, marginal health care, food, the necessities of life. Uh, they can't afford to have ho hobbies such as uh, sailing or hunting or whatever. Uh, um, their spare hours are spent um, vegetating and wishing they weren't and, uh, you know, wishing things weren't were better, but um, eventually you know, succumbing to the television being the, you know, full satisfaction of, uh, you know, every spare hour of their life. Well, in a transformation to mathematically perfected economy, what we're concerned with accomplishing seems at first thought to be a, uh, a, a, a distant, uh, difficult to achieve object. Um, that is, uh, what we really want to do is restore the uh, state of affairs to what it would have been if we had enjoyed the benefits of mathematically perfected economy all our lives. Now, of course, it's impractical to say that, uh, well, we would have had toys that we could never have afforded, so let's buy ourselves all these toys. Well, this transformation is, is, is about nothing impractical. It concerns the things we have, um, because the moment we involve 
impracticality or impractical objects in our need to transform, we interject all kinds of issues uh, which we which which are further 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 divisive and as i see it it just it's it would be trivial for us to to insist on you know restoring certain details um, nonetheless what we do have to deal with are the things that we do have uh um, and we have achieved um, under this obfuscation of the currency, and how do we rectify um, the resultant state of affairs relative to those things? That's the scope of this transformation. So this transformation affects these people in regard to what they have engaged, succeeded in engaging in doing under this lie of economy which has been imposed upon us. And the first thing that it would do, it would take this $350,000 home that they've built, which was actually um, a $35,000 home built in 1963. Now, how would it rectify um, their situation in regard to their mortgage? That home... Uh, it's two, it's 2010, so 1963 was, you know, 47 years ago. Um, and uh, is that right? Yeah. Um, so uh, let's just call that 50 years of consumption of a 100-year lifespan, just to speak in round numbers. Um, and let's just say that in today's dollars um, to have built that house uh, would cost and let's use a round number it probably works out to a little higher than this um, let's just say let's just make it $150,000 well We do two things. <clears throat> We're going to refinance that home under mathematically perfected economy, uh, counting all prior payments of interest instead toward principal. But before we do that, we're going to evaluate a fork of logic, which is only right. If the house was the cost of the house, which was financed under the present imposed system, exceeds the cost of producing it under the present system, instead of considering $350,000 to be the original principal of the debt which was assumed, we're going to consider it to be the $150,000, um, uh, which... Uh, 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 is the reflects the cost of producing the house in today's dollar, and we're going to refinance that under mathematically perfected economy, which is to arrive at a state where f half of its hundred-year lifespan has uh, remains. Um, and so, in doing this, um, we are counting all of their payments of interest instead toward a $150,000 principal instead of a $350,000 principal, the consequence of an artificial, quote-unquote, housing bubble. Now, <clears throat> so this means that, say, they've owned this house, what did we say it was, for five years, and their payments were $2,500 a month. So... Um, most of that is still going toward interest, and uh, you know the the fellow you know who, who the, the head of household, the man, uh, they're both heads of household. Um, he got laid off last week, but he went back to work this week, and uh, they missed a payment, and uh, uh, they couldn't quite make ends meet. 
And so uh, their mortgage is, is in jeopardy. Well, under mathematically perfected economy, counting all prior payments of interest instead toward principal puts everyone, regardless of this refinancing of the principal, puts everyone way, way, way far ahead on their payments. Way far ahead on their payments. Not only does it put us way far ahead on our payments, but at a linear rate of depreciation, um, since a $100,000 house with a 100-year lifespan, the, the payments work out to be $1,000 a year or $83.33 a, a month, uh, being as we've reduced the principal to um, uh, $150,000 on this house, uh, linear rate of depreciation works out to $1,500 a year, less than their monthly payments, $1,000 less than their monthly payments is what their yearly payment would be under mathematically perfected economy. Not only so, being as we've counted this phenomenal payment of $2,500 a month, most of which went toward interest, since we've counted that toward principal, they are, they have paid down their principal so much they might not make another payment on their house for another 10 years under mathematically perfected economy because they are that far ahead on their equity, which is which just translates to a just situation of paying for our consumption of production with our with so much as our own production. We're paying a house for a house instead of five houses for a house and and and, and at an at an artificially inflated price from the beginning. So um, basically, we've eliminated just in this this much, just in consideration of their house. We have given this couple immediately, out of a five thousand dollar a month combined salary, we have given them immediately twenty five hundred dollars a month of free spending money. And ten years down the road, when they resume paying for the remainder of the equity of the house which they're finally beginning to consume again because they've overpaid for so long, their payments are going to be one and a half times $83.33 a month, about $125 a month, figured at a linear rate of depreciation. So we've reduced those $2,500 a month payments down eventually to $125 a month at an overall rate of depreciation, but as I've often explained uh, under mathematically perfected economy. I don't actually advocate linear rates of depreciation. The payments would actually be far lower than that under mathematically perfected economy in the latter half of a, a lifespan. Um, you know, you, you might pay $250 a month in the beginning of a $100,000 home's life with a 100-year lifespan, and in the last quarter of the lifespan, you might be paying $10 a month because of de-escalated rates of depreciation, which are necessary to reflect uh, the, the more or less greater consumption, perceived consumption of the value of the property uh, in, in, in in its, you know, newer parts of its lifespan, um, and which rates of depreciation are also conducive to encouraging people to uh, consume the entire potential lifespan. That if if everybody could buy a brand new house for the same price they could buy, you know, be paying for a very very old house, of course, we would buy new homes. So that's how much. That accomplishes for this couple um, immediately, and, and in fact, since the house is, you know, half their salaries, this means that the 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 mother of this family can, uh, you know, return to the home. She doesn't have to work anymore. We can, you know, have mothers in our houses, uh, uh, you know, uh, teaching children and 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 discipline planning children and, you know, making sure, you know, uh, things are the way they, 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 they can be, if we so desire. Um, so the rest of uh, the, their spending money goes uh, much the same way. Um, would we um, have uh, 
diminish salaries under mathematically perfected economy? I'm often asked this question. No, not at all. In fact, the company can afford to pay you more, and um, it's it's there's actually more compelling reasons for them to do so because you can afford to leave a company and go out on your own. A company uh, is basically more compelled than ever to uh, acknowledge the worth of its employees um, and more capable to, to justly reward them than ever under mathematically perfected economy. Why? You work for a, a grinding shop. Um, and, uh, you know, you're good. And uh, uh, one of the clients at the shop, they always come in, they talk to you because you oversee, you know, the layout and the setups uh, which produce the products for them, and your work is right on the money. And they know that if you ever left that company, they'd want to keep track of you. They come to your Christmas parties. They, they, they know you. They interact with you all the time. They talk to you. They consult with you about, you know, improvements of their product. How would we do this? Is this feasible? How much would it cost us? How much, you know, what are the, what are the, what are the, you know, what are the, what's the upside and what's the downside of whatever the proposition? So, um, the fact of the matter is, under this economy, that person could never afford to go out on their own because they're paying, like this family that we're discussing, they're paying all their money to, you know, artificial indebtedness and uh, multiplied by interest. And um, uh, they have no room for savings, whereas uh, under mathematically perfected economy, you have the skills, you have the client, this guy doesn't treat you right at this company. Guess what? You go down, you talk to the, the, the common monetary foundry, and you say, okay, I have this guy. I've always done this work. If I leave this company, this company's going to lose that contract. They're going to want it done by me. This is what it's going to cost me to buy one of these machines. This machine is $20,000. I do $250,000 worth of work for this company every year. The machine will last 50 years. If I buy it brand new, the payments are going to be $20 a month. Therefore, I can afford to do this. I'm going to rent this building for whatever it's going to be, $1,000 a month to $250 a month. I'm going to buy it for $100 a month under mathematically perfected economy. So bingo, for a hundred dollars a month I've got a building for twenty dollars a month I've got the machine I need and I already have the clientele so I leave why because my employer treated me wrong isn't paying me enough isn't paying me nearly enough I might be happy to 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 accept an equitable share of this but we're not even close to that and after five years bye I'm gone you stepped on my foot one day I'm out of here you know, so under mathematically perfected economy, employers are going to have to reward employees justly. What further things? Actually, before you go on on that one, Mike, um, the question I would have on that is the, the the company you are suggesting would want to pay their employees more and more, but of course they still have a product to sell at the end of it, and the labor costs are a big part of the the pricing. Uh, for that product itself. So would that not be a problem? Um, no, those, because... you're, you're absolutely right. Those are limiting factors, okay? But um, in the case of each of these companies, um, uh, the existing one and the prospective one that the employee leaves, um, you have a completely different set of situations now. Now, uh, what happens? You have, uh, you know, uh, a, a slum landlord who uh, charges incredible fees for industrial um, uh, job sites, uh, you know, shop sites, um, based basically on what those companies can make. They want a huge cut in it. Okay, under mathematically perfected economy. Um, you could own the property for a tiny fraction of this. So this eliminates this cost, which is a huge cost. Um, 
you know, I mean, I'm, I'm constantly hearing reports of, you know, businesses that have existed for, you know, 20 years and more right now um, that have, have prospered until two or three years ago. And, and as, you know, things are going off the deep end now, they're, they're, they're moving these businesses home because they can't even afford to pay their rent. And the rent, you find, is huge, you see. Also, you know, companies go into debt. Um, another thing is uh, the very nature of a corpor- corporation. Um, what are corpor- corporations have been about falsehoods in many ways for a long time? During the 90s, we had, you know, the, the, the false dot-com boom. Um, and most of those companies um, made their money uh, uh over an, 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 an IPO, an in, initial public offering. That is, when they came up with a scam that was sufficient to deceive people into thinking if they invested in it that they could make a lot of money back, um, they dropped it on the, their stocks on the market and, uh, and collected. They spent, you know, a typical story during this so-called greatest industrial expansion in modern history that Bill Clinton claims. Most of these companies never even, uh, most of these companies, the few survivors of them, made a, never made a penny of profit until after Clinton left office. And there are few of those. Uh, most of the money got spent on Lamborghinis and, you know, office parties, and, and these are true facts, you see. Now, the thing is, these aren't the things that increase prosperity. And all of that actually committed this company to pay uh, these quote-unquote investors um, uh, perpetually ever afterward. Mathematically perfected economy eliminates the whole impetus and facade of such a uh, situation. If uh, you're an ace at whatever you do, um, and uh, a market can sustain you, um, you can issue uh, at your own risk a promissory obligation to commit to um, finance yourself for whatever you need at minimal cost. And, you know, if you need a house under this system, you've got to commit to paying for five houses over a fraction of the lifespan of the house. Under mathematically perfected economy, if you need a house, you commit to only paying for a house over the lifespan of the house, which is far greater than the minimal amount of time that you're paying five houses under this system. And it's this reduction of costs across the board which free up further money for businesses which have these costs, you know, um, to uh, to 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 pay their employees. Otherwise, now if those if those abilities don't exist in those businesses, then they don't exist for that employee to go out on their own either. You see, so I'm not advocating something that doesn't exist. I'm just advo- I, I'm just explaining how a typical situation enables you know these kinds of 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 improvements in, or, or rectifications, I might say, um, in, 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 in justice. Um, truth of the matter is, uh, uh, generally, a tremendous amount of money, um, which actually doesn't even go to an initial startup, is required um, often to align uh, money up. I hear of practically unbelievable stories of major financial efforts going on in all parts of the world right now. And I, I hesitate to uh, express the degree of faith that I have in you know, some sources of, you know, relatively confidential information. But uh, the fact of the matter is, um, so corrupt is this system that there are many things the world direly needs and we would have had decades ago if it weren't for the further injustices 
of um, this so-called financial system and the ways that it tries to intervene between producers and consumers of the production to manipulate itself into positions of exploitation. And uh, most of the money in the world that's going anywhere is going there for that at this time. And mathematically perfected economy enables us to uh, eliminate that, not by passing laws against it, which is something we can do, which which is a further option, uh, which is conducive to solution but isn't necessary in a free world empowered to finance uh, what it needs to do to solve its problems. Um, give you an example of that. Um, I was talking about, you know, Nassara a week or two ago and and, uh, and uh, its affiliation with this uh, farm aid program. And I mentioned uh, issues with uh, dairy farmers, uh, which were raised at a farm aid concert a couple of years ago, 2009. And... Um, uh, they basically stated that, uh, uh, you know, uh, I forget exactly what the unit was. I think it was called a hundred weight of milk. Um, cost uh, dairy f- uh, dairy farmers were getting in the you know low twenty dollars for it, uh, just you know a short while back, and at the time of the two thousand nine program that. Um, you know, elaborated on this. Uh, the price had gone down to something like uh, eleven dollars a hundred weight, and it cost ten dollars a hundred weight. You know, to produce this, or it cost twelve dollars a hundred weight to produce what they're only getting eleven eleven dollars for. And uh, in other words, it was a you know uh, either no profit or a, 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 a loss, which uh, was perpetual and couldn't be sustained. At the same time. Uh, middlemen were making record profits. Now, how is this accomplished? Well, um, those who were uh, attached closer to the purse strings of the all this uh, confiscation of wealth by the central banking system are positioned as agents of um, the uh, inevitably super, super, super wealthy to, uh, quote, reinvest, unquote, uh, this money. And uh, what are they looking for? Uh, Leverage. Um, Not just profit. They're looking for always maximal um, profit, regardless of producing anything at all. But they are more fit than these impoverished, broken farmers to uh, develop uh, a... a, uh, a processing plant, which all this milk could be trucked to and then uh, packaged and uh, delivered to the end markets. Um, and so uh, who finances this? Somebody who knows nothing about milk at all, um, who uh, barely read or understood the business plan for this venture to capitalize uh, uh, a uh, distribution plant. And uh, the whole purpose of this is to uh, um, leverage the farmers into a disadvantage. Um, then we've got further, um, you know, capital that we can uh, uh, reinvest in all the farms, and they all become corporate farms. The next thing you know, it's a corporate world. And who is it owned by? The people that confiscated all the wealth. Under mathematically perfected economy, all these farmers can say, hey, look, you know, okay, these are all the dairies that these guys are trucking milk from. Let's put them out of business. We're the people who know how to do all this. Um, let's buy the equipment. Not only will we buy it, we'll operate it, giving ourselves further employment, and uh, we'll process our own milk. And we'll do it at minimal cost, at no more than uh, the uh, cost of the equipment. Um, uh, financed uh, over the lifespan of the equipment, uh, which is negligible, whereas they're paying um, 
you know, half their former profits a year ago for distribution while the distribution uh, facility is, is making record pr- profits and so impoverishing the producers of the milk that they won't be able to survive another year, another two years, you see. So this is about empowerment and 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 protection of what's you know rightfully ours uh means of of um of uh production which we the people have developed um you know uh, these people who uh um take the money through this system you know, actually believe that they make the world tick, and and it's the exact opposite of that. They're the problem. Uh, what happens to uh, a viable industrial e- endeavor um, when the people who in- developed it and, and perfected uh, every detail of its processes and and pleased uh, the markets and uh, became a dominant power? Um, have to sell because they've been squeezed out of business by uh, uh, a lie of economy, which which can only uh, impose terminal failure on all of us. Do the few employees who are left jump for joy thinking that a banker can run their business the way it needs to be run? Do they have faith that that business is going to survive now? Never, you know. I mean, you can't ask that person... Uh, a, a reasonably difficult question, which is critical to the survival of that company, they, they, they probably don't have an answer. They certainly probably don't have a very good answer. You know, um, uh, taking from the world isn't what makes the world tick. It's the ability to innovate, to perfect, and it's the very reward of like production for our production or just reward which is the whole motivating principle of of true free enterprise. And you erase that. You nullify it uh, under this purposed obfuscation of the currency, which can only dispossess us into terminal failure. So I think then if... um it's getting away from the, the the example a little bit, but just something that crossed my mind uh, while you were were talking about that. Then it, it seems to me that the the whole idea of uh, of, of stockholders and shareholders and uh, investment banking and investments, anything to do with any kind of paper trading of that kind and that sort. I mean, it seems to me that that would just go straight out of the window, and we're literally looking at. Um, you know, manufacturing production um, uh, as being the lifeblood from that point on. Absolutely. And that's a good point. Um, uh, you know, we tend to, uh, in our infancy of, of, of understanding um, uh, the problem, which is this obfuscation of the currency, and how it relates to anything and everything around us. Um, We tend to uh, relate to the end consequences of the obfuscation rather than tracing it to its root. Now, there are uh, substantial sectors of the population of most countries in the world who would uh, protest vehemently against that as a consequence. But um, except for the abusive uh, uh, traders, uh, this transformation in a mathematically perfected economy takes care of them as well. How and why? Um, Well, to understand why uh, we need, in truth, um, to look at uh, basically any potential class of this kind of activity um, 
analyze its uh, contributions and costs, um, as well as its ostensible principles, um, not just to evaluate whether or not they're compatible um, with what most of us understand is the only engine of prosperity, and that is production. Um, we have to understand that, in truth, there is no benefit from any of these activities whatsoever, and that, in truth, furthermore, um, there are uh, inherently extremely detrimental consequences. The basic way that we can understand that is, is, is to see that the pool of wealth is a consequence of production. If I build a house, I either want the house or I want the equivalent of the house because I'm a specialist in building houses who trades my production for the production of others. And when I do so, what do I want in return? I want the like of my house, as close as I can determine it. Now, what happens if we have people who take wealth without contributing commensurably to the pool of wealth is that their siphoning from the pool of wealth makes it mathematically impossible for the remainders of the of, uh, of the producers remainder of the producers of wealth to be re rewarded commensurably with their production instead of getting the equivalent of a if if say for instance half the wealth is siphoned off by without producing and of course if we're paying five homes for a home, then far more than half the wealth is being siphoned off for not producing. Especially if all things are financed by this obfuscation of the currency. So if half the wealth is siphoned off for building a house, I can get half a house. If four-fifths of the wealth is siphoned off for not producing, I can get a fifth of a house for producing a house. And of course, as multiplication of artificial indebtedness by interest multiplies the artificial sum of indebtedness and ever more of a circulation is dedicated to servicing debt, ever less of the pool of wealth returns to us for whatever our contribution. Until, of course, in the end we can't even meet our artificial obligations and we're dis dispossessed when we go into foreclosure or whatever. So um, this is um, this idea of unearned gain is mutually exclusive to the very idea of true free enterprise. The most important object and principle of which is just reward for production. So, how devastating is this facade? Well, you know, you might have grandma's got stock in IBM, and uh, she doesn't care to understand um, anything about uh, this monetary failure. As far as she's okay, she's fine. Now, she watches the news every night because her IBM stock has been vacillating for many years. And yesterday it went down a dollar. And today it comes back up 15 cents. And when the news is announced, she literally exclaims, yippee. Well, <laughs> what's happened here? Um, are we growing money on trees and we can all just get wealthy without production? Is this the right way um, to uh, sustain grandma in her advanced stages of life? Is it better for grandma that we leave her 
to this? Or is it better that we somehow uh, get Grandma's attention that she becomes conducive to this idea of mathematically perfected economy? Well, I speak to this generation quite often, and quite frankly, they're the most indisposed to recognize the causes or solution of our problems of all people. And we can understand that uh, for many reasons. Um, but the truth of the matter is, what Grandma is not paying attention to is that the reason the stock bounced up to 15 cents was that morning the Federal Reserve announced that it was going to buy another $600 billion in federal securities, treasury securities, whatever. And so what's going on there is as the curtain inevitably drops in the final scene of the terminal stages of this finite lifespan of an obfuscation of the currency which served no one, Grandma is actually hoping that she's treading water, that her IBM stocks are going to stay at a high that she's hoping for. Meanwhile, she really can't ever cash in on that. <laughs> And all the while, what's going on is so that that stock could bounce up 15 cents based on a hollow facade, which itself is doomed to failure and which can, 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 can require, only require, further and ever escalating efforts to rescue the lie of economy, which can only multiply artificial costliness on us into terminal failure. She's hoping to tread water, while for 15 cents of benefit she can never cash in on, we're assuming unbelievable, unfathomable sums of further artificial cost. So, Part of this transformation to mathematically perfected economy, what we do basically is we refinance all our proper all, all our monetary obligations under mathematically perfected economy, uh, placing uh, an original ceiling on the cost of producing the thing, uh, on either the cost of producing the property under today's dollars, or the actual finance principle, whichever is lesser. In other words, if your original uh, originally bought this home, this $350,000 home for $150,000, we're not going to refinance it for less than $150,000. And um, so we, we actually are going to eliminate most of the artificial indebtedness that exists. Um, owing to the fact that we paid for it uh, many times over. Now, the fact of the matter is, nonetheless, that we have a, a volume of property which is unrepresented. And so, in order to reflate the circulation to uh, what it needs to be, that it represents the remaining value of represented wealth, we restore to the accounts of the people their losses under this obfuscation of the currency. So that, um, say for instance, we compelled, instead of a so social security program, we um, compel people to save so much of their earnings, a third of their earnings or whatever, um, for uh, sustaining their standard of living in, in later life. Well, we determine how much we need to reflate the 
circulation, and then we distribute, redistribute it back into the accounts of the people, so much as they might have saved, <clears throat> so that uh, even with this failing uh, social, social Security program, um, uh, everyone can immediately, without it costing us a penny, um, sustain themselves in, um, you know, retirement. Now, what's going to happen, and that's the basic prescription for the transformation. It's a reflation of the circulation to uh, the very sum or volume that we were discussing earlier that Benjamin Franklin needed to realize what was the proper amount. And... Um, so what's going to happen with these investments that we call them? They're not really investments. So once, a, once after an IPO, all you're doing is gambling on possession of these things. So what's going to happen to grandma's IBM stocks? Well, under mathematically perfected economy, um, IBM has all options that it doesn't have otherwise. And... Uh, that would be either to issue promissory obligations to buy their stock back, which allows them to uh, reduce the costs for the products and services they provide because um, they're no longer paying perpetual dividends on these stocks. So the whole idea of, of funding a corporation um, will likely go away. Uh, it doesn't mean that new ideas won't spring up, but they, their value will be um, uh, true value in uh, innovations in ad ad administering to, you know, the affairs of the business or, or, or whatever. Um, and uh, I would imagine that, uh, you know, uh, the, the math is that uh, the the value of the stocks um, can reach uh, um, a, a reasonable level only under mathematically perfected economy, and uh, more so than ever, the companies uh, would be able and compelled to buy their stocks back and become something other than a corporation. In other words, instead of directed by a, a board of directors who appoints a, you know, a CEO and whatever, um, they're, uh, they're a different kind of a structure that uh, more intelligently um, delivers um, uh, upon its administrative needs to itself and uh, bases its decisions on a far more sounder, um, singular uh, motivating factor of, um, of production and uh, market share. So uh, those are the basic differences. Um, I expect there to be some changes um, in, uh, you know, in, in, our, in, our, in our concepts of, of doing business. Um, I expect there to be uh, far more viable competition to develop um, further methods of distributing product to market. Uh, you may see all kinds of experience, uh, experiments uh, arise practically immediately. People, uh, you know, driving to the store, uh, putting up a website where you can order, you know, groceries for your town and they go to town every day and, you know, fill up a, a small refrigerator truck with, you know, what everybody needs today and you, instead of buying your cilantro a week ago, you have it delivered this afternoon. So, you know, the sky's the limit. Um, likewise, as you say, uh, we especially if we produce, re return to uh, producing quality products. Uh, another thing that's going to happen is, you know, we won't be consuming um, that product so many times over uh, much more limited lifespans. 
Um, another thing that's likely to happen is uh, because we're so dramatically reducing the costs of government and eliminating uh, redundant jobs in government and 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 on and on. Um, what's to happen is that we're going to divide uh, the jobs that exist equitably amongst ourselves and enjoy um, far more, probably twice as much, at least uh, free time to ourselves um, uh, without any um, uh, drop in standard of living at all and, and in fact probably more likely uh, a far higher uh, quality standard of living. Um, after all, you know, when I was in elementary school, our the covers we used to put on our textbooks used to promise that by the year 1980, owing to in, increased industrial expansion, uh, the greatest problem in the world would be knowing what to do with all our free time. Um, it never happened, and the reason is uh, artificial multiplication of falsified indebtedness. Yeah, I think that was the um, the scheming plan <laughs> to uh, to get us all hooked and spiked again. To the um, degree of uh, which it's a plan, I'm, I I don't know, and I know that one comes up a lot also. Yeah. You know, people are convinced, uh, Naomi Klein did a book that, you know, which she, she calls it the shock doctrine. I haven't read it, but I've heard her speak, and I know that it's about, um, from her own mouth at least, that it's about... Um, you know this idea that uh, corporations and banks, uh, the the ruling elite, have basically planned this. Well, <clears throat> I know that there is a great effort to persist in it, despite um, its uh, obviously uh, potentially fatal consequences. But uh, you know. The truth of the matter, I don't believe that it's it's a plan to collapse. Um, after all, um, a parasite can only live off uh, a surviving host. The parasite that kills the host is in deep trouble, especially when that's the only host there is. Now, in the great in the case of the Great Depression, the first Great Depression, of course, we went on for you know some ten years. Um, uh, without, uh, you know, restoring, uh, artificially renewing creditworthiness so that, you know, we could start over again. Um, and the real reason uh, that, you know, uh, there was a uh, new lifespan of, of the system was not um, that the system can recover, because it can't recover. You've permanently destroy creditworthiness. Um, what ha has to happen is you have to artificially allow people to uh, start over again, uh, uh, even though creditworthiness is destroyed. Theoretically, um, the, the, the artificial monetary failure is permanent. So um, I don't know that the 10-year pattern would be repeated again. Um, and if I was administering to this thing, I could see how, you know, I could bounce it up from here and I could keep it at a much higher spot. Um, but that isn't the right thing to do about all this because, you know, what all you're doing is, is um, extending um, all the injustice of the system. You're perpetuating the crime against us um, by virtue, if, there, if it is one, of minimalizing um, um, it's it's a, a, of settling on some middle ground of the of committing the crime, uh, so that the subjects unwitting subjects of the system uh, give the nod to it every day. It's as if somebody's stealing from your garage, and um, every night and. You need the things that are in there, and you replace them every day. 
until they take more things than you can replace every day, and then this thing doesn't work anymore. And they realize, oh, so and so can't afford to buy all that stuff again. I really need an ever, you know, uh, inexhaustible supply of crescent wrenches. So uh, I'll wait a few nights till they can afford to replace the crescent wrench because I can't remember where I put the 344 that I've already stolen from them. So um, t- they let two nights go by and they go in there and steal your crescent wrench again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and if you replace it, they'll take it again tomorrow because they don't even care where they put it. They just throw it off the side of the road when they're done with it or whatever. You know, that's more or less what's going on with this, this banking system. So if it weren't terminal, we still have to fix it. Uh, the fact that it's terminal is, I believe, actually an in, inadvertent consequence. I really don't see that any of these people are are really – that devious? I mean, they're very devious. They're, in, in fact, many of them, I would say, are even incredibly evil. But they, you, I can't give them credit for actually conceiving of a means of stealing from the whole world on such a scale, which is terminal not only to the world, so much that it's going to piss the world off. And that same person who's so brilliant is yet wanting to sit in the driver's seat as that scenario comes down the road. <laughs> I, don't, I just don't see that. Um, yes, uh, they're egotistical. They believe that somehow there's a magic button put that they can push, which has already been pushed in panic, you know, for 100 years. Um, which is going to cause some di- different effect. But the only reason that they think so is they're stupid. Like Ellen Hodgson Brown thinks she has an alternate solution and can't even articulate it to us. You know, Sure, she can say, well, you can do 20 jumping jacks over in the corner over there, and that's going to fix everything. But that isn't articulating a solution. She's just asserting these things, claiming this, claiming that. Same thing. Stevens Arlinga, you know, the list goes on and on and on. And why did any of these people stand up and say, I have a solution, when the work they plagiarized from the very beginning, from day one and to this very day, still says singular solution, right? Planted on every page. You can't possibly miss it if you're, if you're, if you're half a studier at all. So um, I see stupidity on both sides, which is phenomenal. Um, I can't tell you how much it offends me when, you know, uh, you know, everything I hear from these plagiarists is just so preposterous. You know, when a, you know, a 16 year old kid 42 years ago was, was, uh, you know, it had already proved them wrong, proved that there's only one way to do this. And here, 42 years late, they're jumping up and down as if they're providing a solution. I mean, it's just preposterous. I mean, it's hideous. <laughs> it's as stupid as stupid gets, you know. And who can, who, can, who can actually prove it's a solution? Here I am arguing with their supporters that, that you know, who, who are asserting over and over and over again, no matter how many times you prove otherwise to them, that money cannot be a debt. When if there's no obligation, there can be no integrity whatsoever. And the very people that are advocating this in, inevitably admit that they can't solve inflation unless they provide a way for every penny of it to be withdrawn from circulation. And there's your obligation. All they're doing is, is a matter of convenience to pretend they have a solution. They're eliminating any reference to that vital fact in their work. And the only reason they're doing that is because they are that unfit to claim that they're providing solution. They're just purely as inept as inept gets. So that's pretty much it uh, around the board. I mean, we can talk about these people individually. Um, uh, and I, I could ask, but what's the point? Um, I will say um, that in wrestling with their um, supporters, um, I do sometimes uh, see 
uh, things which I believe I've made obvious, um, which they raise as another matter that they don't understand. And it, it, it allows me an opportunity uh, eventually to, uh, um, to restore to them uh, an understanding, to, to give them uh, a doorway to, to go through, to uh, understand that what they, they've thought is solution is not solution at all. They, you know, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, and they got a bag of popcorn instead, and it cost them some money, and that was the whole purpose of the bag of popcorn. And uh, now they have to get serious. They go, well, at least that person informed me of this. I'm sorry. All that person did was plagiarize all the history that I presented to teach, and they stripped it of all its teaching, and they did that to make a buck. You know, um, and 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 that's what's wrong with it because it's 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 just as divisive as divisive gets. We have all these different factions now who quote unquote know that their solution is a monetary solution, and not one of them can even articulate it. You visit these sites, Nassara doesn't even explain why the um, obfuscation of the ter- uh, currency is terminal. Yet, after I've argued ag- against them for God, close to 20 years, they also become advocates of eradicating interest, likewise, without any explanation of that on their pages. All you see is a hodgepodge of assertion after assertion, as if it's solution, and any intelligent person who reads this stuff is is constantly, sentence after sentence, if you're trying to understand this, perceive it for whatever it is, you're saying, but where's the math? Where's the accountability? What do you mean that's a solution? How? Why? What did it solve? Oh, I already understand that interest has to be eradicated. How do I understand that? If I can't even articulate that the uh, banking system isn't even a creditor, it intervenes between the actual creditor who gives up property for the promissory obligation and the obligor uh, merely to issue evidence of our promissory obligations to each other, that principles should be retired from circulation, that instead the banking system launders it into its own possession, thus enriching itself to the extent of all the principle that's ever created for the mere cost of the of publishing our promissory obligations to each other and then multiplies that into terminal artificial indebtedness by interest by this implicit obligation to maintain a vital circulation which requires perpetually reborrowing principal and interest back into circulation as an ever greater sum of debt inherently increased by so much as periodic interest on an ever greater sum of debt Ellen Hodge and Brown can't articulate that Stevens Arlinga can't articulate that. These people can't articulate that because it wasn't their original idea. They don't understand it, and they haven't said it tens of thousands of times over 40 years as the original author, author and the original author only has. That's the difference. That's a huge difference. But that's why you don't go to these people for solution, and that's why you ought to see in their work that not one of them advocates solution whatsoever. You know, what does Ellen Hodge and Brown say? It's a Ponzi scheme. (laughs) A Ponzi scheme. Read the definition of a Ponzi scheme and then perform an experiment on yourself. Um, From the definition of a Ponzi scheme, prescribe solution of the categoric faults of this lie of economy. It's impossible. It doesn't even relate. It's not even truly a Ponzi scheme at all. And to call it a Ponzi scheme is the last thing that the actual author of Solution would ever, 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 ever have done. You know, it's a Solution is a process of carefully looking at all the parts seeing exactly what they are, 
And regardless, first of all, regardless of whatever anyone in the world calls that thing, almost always giving it a more explicit name, which exactingly expresses exactly what that thing is. Is inflation both increases of prices and uh, increases in the volume of circulation? Do they correspond to each other? Absolutely not. So an author of solution, a person who builds a solution, inherently, automatically, and inevitably, without exception, develops two terms for those two different things. And that's exactly why I have two terms, circulatory inflation and price inflation. That's exactly why. And that's why those terms express exactly what they do, you see. So you can't pick up a book on solution and see it doesn't even have the terminology which is intrinsic to solution and to solution only. In a plagiarist work, you, see, you read the word Ponzi scheme. Now, Ponzi scheme is the last idea. C can you imagine this? Sitting at a desk or working on a computer, writing as I did, writing models which even calculate the maximum possible lifespan of any purported economy based on interest-bearing debt with phenomenal accuracy such that you could project global monetary failure in 2010 from 1983. And sitting here, as you write all this code, perfect algorithms that account for every detail and nuance and exception and anomaly and in the end of realizing exactly this obfuscation of the currency, this implicit obligation to maintain a vital circulation, how it then interest inherently and irreversibly multiplies artificial indebtedness into terminal artificial indebtedness and then just jumping out of your chair when you get the, you know, eureka moment and saying, ah, it's a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> There's, there, there, is, there is absolutely no way in the world that that is the ultimate consequence of walking the road to the solution. That's absolutely impossible. That is the term of an imposter and an imposter only. I, I couldn't make myself call this a Ponzi scheme. When you throw that word at me, it aggravates me every time I hear it, even if I didn't know Ellen Hodgson Brown. If somebody just said, after I carefully explained all this to them, they jumped up out of their chair and go, that's a Ponzi scheme. I'm going, I'm thinking, how ignorant could you be to have heard the articulation of the intricacies of that and merely assume it's just some kind of Ponzi scheme or something. Like you, you, could, you could stop people from mailing checks to each other in the mail and that would fix this thing or something, you know. It, it's, just, it's just preposterous. And I mean, people haven't even begun to wake up that they think, oh, well, it's great that, you know, Ellen Hodgson Brown really helped us out here. You know, I'm sorry. You know, she's proudly cruising the world, boasting that she has one solution after another. And what happened, actually, is when she learned that the, the words that came out of Benjamin Franklin's mouth uh, in my parable of perfect economy were Mike Montagna's words, she quit saying that the Pennsylvania currency was the most brilliant banking model in our nation's history. Why? She wants all the credit for herself. Despite the fact that every day that she spends, wherever she goes, she's exposing the fact that she's no authority at all. None at all, you know. But she withdrew that, and then she began to advocate a different banking system. And, you know, one, one day you hear her praising interest. We've got to retain it in a banking system, and, you know, we can introduce it into circulation, but it's non-inflationary. She doesn't say it's not deflationary, and she doesn't show you how it's non-inflationary. She just says it is. And when you ask her to qualify that, when I ask her to qualify it, she turns and runs, you see. And that's because... She knows damn well herself that she's no authority, you know. So quit lying to us. I mean, 
It's preposterous. You know, every day I hear, um, I hear of, of, of generally several new people standing up as if they have a solution. And you can't even hardly distinguish the different things that these people are claiming solution, but none of them have a full qualification amounting to a proof of singular, singular solution, which I produced 42 years ago. You know, this is... This is, this is man shooting himself in the foot, in the other foot, in the leg, in the knee, in the other knee, in the other leg, in the upper leg, in the stomach, in the guts, in the lungs, in both arms, in the face. You know, what the hell for? You know, I mean, there was a solution a long time ago. What about it? These people don't dare even confront me because they don't have the first argument. They don't dare mention the fact that I exist because you would know there was a solution and they know you would know there's a solution and that's why I am the most prominent missing things from each of these plagiarists' work. Okay, Mike, so where do we go from here then? I don't know how much time we've actually got left now. Um, but uh, It doesn't matter. I just talk about something as long as it needs talked about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's okay. Um, I mean, obviously, I want to uh, I want to try and get the information across to as many people. I mean, you've been doing this for forty years, so we're now on TNS Radio. I'm hopeful, you know, that this will go out further and further. We'll get more people um, that also have their own. Uh, medium of uh, expression, let's say, uh, to be able to get the same message out. So what we need to do as well, I think, uh, what will definitely, we need to get this message out. We need to, to say mathematically perfected economy is the way we should be proceeding. Uh, we all know that there's a, well, all of us that are awake enough are aware that there is a problem. Um, we know there has to be something to fix it. We know interest or the fact that, that, that uh, debt and money is, is interest-based is a, a massive part of the problem, uh, you know, the, probably the number one part of the problem. But the other business uh, side of things is also an issue, um, as we've already stated with the, the stocks and bonds, well, not necessarily bonds, I suppose, but certainly stocks and shares and things like that, uh, and basically trading paper against paper. It, it's all something that's going to have to be changed, and we're going to have to get this out to people, and we're going to have to explain it in such a way um, that they can understand it, and, and they get this aha moment. Right. Well, uh, th this is something that they could do easily. Okay, let's just hold, uh, cut that off right there and, and, and address that much so far. Um, you know, uh, mathematically perfected economy, um, you know, there was people who shook their heads 40 years ago and said no one will ever understand those words, and it's a, it's a household term. You know, uh, in diverse places of the world and amongst many people. Um, I mean, uh, you know, I had unheard of traffic to my web pages even in the, you know, middle 90s. Um, and nonetheless, um, what, what people have to say to each other is not that mathematically perfected economy is the only way to go or something. You know, to that effect. Um, what in truth we, we really need to understand is, 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 as I have explained so many times, how interest, how, first of all, bankers are not creditors. We're not borrowing money from banks. The debt is not to the banks. It's an obligation to pay a promissory obligation out of circulation. Interest, furthermore, multiplies artificial indebtedness in proportion to capacity to pay by this implicit obligation to maintain a vital circulation by perpetually reborrowing principal and interest paid out of the circulation. With the principal, of course, you know, negating the possibility of, 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 of paying the sum of debt, debt down as what principal we pay out of circulation has to be reborrowed as new circulation uh, principal equal to the former principal. And as, of course, interest 
uh, is borrowed back into circulation as new debt above the former sum of debt, so the sum of debt increases perpetually as so long as we maintain a vital circulation by so much as ever greater sums of periodic interest on an ever greater sum of debt. Now, I can say that in a few minutes, and people may never um, express that so exactingly themselves. But those are the issues um, that we really, truly need to understand. Um, and we do ourselves injustice when we depart from an accurate explanation, an accurate and accountable explanation of, of, of the, the categoric faults and their singular solution. Now, mathematically perfected economy is is actually even, you know, quite simpler un to understand because all it is is a um, obligatory is eradication of interest and obligatory schedule of payment. The vehicle for which, of course, is a promissory note. Now, yes, it's important that people get the word out, um, and I'm uh, you'd be surprised how much of my time is taken up. Uh, with requests for me to speak to important people, um, uh, many of whom run in fear from me, um, uh, so that I can straighten them out where they're wrong. Um, those people, I, I've spent so long at this that um, I'm not a quitter, of course, but I've basically I've thrown the towel in on them. Not because, not just because they're lost causes, but because they won't go there in time. And I see this long-term pattern. A person like Ron Paul buys into this. Austrian economic dogma, a, a bunch of crap that, frankly, only a fool would fall for. And, uh, you know, the guy's irretrievable. And people have told me since about 1980 that Ron Paul was a guy that I have to talk to. Well, this is something that we have to get out of our heads. Um, because, in truth... If we wait for the guy who's never going to make the move, we sunk our ship. In truth, it's we the people of the world, especially when we are striving for what is absolutely just and righteous, and especially furthermore, when it's the only solution for our affairs. There's one and one only solution for inflation and deflation and maldisposition, one and one only solution for systemic manipulation of the cost or value of money or, or property, and one or one only solution for inherent irreversible multiplication of artificial indebtedness by interest. And why is everybody against interest nowadays? I was the only one in the world for so long, and it was my articles, Interest is Usury. That swayed people. I hear people using my very words all over the place, including people who don't even know me. The, the word obfuscation, since I started using it in relation to the currency, is becoming in common usage even in the news media. And yet these people, though this word descends from a sudden common regular incidence of usage, pay no mind or credit to this vital idea. This is what's wrong that we depend on a Ron Paul. Instead, we should be standing ourselves. But the truth is, there is no such thing as representation or consensual government where the people don't understand their own affairs. Given that government is so disposed to cheat us and to perpetuate this crime, we are our only hope of salvation. So this is why I've engineered the approach that I have. And uh, I was working on, you know, the last touches of this this evening, um, 
We're hoping to go online soon here. I know people have heard this before, but there's been lots of issues, including finances, which do not exist. And if it weren't for regular people uh, pledging to put this thing together, it would never happen. So we have a, a core of patriots which are which understand this issue which share in preserving the knowledge of it so it doesn't even just exist in one place something happens to me this thing isn't over and the vehicle as i see it yes it's good that other people um uh may elaborate on this but in truth uh we have discussion after discussion after discussion and um, each of them, uh, many of them at least, uh, would suffice on their own as a vehicle for teaching all of these things so that a person could listen to this program again and maybe another time yet and say, oh, I get it now. Wow. That's, you know, and it, once people get it, they're changed forever. It's not as if you believed a lie. It's like the wool's been pulled off from over your head and and you can see for the first time in your life and um, so yes it's good for us to talk about it but a problem that I find is that a person gets enthusiastic about this and the next thing you know in their very first words they're too advocating um, uh, to uh, study the videos of a, a, a plagiarist who, in truth, at the time they produced the video, was an advocate of interest, as were all the other people in the video, and they were emulating me, <laughs> not understandably standing diddly about this thing. And today, after being proven wrong on the things they were advocating then, now they're advocating that money can't be a debt. They're wrong, wrong, wrong again. And what happens is, so this person advocates, they go see these people, and this is what we have to understand. Solution isn't a matter of opinion, and it's not a matter of casual opinion. It's a matter of perceiving that the parts line up in a certain way which points to this fact and this fact alone of solution. Because there is only one solution of inflation and deflation and malisposition, systemic manipulation of the cost or value of money or property, and inherent irreversible multiplication of artificial indebtedness by interest. There is one solution to all three of those things which cover every fault of economy, one and one only. And then the person goes and he says, oh, money can't be a debt. You know, or we could charge this much interest, and we have to have a state bank. He liked Ellen Hodge and Brown's book. You know, so that's the problem. <clears throat> when 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 you speak, I don't know. I used to be reminded by certain uncles and whatnot that when you speak, the words should be golden. That is, shut your damn mouth until you have something to teach. You know, don't notify us of what's obvious, what we already know. We want to hear something which enriches us, you see, which takes us somewhere. And if we all followed that rule, there wouldn't be many mouths flapping about this issue. So what is all the flapping about? <clears throat> the flapping is a generator of division. And this is a huge problem because... Uh, you, you you constantly see everywhere out there. You see all these people who start a movement. Well, we've got you know two two million subscribers, and all we want to do is we want to get everybody out of Congress. Um, now you're they don't know this, but my mandate would basically you know could convict every member of Congress of treason, and get them out real quick, or straighten them up real quick, one or the other. You know, but they're not going there because why? Because they got a book on monetary reform, and it's one of, by one of my most amateurish uh, plagiarists. It's actually hand-stapled together, and it's about mathematically perfected economy, a thing they can neither explain nor author and have only plagiarized. They bought this book for $30. They've started this movement a year ago, and they haven't even begun to read the little pamphlet yet. Yet they're standing up, and they're gaining... Uh, support 
for something they don't even have. So this is this is a huge issue. And we have to the thing is, yes, stand up, but master the issues first, you know. And don't take away credit. I'm not everybody asking everybody I I, I prefer my anonymity. But the thing is, if you don't credit the real author, who's the one who can straighten all of us out on all of these things, you're inherently departing from the only truth that can save us, if and, if and only if, of course, there is, in fact, one solution and one solution only, which is something which has never been disproven and has been proven by regular conventions for, you know, for decades. So um, it's not good. In fact, you know, I spent probably two hours this afternoon attempting to contact a person on behalf of some other people who are very concerned that this person who is gaining a lot of attention uh, needs seriously straightened out on some blatant faults. They're advocating that money can't be a debt. You see, and that's destructive. That means that, you know, I've got to redo my work and redo my work and redo my work. And for for every four people who who finally understand, they've generated 40,000 casual opinions that something else is a solution when, in fact, it's not. Who's going to prevail? You see, so this is this is extremely destructive. So I. I would prefer that uh, people gravitate to uh, the fact of singular solution, read it from its source, hear it from its source, and um, in truth, uh, although proliferation is important, I don't see that we'll accomplish much in the next you know few weeks before. Uh, we get this new site online, which will be perfecteconomy.org. Um, and, and this site um, is a complete treatment of the issue. Uh, one article that explains everything for the layperson, uh, a worldwide mandate for mathematically perfected economy, an absolute consensual representation, uh, which will make... Thomas Jefferson, envious of this expression of a proof of singular solution in a constitutional amendment for every country of the world. Um, so this mandate is is what I see as the only um, course to solution. Um, and uh, basically a person will sign it. Um, uh, it establishes principles of uh, a sovereign individual and their right to claim, to declare, and to exist only under, and to even prosecute offenses against them for uh, imposition of anything else. to live under mathematically perfected economy and absolute consensual representation. And although a, a regular person might imagine this couldn't possibly have the teeth that it does have, um, it, uh, I believe I can rightly claim without explanation um, that it has uh, perhaps uh, uh, the most devastating teeth that any law, petition, or mandate ever had. Um, it's a um, it's a license and uh, a means um, for each one a person to protect themselves from uh, the injustices against us. In other words, a family going into foreclosure. Um, signs a mandate, um, submits uh, uh, documents to their sheriff, district attorney, county court, court, insists not even on paying any registration fees for these things, um, has their friends witness them, keeps these records themselves, and... um, 
resolves uh, their mortgage by uh, creating mathematically perfected economy themselves as pertains to their self. Simply by um, issuing and having witnessed their delivery of an uh, alike irredeemable promise to pay to the purported banking system, which is not to pay their debts, uh, but is to fill the artificial obligation in a like manner um, so that, if necessary, which I don't expect ever to be the case, they may challenge the purported lawful authority of the purported banking system and the constitutionality of the currency on these arguments of inevitable failure and singular solution. Um, and there they get to sit, uh, not having to pay any further on their mortgage or against their taxes. And believe me, you know, if people do this, if they have the gonads to, to do this, um, and if they don't, well, they can bend over and kiss their hindquarters goodbye. Um, but if they have the, the wherewithal and uh, uh, commitment to uh, justice to sign a few pieces of paper and attempt to exercise them as their duly lawful rights, um, then uh, the way is paved and this mandate uh, will seal the deal here. Um, so that's all that I see transpiring. I mean, um, when this site goes live, um, if it doesn't go viral, if people don't visit it, uh, you know, in just incredibly prolific numbers, uh, it will not amaze me, but uh, I will know then that these people don't have a chance. Uh, we have to understand these things. That's the first thing. If we do understand them, then uh, we, we uh, should be compelled to act upon them. Um, otherwise, I mean, what else can you do? Commit suicide? Um, so, uh, and that's it pretty much in a, in a nutshell, as much as you can make it a nutshell. Uh, they have to understand and they have to realize that there's no hope, but that they act. And so if, if they do act, um, this mandate, uh, which is a, you know, very substantial, very well-toothed, document um, is the means and instrument of uh, not just a monetary revolution across the world, but an establishment of, 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 of not just monetary solution, but a political solution which is necessary to rectify um, just about the vast majority of the of the wrongs in the world, which will never be rectified under the the current um, powers that be because of their commitments to this financial system. I mean, uh, I can't tell you how many um, officers of government in how many countries for how many years have had mathematically perfected economy carefully explained to them and they turn and they run. So um, uh, it rests on the people now. And we have, we have no hope but ourselves. And our only power is the degree to which we understand these affairs and that the facts themselves point solely to a singular solution, which in fact was authored over 40 years ago and um, which in fact projected this failure uh, and which in fact proves its own fact of singular solution for to any reasonable person's complete satisfaction. Well, I think that's absolutely amazing to be honest Mike. I think uh, from my own research and I'm sure uh, plenty of our other contacts as well, uh, you know, I personally have found many different um, potential ways of uh, dealing with banks 
um, you know, you send them certain verification letters and this, that, and the other. But many of them, I feel, don't have um, the necessary teeth to go with them. And, and many of them, unless you know what it is that you have just mailed to the banks, uh, you are going to find yourselves in big, big trouble. Oh, yeah. Um, because, you know, if you don't understand it, and they do, they're going to run rings around you. Uh, and that's one of the, I think, one of the big problems that I found with a lot of the, um, the possible but remedies here, that are out a, there. Here's another issue, though, and that is that, number one, uh, the banking system um, is the one entity which the last thing, not only that they would ever want, but that they can ever afford to happen, is for the rectitude of this obfuscation of the currency to be challenged in court. Now, uh, I really can't share uh, the proving grounds uh, for this thesis of that we would prevail by challenging it in court without ever having to go to court. But I'll pay you a thousand dollars if you read this mandate and you think that um, not not that any judge, but that any good judge would ever even hear the matter in his co court without deciding for the plaintiff, the person. I wager they will not. Uh, the reasons are simple. The court can't disprove the fact of inevitable failure. The court can't disprove the fact of singular solution. And the teeth that this document gives the people are the pe very power to prosecute that court for treason, and the courts deciding against them is the only evidence that's necessary to do so. <laughs> Catch-22 for them. Um, absolutely. I, I mean, that's absolutely brilliant. Well put. I mean, that's exactly what it is. It's a conundrum, as we say. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, there is no way out. You go to court, you're proven wrong. You fail to go to court, you allow the plaintiff to prevail. So we go to court, we challenge our mortgage with a piece of paper, the best, <laughs> the very best day of your, your life was the day that you went to court and submitted the judge your affidavit and you submitted the sheriff your affidavit and you submitted the, the district attorney your affidavit. The sheriff is compelled to notify the court and the district attorney that he's going to uphold your 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 your, your appeal your mandate the district attorney is, is 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 notified that he's compelled to prosecute the sheriff and the court if they do not do so <laughs> And the court is compelled to prosecute the sheriff and the district attorney if they fail to do so. Much more, moreover, the court is compelled to uphold your appeal, and he can't he, unless the unless a judge can can disprove this this uh, you know thesis of inevitable failure, uh, this obfuscation of the currency and uh, uh, singular solution. Um, the court is cooked, you know. There's no way for them to do this. Now you go down to the, the your mortgage company and you um, you submit your affidavit to them and you write out on a little piece of paper with great joy and your friends taking pictures of you and recording the whole discussion and you write down how much did you say I owe to pay off this debt and they're compelled to give you an answer and if they don't give you an answer hell with them. Right, we'll pay to the bearer on demand infinity. And sign your name to it and give it to them and have your friends take your picture. You've just paid your mortgage off and you demand to go to court to challenge the nature of the currency and you provide this other document. It might just be a URL to this site. And these are our arguments which we are going to submit in court. And if this person 
or any agent of the bank or even the sheriff attempts to prevent you from succeeding in this, they likewise are prosecuted for, for treason. So this whole thing is about ending the destruction of our country and the whole cycle of, uh, of it has uh, the strongest stop put at every juncture that exists. And if we're not willing to assert this, you know, shame on us, you know, because why should you pay a bank that only issues evidence of your promissory obligation to retire principal from circulation? Why should you be paying them five houses for your house and to lose your house after you miss the last three payments before you pay, pay the damn thing off? And they will take your house from you then, you know. So um, this is it. You know, either we understand what's wrong here and we stand up for it, or we suffer the fate of the wimps that we are. Yeah, we're all put into a, a mindset of fear, I must admit. And that's very, very difficult um, for, for many people to bypass, especially when they've, they, you know, they, they look at the possessions as being important to them. You know, the house they've worked most of their life, uh, to, you know, to get, uh, and they could potentially lose it by going up against the, the system. Sure, but so, what, what does the sheriff do? You know, he's about mm -hmm. to lose his house. They may have to lay off the sheriff because they're not collecting the taxes, and so some of the deputies might have to be laid off. You know, he's in the same boat that we are. So what does he do? He notifies uh, not just the bank that he's going to stand by these people, that they're right. He's read this thing. He's studied it. It's absolutely right. He can't find a fault in it. And so he calls up the... Um, Oh, the people that come and, you know, lock your house up, change the locks and all that, you know, the repossessors. And uh, he says, huh, you're not going to do that in my town. I find any changed locks, we will personally escort the people into their house, however it takes. You are not evicting anyone from a house. We are trying this uh, issue in our town, and you have no legal authority to do this. And if I find you in our town, attempting to do any such thing, you will go straight to jail and you will not be let out until this thing is over. Mm, I, actually, the, 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 I know you've mentioned that this is, it is available in or would be available in most countries of the world. Um, okay. You mentioned... Yeah, no, you're mentioning sheriffs. I have, I'm, I should look around for Canada because I've never, never really found. Um, well, you might a have a different, different of it. police uh, force, but you would implement it the same way. Yeah, I know the the descriptions that we've always come across that the the sheriff is different than the standard police. Um, certainly in. Um, in England where I came from and in Ireland where it's discussed quite a lot at the moment um, there is a sheriff and they are separate to the the police in the US there's a sheriff's department which is different from the say the state police and and other city police forces so they're different again but I don't know well, I have to figure it out for Canada statement at the top of the mandate which um, explains that uh, the any differences for the local country are to be implemented in like manner, meaning that, well, if you don't have any police, the best you can do is go yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. But, uh, so how much understanding do, do, do people need of this then, Mike? Because obviously well, the, the little... we started off the conversation with trying to understand mathematically perfected economy and, and the history of the banking and how we got into the, the mess that we're in at the moment. Well, um, the but if this takes of off... currency is, is the cause of failure. Mm -hmm. And uh, then that's all you need to understand. When, when a person gets that, they, the lights go on. And they start seeing that all these, these things about rescuing the banking system are downstream consequences. The reason the peripheral banks are failing is because of the multiplication of artificial indebtedness on the people, making it impossible for them to continue servicing their debts. As industry fails and they lose jobs and the whole thing starts caving in, and the peripheral banks um, go down. But that isn't because the banking system itself is failing. The central bank is the real banking system. The peripheral banks are just interface between us, and they're part of the facade <clears throat> that 
We have to borrow money from a bank because you have to borrow it from the peripheral bank. The peripheral bank indeed complies and borrows it from the central bank, you see, but the central bank just creates it. And so that's the problem. We, in truth, are creating money through our promissory obligations ourselves. The difference is mathematically perfected economy eradicates the bankers. It eliminates the bankers from the equation. So all mathematically perfected economy is, is, is eradication of interest and obligatory schedule of payment at the rate of consumption or depreciation of the related property. That's mathematically perfected economy right there. What's that mean? $100,000 home with a 100-year lifespan, linear rate of depreciation, and, and in, in our transformation, we decide what rates of depreciation we want to apply to whatever given classes of property. All I provide is a default rate of depreciation to apply from the start. And so, and the, all that can be changed. It's simply matters of accounting. You could say, oh, well, we want to apply this to these things. Well, you know, the thing is to get this thing done in no time at all. Um, so basically, people are doing in this thing what I have advocated to do, uh, which I explained, I explained to the Reagan administration in my original paper on this, how to convert any lie of economy, the present system, in a mathematically perfected economy in a day. And basically, you arrest the failure by, um, by seizing all payments on all debts arising from the obfuscation of the currency. So that means no payments on any debts to banks. Stop. It's like, uh, as Ann Minch said uh, in a discussion I had with her about this, a timeout. You know, she was just, you know, putting names to things as we went along. She followed along very, very, very well. Understood it the first time through, you know. So she says, so this is a timeout. Yeah, it's just a timeout. It's it's not saying we're not going to pay our debts, which are, are were originally promissory obligations, which by nature are, are only obligations to pay principal out of circulation. And under mathematically perfected economy, which solves inflation and deflation, therefore are subject to only an ob obligatory schedule of payment because it's the obligatory schedule of payment which pays the money out of circulation, retires it from circulation, so that the remaining circulation is always equal to the remaining value of all represented property. Okay, so, just a quick one there, Mike, before you... Excuse me. Continue. Um, what about the um, what about the couple that have been in their house, you know, twenty years, and they've in essence already paid their mortgage, and then some. Um, you know, they the banks actually owe them money mm -hmm. because they've already paid for their house twice by well, now. That's um, that the way that you're going about it is the right question to pop in your head. And the uh, initial tendency would be to go at it that way. Okay, so they paid how much more? How much does the banking system owe to them? Those banks don't even exist. They were bought by these people over here, then by these over there, <clears throat> then these over here. They don't even have the original documents or the records. How do we determine all these things? It's a goddamn mess. Can't do it. Well, that's... Um, that's an initial assumption you can come to. But here's the brilliance of it, if I would. Um, you don't have to do it that way. You don't have to figure it that way at all. As I said, what would you be doing in your life if uh, you lived under mathematically perfected economy and we decide, oh, let's get rid of this socialism, no so social security. We are instead, um, we are going to... Uh, uh, force people um, so that they don't become a burden on society during their working life instead of taxing them, taking this money, pretending we're investing it in places, losing our butts, um, charging them more, not having enough to sustain them that we promised because we, we gutted this system uh, for all these other different things, um, which were all violations of our original promises and the original premises of, of doing this. Instead of doing that, why not allow us to keep our own money, preserve the value of money by mathematically perfected economy, and allow us to spend it 
so as sustains our uh, standard of living through the rest of our life. Instead of taking from us and, and, and stealing, you know, uh, why not leave it to us, the people to whom it belongs and who will spend it and leave it to our own discretion how to do that subject to um, some rules we decide to adopt in common so that um, we account for uh, uh, an equal standard of living in our retired years. Now, in truth, we might want to work to, uh, you know, uh, further into our lives because that's what life's about, you know. Um, But I'm just giving an example of how we might decide to do, um, um, you know, something differently. And I'm going to answer your question with my example then. So instead of saying, oh, well, um, this couple lost so much, you know, uh, because they paid for this house, you know, and they refinanced it three times because the system was going down. We could see that actually in 1975, you know, and they went through some hard times for 13 years. And, you know, they refinanced their house seven times, you know, whatever, you know. So we got this complicated situation, you know, to unravel before penny by penny we eventually come up with an idea which is an application of a principle that has to apply to all of us, which determines for that couple, for whatever they went through, is exactly how much money the banking system owes them. How with all that? Let's start over again. Let's realize that, likewise, there's another person who couldn't even become a couple because they had a turn of bad events in their life. And they were even they were even prevented from becoming a property owner because of the magnitude of these events, although they're indeed a very talented, skillful, and productive person. They have been robbed like you can't believe just by the course of their life. But because they were never paying against the house and or houses and never lost, do we not reward them likewise? I say hell with it. Why do all that? Why go through all that and bickering and being so small that we 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 bitch about every little iota of, of this, that, or, oh, well, I want this because I want to buy a new teacup set or whatever kind of crap is plaguing us. Instead, just figure out across the board, hey, look, we got to start over. These numbers show we can do it. Let's just say, okay, this is how much further wealth circulation should be in existence to sustain the commerce and payment for it. Let's credit the people's accounts in a general manner by a general formula, which restores to them, by dividing this up equally, the amount of savings they would have accumulated in their life to that point of the life, given that, okay, they've worked so many years or they've worked so many other years or they've worked so many further years or they retired so much. So there's a general pattern of accumulation of earnings, which would apply to a peak of, of savings at, at the beginning of retirement, which then is consumed over the remainder of lifespan. So wherever any person is in this general formula, which applies one principle to everyone, it restores to all of us what's been lost as much as can be restored so that we don't violate our principles of inflation and deflation, you see. So that's how I propose to do it, to not go at it from every, you know, uh, drawing the dust out of every nookie and cranny in the floor, and seeing whatever we can turn up to get every squeeze out of every cent out of everyone when we only have so much that we can distribute to the accounts of the people in abiding by this rule anyway. And basically, um, I see so much leeway for, um, for, for error um, not affecting anyone to any uh, really, truly substantial degree that it's one of those what-the-heck things. You know, come on, let's uh, just take the rest of it and distribute it according to the pattern of savings that we want to impose upon ourselves. And if you say, okay, well, we don't want to do that, well, 
all right, let's do a different thing. Whatever you want to decide in your country, um, all right, we'll put it all in a pinata and we'll all get baseball bats and we'll all get blindfolded and we'll all run. There'll be a bell that's ringing in the pinata and whoever swings the thing and grabs the most money, they win. Okay, fine, do it that way in your country. I don't give a damn. You know, but this is how much money needs to be in circulation to account for the whole thing and have a free for all, have a fight, or decide like civilized people on a just thing. I don't give a damn. I've been doing this for 42 years. If you want to be idiots, go ahead and be idiots. You know, but you know, the way to solve this clean and simple is to distribute it by one process to everyone. And what's it going to do? It's going to take uh, the little old lady who's been living in the same ho- home for, you know, 65 years. You know, her mortgage is going to drop from, you know, $500 a month, which might be low nowadays, to $5 a month, you know. And, uh, you know, there's her prosperity, you know, right there. You know, uh, it's it's all in the numbers. Uh, there's... Uh, a way to do this simple and clean, um, which isn't going to itself be perfect, um, but it's the best that you can do given the circumstances. I mean, for crying out loud, you know how people are. We could argue for 20 years about whose share ought to be what of what You know, we need to restore to an incredibly deflated circulation converse to what Ron Paul is constantly telling us. You know, he's constantly screaming about inflation is causing all our problems, and he, of course, can't articulate how. Well, the truth of the matter is uh, that if the circulation is less than uh, the value a remaining value of of all re- representable prop property, you have deflation. That means if you're living in a two hundred fifty thousand dollar house, there should be two hundred fifty thousand dollars in circulation. When you look around your neighborhood and you see everybody else is 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 existing in the same circumstances, and everyone ought to have two hundred fifty thousand dollars in their pocket. You know, if things are distributed, you know, evenly around uh, the people that produce these things, you know, that's that's how it would be. And what do you got? You got nothing. And you're paying everything you do have out of circulation on this multiplication of artificial indebtedness. And, uh, you know, even when you buy something at the store, how much of it is dedicated to servicing debt is is phenomenal. You know, and so the question is, what do you want to do? Bicker about, you know, how we spread this around, or or do you want to make a a quick, plain decision and say, let's go from here? You know, we benefit more by you know working, being productive, um, you know, going, uh, you know, going back, uh, going back to work, and and uh, you know, reopening our shops and 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 doing the things that we used to love to do and and couldn't even afford to do anymore, and 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 we're doing in peril for ten or twenty years because. You know, we were we were just living one step ahead of 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 the you know the the foreclosure experts. You know, um, that's the question. I mean, do you want solution? You know, mathematically perfected economy is mathematically perfected economy. Exactly how we're going to transform it is not going to be a matter of of perfection itself. It's going to be what's necessary, expedient, agreeable. You know, and if we can't agree on on what's necessary and expedient, then to hell with us. You know, I'm not here to argue about that. And that's not, you know, that's 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 just what I would do to save humanity. And if humanity said, well, wait, 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 I want I want a bigger share. (laughs) And everybody else jumps up. Oh, wait, I want a bigger share, too. (laughs) Well, you know, okay, fine. I sit down then. Go ahead. You know, Uh, we can't do things that way. We have to we have to grow up on a, a lot of fronts. And in truth, you know, mathematically perfected economy is just a, a small issue, you know, in today. But it is the most important by far because it's the only way that we're going to get all the other things done, too, until we get corrupt government out of the equation. 
uh, until we can hold government absolutely accountable, which was, which is what the whole aspects of the, the teeth of this mandate are about, uh, uh, which, uh, you know, are, are Jefferson's dream. You know, he, he meant to, to bind down government, um, and uh, this mandate uh, holds government accountable like never before. Um, uh, it, it creates a new legal entity and a, a sovereign individual. Um, that itself will create a whole new uh, state of affairs. And, you know, I'm, I'm pleased to find that I'm not the inventor of such a thing, you know, um, thanks to, you know, Vincent contacting me from, from Ireland. Um, but uh, I, I can tell you that it's, it's you know, sitting where I sit, uh, it's a, an inevitable conclusion that a person who needs to resolve all these issues or figure out how to resolve all these issues has to come to. Um, with their sovereign rights as an individual are, are indispensable. And um, uh, they're the only thing that prevents uh, a wrong majority um, or even a wrong minority from prevailing over majority. And after all, I mean, here in the United States, I mean, how many people have faith in government? Um, you know, I'm, I was just informed a few days back that uh, people in Iceland have the just voted to have the lowest uh, faith in government ever. Ten, less than ten percent, I think, in par, of faith in par, parliament, you know, and uh, yet uh, the teeth of this mandate are such that if I was in power right now, unless I was uh, um, inept as uh, some of these plagiarists are, so that I didn't realize that I was intervening on issues that uh, I had no business. Uh, poking my nose into, um, government uh, will exist in fear of the people at all times. There will be nothing that any person in a position of authority will dare do ever afterward, but in the most highly conscientious and accountable manner. They dare not subject it uh, to public assent, uh, uh, or fail to do so, rather, because um, the, the penalties are extreme for every case of, of pursuing any course of administration to our affairs, which ultimately cannot or does not satisfy every will of the people. And this this applies to myself in um, establishing uh, this idea of, of mathematically perfected economy in the mandate. Um, I leave it to the people um, to decide, for instance, um, the rates of depreciation they want to apply. Mathematically perfected economy is the principle that you have to uh, abide by to, to do it right. But I, I say, oh, well... You know, you want to uh, to apply. You think that this your perception is that this va value for this class of objects depreciates in a different kind of a manner. Um, fine, okay. That's exactly what you're supposed to do in mathematically perfected economy. You're supposed to say, hey, well, there's a there's a defect in this, which is sufficient enough to raise, and that is that. Well, when I buy a brand new car, that car can never be sold, but for a thousand dollars less for me driving it 15 feet. Therefore, the rate of depreciation has to drop thousand dollars in the first 15 feet. That's exactly how you need to describe your um, your concern and implement it as a uh, applicable means of depreciation under mathematically perfected economy. We could have millions of these things. I think that's personally that it's ridiculous because uh, I came up with a, uh, a method of determining uh, descaled uh, depreciation is what I call it, uh, which no one had any complaint about. 
And so after submitting that to a poll for a year or more, uh, I actually decided to make it the default method of determining depreciation in the mandate. Why? Not for it to prevail, but for, you, for it to prevail so that we were doing something and we could have mathematically perfected economy immediately until people get through all their bickering and decide they want to have 1,001 exactly different means, methods of determining depreciation and applying that to uh, whatever other means they want to use to determine, you know, relative lifespan. And, you know, the sense of bickering about all that is, you know, practically senseless. So I think it's I think it's humanity's uh, opportunity to grow up <laughs> um, because yeah. there's so many uh, there are so many of us that I believe are, you know are um, uh, educated responsible um, you know believe themselves sovereign believe themselves um, moral um, you know and just it just you know you get on with your fellow humans you want to do for other humans but Whereas my god a, can you don't. imagine what it would be like if all of us driving to our our job which was restored to us tomorrow morning you know and we go through say 2 weeks everybody's back to work our mortgage is so paid in advance we don't even have a house payment we're passing each other on the road and we're looking at each other differently than we ever did before because by God now we can prosper can you imagine that? I mean, I can imagine it, and I would very much like to see it in my lifetime. Yes, um, and I, I, I see because I live in the country, and I know you do too, Mike. So you know, your neighbours, uh, you you prosper in a slightly different way. You look at each other in a different way, the same as I look on my neighbours, and you know, and the townsfolk nearby. Um, but to go into a city, it's a completely different thing. So to see what you are suggesting in a city uh, would be the most amazing thing that you know we could ever think of as, well, as sure. humanity itself. Coffee shop, sitting in, standing in line at the at delicatessen, going to the restaurant. The restaurants are are full. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, every restaurant in this clo town is closed. You know, you yeah. can't even buy a breakfast here. You know, they've been for sale for up to over 10 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and I can remember, you know, the uh, first time I had sushi in San Francisco many years ago. And, I mean, geez, oh, man, the, the people were lined up in the street, out the door, <laughs> down the street. They had to wait hours to get a table. There were that many people eating. You go to these places now, and there's, there's nobody in there, you know. It's yeah, like, nobody can afford it anymore. Right. I mean, I was just telling Vincent a while ago, I mean, where I live is up in the mountains. It's a, you know, a little town, a couple hundred people in the summer, 100 people winter out here. It's over, you know, 4,000 foot elevation. We've got a couple of feet of snow on the ground right now. But this is a, you know, a snowmobile playland. There's no way that this first snow, just even a couple years ago, there was no way that the first snow could fall and you wouldn't hear all over town outsiders bringing in their racing snowmobiles and driving up and down our streets and making a pain in the ass of themselves. But you heard constant revving snowmobiles and everything. We've had snow on the ground for a couple of weeks here, and I haven't heard the first snowmobile yet. This was impossible to happen just two years ago. Impossible to have the lack of snowmobiles that we have had, you know, this winter, in last winter, <laughs> but you know, it's 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 amazing if you keep track of it. I mean, there are more empty buildings, empty businesses in 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 town, the nearest you know towns to us than than ever before. I mean, I keep regular count on these things. But even in the last six months, they've gone up at a faster rate than ever before. In six months, it's noticeably worse by a substantial amount. 
than the than the six months before. And we're talking a a pretty nice looking you know town and all you know. So um, it's up to yeah, us. I, I mean, we can we can yeah. we can go to the court and drop our pieces of paper and be too scared to appear ourselves, or we can sit in our homes and hope uh, the winter never comes again. You know, but uh, you know it will. And uh, the only way any good thing ever happened in history were, was that people were sufficiently willing to stand for it. And I think they they are certainly getting to that point now. If uh, they're not there already, there's a good number of them are very definitely getting to that point um, because it's, uh, you know, even if you're a sheeple, as that term goes, yeah. uh, you have to be, I mean, the system must be serving you so well at this moment in time um, that you cannot see what's going on around you. Yeah, um, so you work at McDonald's and, and you know, some young gal who's pretty sharp, who's heard one of these shows, uh, you know, they've got the the 16-year-old kid in there, and he's complaining that he can't move out from home, and his house is miserable, his parents are abusive, they want to get rid of him, and, you know, and he can't afford it and everything. And she says, well, how much do you make a, a week? And he says, 400 bucks. And she says, you know, you could buy a brand new house under mathematically perfected economy and only cost you 83 bucks a month. Maybe he'll yeah, that- visit a web, web page. Yeah, oh, for sure. Actually, I have, I think, two questions that have, have kind of come into my mind during the uh, the final parts of this discussion, uh, and it was relating to the house itself, and it, you just reminded me bringing that up again. First question actually has more to do with savings. Um, it, the the whole point behind the mathematically perfected economy basically is that it's the one to one to one ratio mm-hmm. that you know you create you um, depreciate and you extinguish now if there are savings involved then the depreciation um, period obviously becomes extended how does people having savings um, affect this ratio and the ability for the stability of mathematic, mathematically perfected economy to maintain itself that way without becoming inflationary in this case because of all the savings that are not doing anything. Well, and the other thing, sorry, just a quick one, was you have bought the house, you obviously, you've gone through the, um, the $100,000 over 100 years and so on. Uh, what actually happens when you sell the house? How is it all worked out? So, sorry, just two quick oh, questions. Okay, oh. well, the, the, the second question is, is really simple. Um, you see, you're not assuming truly indebtedness. You're actually committing to pay for the thing as you consume of it. So um, the part that you're paying for is consumed. So you're not building up any equity if you do that. Now, whatever you save is equity. Um, so what happens in the case of, of um, say, you have savings and you just decided that you wanted to switch $100,000 of savings out of your account to fully pay off the $100,000 house. Well, you can do that. But what you have then at the moment before you begin to consume the house is $100,000 of equity in it. Now, as the payments are actually taken out of that against the house, um, you're paying for the consumed part, which is how much the equity decreases. So that's the accounting of it. What does this mean? This means that if you're making the minimal payments of the house, which is all you're obligated to do, um, that at any time, say I've, on a linear scale of depreciation, I paid off, I've consumed half the... I, 
the lifespan of the house, 50 years of its 100-year lifespan. And we're right at year 50, 50 years in this lifespan of the house at that point. That means I paid $50,000 of it off, and I still owe. I will have to pay $50,000 as each period of consumption comes up. Okay? Well, when you sell the house, being as you haven't built up any equity in it, someone else just takes over the remaining debt, as you would in a house today that you didn't have any equity in. The difference is that interest isn't counting against your accumulation of equity, so equity is 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 inexpensive as it can be under mathematically perfected economy. Now, your first question, I'm not sure I understand that, but I can, can answer to parts of it clearly, and that is, the principle that we're hearing, adhering to prevents inflation and deflation. So you can't raise a situation where there is inflation or deflation so long as we abide by the principle, which is to pay principal, and that's principal with a P-A-L instead of a P-L-E at the end of it, um, to pay principal at the uh, uh, rate of consumption or depreciation. This is what maintains our perpetual one-to-one-to-one -one -one relationship between remaining circulation, remaining value of represented property, and remaining obligation, which is the very thing that makes the whole thing work. Without the obligation, you have nothing. What do people pay for houses? Well, let's decide how much they pay. You know, No, I want to pay for my consumption of other people's property with an equal measure of my own property. That's what we're saying in Mathematically Perfected Economy. I'm not leaving it up to Alan Hodge and Brown to decide today what I'm going to pay and tomorrow to change your mind again because that didn't work out so good. No, no, I'm paying a house for a house and that's that. And I'm deciding what I'm paying for the house, you know, so in terms of dollars which is an expression of my wealth. So there isn't a situation that uh, uh, inflation or deflation um, actually occurs relative at least to the generic um, life cycle that we determine for the property and the generic method of determining depreciation, which by intention is meant to reflect our perception of how the property depreciates. So um, I don't know what you were asking about in the first question there. Okay, well, I think we'll try and better explain it then. Um, if we are, we are working, we are earning wages, that money, that cash that we earn comes from somewhere. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's part of the creation part of it. It was created somehow at some point uh, further up the ladder, where my boss or my client, uh, whoever that might be, came into possession of this money, I then keep it and save it. So I'm not, I'm not spending it out of the system at that point. I am just hoarding it. So it's not being destroyed, but it's not doing anything. It's still in the system, mm -hmm. uh, and I am, I am saving it. So it's giving me some value that shouldn't change because there shouldn't be inflation and deflation. So, you know, my $1,000 savings, if that's all I'm going to put away now, should still be worth $1,000 in 50 years. Right. But, um, you know, what I'm thinking is how does the how does savings uh, how does affect... How it affect the whole circulation? Exactly, yeah. Of yeah. It and its ability to convey... Um, to convey uh, 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 commerce and production. Um, yeah. Well, uh, here's the thing. Um, as I mentioned a while back, a few issues back, uh, here in this discussion, um, you know, we may decide that what we want to do instead of a, a social security program is that we might want to... Um, uh, uh, require 
uh, uh, people to save so much. So that money would automatically be put aside. Now, I think probably you wouldn't find that many people that would save oh, a tremendous amount more than that, say 90% of their earnings, you know, um, under mathematically perfected economy. But it doesn't matter if you do. Um, in other words, what's going on there? In respect to yourself, if you were saving 90% of your earnings, just sucking them away in savings, what does that mean? 10% are spent um, on whatever they are, and there's the money to do that. It's sustaining that amount of economic activity. So it's the leeway, in effect, to save whatever we care to save or to not save at all, whatever the case may be, and to have the monetization available to convey all of the commerce that we desire to convey. That it, whatever you're, you're spending is the amount of, of, we could call it monetary activity, but it is actually, I think, better described as industrial production and consumption. Um, and whatever you're spending is sufficient to uh, of your of your of your savings or earnings rather is um, sufficient to sustain that much production and, and consumption. So um, if uh, somewhere um, someone feels uh, a deficiency, um, which is um, the compelling factor to borrow further um, under the present obfuscated system. Um, uh, of course, so long as they're credit worthy to service the obligation that they engage in, um, they're free to issue a promissory obligation to the uh, common monetary foundry, which processes their payments, um, enforces payments, um, uh, uh, and uh, that monetization um, ability to monetize always suffices to create enough monetization to sustain production and consumption related to whatever the property is and to, uh, to, to finish that picture out the other thing that we have to allow under mathematically perfected economy, and of course it's part of this mandate, um, <clears throat> which actually is a, a proof in law of a singular uh, mathematically perfected economy. Um, uh, the other thing that we have to accommodate is um, a monetization of equity. So suppose um, we consider that you effectively paid off your house uh, at a faster rate that you consumed of it and thus have some equity. Well, um, that equity must be accounted for in the system, that is, by the common monetary foundry, as wealth possessed by you, which is um, immediately monetizable. Now, so just as you can borrow on equity on your home uh, under this system, you could effectively issue a promissory obligation to pay off the unconsumed equity on your home that you've already paid off. In other words, to repay it off after, you know, withdrawing it, you know, in the interim. So uh, it really works the same way, except that we have an obligatory schedule of payment, which is what eliminates inflation and deflation. And we have the er eradication of, of, of interest. That's all. That's all mathematically perfected economy really is. It's a, it's a monetary equivalent of barter. It's as if you went to that market with your three goats and your 20 chickens and you wanted that, that herding dog. You know, you just dreamed that herding dog was, you know, the dog you wanted. And you get to the market and sure enough, he's there. And God says, hey, here's a evidence that you possess these three goats and 20 chickens uh, 
which is the equivalent value that that man over there wants for his dogs. Just go over there and trade him for it. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm seeing it. I'm definitely seeing it. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it's 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 really it's simple. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. it's it's like playing Monopoly when you're kids, except, you know, there's no interest. There's no this 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 unearned profit thing. That's not what it's about anymore. Because, um, that's actually the antithesis of 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 true free enterprise. It's to become a parasite. To, mm -hmm. to true free enterprise, and it's it's truly what we all want. When when in truth you love your work, and you can prosper at it, um, you you're compelled to do a lot of it. I love writing software. You know, I it's great. You know, it's just the kind of thing. I mean, it's one thing that I I like to do, but. Um, you know, I've spent so many hours and uh, that, you know, I can never be compensated for largely because of risks that had to be taken under this obfuscation of the currency. I mean, if you take any person's life and you go through it step by step of how different it would have been if we would have resolved these monetary issues and we could all prosper to the degrees that we are the extents that we are capable of uh, receiving just reward for it what's going to happen for instance in this 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 example this couple we were discussing where you know we're freeing twenty five hundred dollars of their five thousand dollar a month uh, joint salaries we're freeing that much up you know just in regard to their mortgage well, shoot, you know, there's a kid down the road. Uh, he's a real good kid. And, uh, you know, we used to have him mow our lawns for us, but we can't afford it anymore. Guess what? We're going to have him, you know, we're going to, we're going to have him weed the yard, trim the bushes, <laughs> rake the leaves yeah. on a regular basis, you know. Hey, how much would you would you want to wash my car? I I got a I got a bunch of stuff to do Saturday morning, and Saturday afternoon I got to take off. Would you come over and wash the car Saturday morning? You know, I mean, mm -hmm. life would be a completely different thing. Instead of, you know, uh, you know, we'd all have somebody with a backhoe uh, clear out our the draw, you know, the snow out of our driveways. Things would just be different. Mm -hmm. no, it's like, how, how do you think it would affect the, um, the the sort of the the low end jobs, the dirty jobs, let's say, that people don't necessarily want to do? Well, um, is it going to have an effect on those? Do you think? Well, you've probably done a few of those jobs too. I know I have. Uh, mm -hmm. The you know, I mean, the the way I see it is, um, I've seen men who were forced. I used to call them, uh, this was when I was very young even, I called them uh, uh, wage slaves. Um, uh, and not in a derogatory manner, in a, in a, in a, in a sympathetic manner. Um, uh, but I saw men like who worked in policing shops who were so filthy and breathed so much, you know, broken fiber from polishing machines and and all that they they never, their lungs they, they they couldn't reach an advanced age, you know their 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 lungs ears, every pore in their skin was just filled with uh, pulverized. Uh, polishing compound and I mean a thing that you would never want to do well if if you evaluate this and I mean I've spent a substantial part of my life you know designing machines to do things and um, shops and endeavors that I myself had and you know including very sophisticated machinery and it's an it's an art that um, I believe was far more common in our country and probably the world, of course, um, in earlier times over the last couple of hundred years. Um, you know, the age of uh, great uh, like geniuses like John M. Browning is is long, 
long gone. Um, and uh, so I see, uh, I see in the situation of this polishing shop, for instance, um, which was part of a factory, actually, um, those guys had no business doing that. You know, but we're going to have a lot more industry um, if we want to, and create all the jobs that we want, and we can sustain them. You know, only under mathematically perfected economy. So these guys would have other alternatives. Um, I would say either the employer would be forced to pay them um, so commensurably that, despite the uh, you know the um, hazards. Of the of 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 the job that someone would be willing to do it, or they would automate it. And we're in an age where automation is is uh, you know a, a ready um, capability. So um, I would expect uh, rather than than us um, bemoaning loss uh, of of such jobs or 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 factories, saying, well, we can't. Produce cars anymore because we we can't any we can't we can't find anybody to look out the inside of a, 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 a an exhaust pipe. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't expect that to happen. I expect instead, uh, you know, uh, build a machine that makes that weld. Um, you know, nobody has to breathe any fumes, and and uh, and uh, it's done faster and 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 more efficiently. Um, uh, that's what I see happening. Uh, um, you know, and in truth, in producing things, which I have quite a bit of experience with, um, uh, by developing your own methods of production, your own engineering of products, and and refining all of your methods, which is, excuse me, um, that's. That's a lot of fun. That's what life's about. That's there's as much reward in coming up with a machine that did something that nobody else ever devised to do, as there is from 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 being rewarded by sales of a product that nobody else could turn out because they couldn't devise that machine. Those are two things which are phenomenal rewards. Um, to a life which make us feel uh, fulfilled as people. And so what I see is a return of the arts of, of, of development, of innovation. I mean, uh, even in my own lifetime, my own generation was far more innovative uh, at certain years, and it wasn't just because, you know, at 16 we were so curious and ambitious it was because you know we could afford to do things now i mean if if you wanted to go fly fishing you could you could order a you know a, a, a kit to build your first fly rod and a book on how to fly cast and you know a fly reel and lines and fly tying kit and and it cost next to nothing you'd order it in mail order catalogs and it's, it would be you know ex extremely affordable you know you could take care of the neighbor's dog for a weekend and you could buy you could get into fly fishing and literally and now you know uh, quality fly rod could cost you know several hundred dollars you know and wages certainly haven't increased proportionately to that so i see you know um i see uh, uh a, a restoration of, of of innovation uh particularly because uh the the ability to monetize uh, further produ production and innovation is indispensable to that, and you 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 absolutely can't have that in this day and age under the you know the the terminal conditions of the final days of this lie we call economy. Um, so I see more or less uh, an immediate renaissance. Uh, I I know. Uh, I know if I was out there, you know, uh, not totally consumed in um, guiding this idea into fruition uh, for so damn long, it's ridiculous. 
Um, uh, if I was, if I could return to being a young man when I started all this, and I can relate to any period in my life, you know, um, I'm a world-renowned cane fly rod maker. You know, um, if I could resume things that I was did at any time in my life under the conditions that would prevail out of a transformation to mathematically perfected economy. I can't tell you how many times better off I would have been, you know. Not that things weren't, you know, great at the time, especially compared to what's possible now. But if I look around myself at young people today, I'm, you know, I pity them, I think. My God, you know, we, we've ruined the world for you. Mm, I agree with you there, Mike, I really do. Yeah. I, I, I have great sympathy for my sons. Um, many of them who, well, two of them now are actually, uh, one has a family, one's just starting a family, and uh, I have no idea how they're going to gonna get through it unless something drastically changes. Well, I mean, it's, how, it's how not, to think, not too late to save them. No, oh, no, no, and, and I'm doing as much as I possibly can to um, educate them in, in in making the best that they can of the system, uh, and if they're able to change the system. Now, I don't think they're in a position, except maybe my youngest son, and he's very gung-ho about changing it, I must admit. Good but for him. I mean, the other thing is, how do you think it's going to affect society anyway? Because we've gotten to the point, I believe, where it's a, it's a criminal society um, in many, many ways. And do you think that, um, you know, if we have our financial freedom, let's say, um, are we going to be... Are we going to go back to what I think we are is inherently good human beings or is there just a certain percentage, a certain number of humans that are inherently bad? Uh, well, we're going to have to suffer from them anyway. I, um, you know, I have the same question myself and in truth, only they can answer it. But, you know, uh, my observation is this, and um, I don't really know how inherently good we are. I have my questions about that. But uh, uh, I also observe that uh, as this process escalates this artificial indebtedness, that it's driven uh, more of these evil schemes against the re rest of us. I'm sure you're pretty familiar with the Enron scandal. But oh, yeah, yeah. these people who were involved in that, you know, even speak today of it with a twinkle in their eyes if, you know, there was no reason for it not to work. And in, in, in truth yet, as you watch them, you see in their eyes that they're lying to you, they're lying to the camera, they're lying to themselves, and they know it. Now, you know, they wanted to wear nice clothes, they wanted to be looked up to, they were vain, you know, and they let vanity motivate them to do things that they know today are wrong, even though they're having still maybe a difficult time of coming to grips with it. But I see this. Um, I see this. I've, I've, I've always been, um, I hate to describe it as an alternate lifestyle person, but uh, owing to, you know, difficult things that uh, I had to negotiate from a young age, um, I developed um, a different set of values. And I think there's strength in people that, uh, unfortunately, um, few of us get to experience and appreciate in ourselves. 
Um, I mean, uh, in truth, this world is such a um, a uh, a place that's fraught with uh, a pitfall, uh, much of which we ourselves add to because we are either afraid or we are not of the Constitution to make things right, that in truth we have become our own worst enemies. Um, What we have become is what allows these politicians to deny us representation for a hundred years, to impose a central banking system on us. I mean, for crying out loud, we've never even asked for the qualifying arguments for this thing yet. And we're talking about auditing it when we know that's going to be a pack of lies too. And, and, And it only can discover what we ought to know because we're the accounting of it. We're the victims. We're taking assessment of it every day. We know that we're paying five houses for a house, and the and the price of the house was multiplied three times what it should have been in the first place. And who's getting all this? You know, where's it all going? Well, I know because I'm paying it. Okay, and 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 I also know what the motives are because the only powers of the thing are exploitation. You know, we know all these things. We don't have to find them out. They're obvious in everything around us, you know. So what are we? I'm saying that we have screwed ourselves up so much that we probably will surprise ourselves when we lift off the hood and can see again and realize Holy crap, you know, none of this was necessary. We spent the majority of our own lives for naught because that's all the better we were. Am I afraid to go to the court and give them this little piece of paper? I should laugh in there. I should go in there and do it with joy. I should go down to the sheriffs and... Have a good time with him, explaining, hey, you guys aren't going to believe what we the people are going to do. How many of us have been in here yet? What do you mean? Oh, I'm the first one? Well, let me tell you about this. You know, we should take this on with joy because what are we doing but but freeing ourselves with the, the least effort? And, I mean, what just government in the world would stand against us? I mean, you you, you have anybody stand in the way of this, write down their name. Yeah, it, mind you, it's unfortunately it's the um, it's the unjust governments that we know damn well they're going to stand against it because it's in their interest to oppose it because they're the ones that are getting all the benefit well, along with all of these. They can do when we stop paying taxes when we when mm-hmm. we take them to court uh, when we quit paying on our, our 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 mortgages and the sheriff says, "Yep." And you're not coming and taking their houses from them either. And the judge says, that's right. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward because it's something that I've, believe it or not, I've, for the last two and a half years I've been looking into many different ways of doing it. And I've never felt comfortable with sending the letters um, uh, mainly because it's not just me, it's the rest of my family involved as well. Um so, you know, if there's something, you know, if you've produced something like this, Mike, um, you know, I'll be looking at it, I'll be, I'll be doing it, and I'll be sending it on to a number of friends that I have uh, who will be doing it as well. Right. What we can do, you know, people, the first one is timid. Um, I've already done something which is actually on a more uh, magnificent scale than this and uh, the system and this was many years ago in our bicentennial year actually 1976 um, the system um, demonstrated to me that it was utterly fearful of my challenge to it, which 
was on the very same basis of this uh, thesis of inevitable failure and and singular solution, something I've spoke about since I was 16 years old, you know. Now, I went to, an, I prevailed in a a very adverse place, Um, and yet um, it was only uh, my mastery of the arguments which allowed me to prevail. I mean, we for hours and hours we had legal consultants shuffling back and forth, trying to find answers, unable to dig up anything uh, of, of even the most minute hope of leverage to prevail against me. They were dead in the water. Now, the thing is, I've spent over 40 years in, uh, you know, a person that can prove the Pythagorean theorem off the top of their head isn't something that you, you know, someone that you would, a smart person would generally argue with over a simple, elementary, fundamental math problem, which is all that this obfuscation of the currency and mathematically perfected economy are. Simple word problem that a second or third grader should be able to give you the right answer on. Now, if we're afraid to do this, um, where do we get our courage? We get our courage uh, from reading this one article that will be on the news site over again. And and you're going to see the second time you read it, by God, it's absolutely right. No one could challenge this and prevail. It's absolutely right. You read it a third time. By the fourth or fifth time you've read it, and by God, what are you talking about doing, reading something for a half an hour, that five times over, two and a half hours, which um, eliminates uh, four and a half of the houses that you're paying for one house? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it doesn't over the course of your lifetime. I mean, yeah. think about that. It's preposterous for anyone uh, not to realize how important it is to manage that. But say you read it five times, and you know, you know this 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 thing is right, mathematically perfected economy. You you have complete faith that the world will inevitably do this. And if I know anything, I know that can tell you that it will happen but so you think "Ah, but if I go down there I'm going to be the only one so what do you do you you, like you said call a few friends and no there's a hundred of us let's all go down together and Mm -hmm. do it at the same time everyone town of 10,000 people everybody does it over the course of two months Whatever they go to the sheriff, they go to the DA, they go to the, the 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 court, and they and they go to their bank, and they write that little piece of paper out. We'll pay to the bearer on demand, infinity. Ha ha ha! Same thing you gave me. Now you got it back. You're paid in full, Bubba. You challenge it in court. See you there. Yeah. No, I, I mean it, the the whole uh, the whole idea of it. Um, is just sounds excellent. Sounds like it's an extremely good plan, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to uh, to seeing it implemented, and I'm looking forward to reading it. Um, well, so, uh, and I hope there's a lot of uh, read. Uh, sorry, a lot of listeners out there too that uh, will be doing the same thing. Yeah. Well, we'll find out, and if they don't, well, um, uh, I still. Uh, you know, um, attest that this isn't just about daydreaming. Um, there's a, a lot of people who've asked me to run for political office and more every day. I mean, I explain these things to people and, you know, they're adamant about it. But um, You're just entering their system, though, Mike, aren't you? I mean, that's... People have, uh, have have had this discussion, you know, with me and my son as well already over this. You know, well, let's go and run for office. Well, 
you know, you are just one little cog in that big wheel and, uh, you know, you're not going to do anything because you can't change that system. Well, I would, I would just to test in. my case because, you know, if, if I took the oath of office, uh, you know, the first thing that would come out of my pocket would be a piece of paper and a pen and I would write on that piece of paper, we'll pay to the bearer on demand infinity and i would sign my name to it and that would be that we'd be going to court from the highest office in the land and that's the way it would be if i were president because there's no ifs ands or buts about it all i've done actually is implement what i would have done if i would have been elected president as every person of the country (laughs) yeah (laughs) that's what this this mandate is you know and i don't begrudged uh, to do so uh, only at the behest of the people who would want someone who understood solution to at least um, uh, administer to it, to guide it into, you know, the shape it, it had to be. But in truth, my real belief is, is that the people have to ascend to that capability uh, themselves, um, because uh, we are actually the first and final bastions of of, of representation, and if, if we don't understand what represents us, uh, it's lost. And that's why all this has happened. Uh, I don't see any way that uh, the Federal Reserve Act ever would have been passed amidst a, an apprehending people. Um, it just couldn't happen. Um, especially in betrayal of the 1912 elections in which the Democrat Party platform promised not to create a central bank. Can't happen. You know? Yeah, and, and that was the uh, the very next thing they did. And, Woodrow Wilson, I know. Yeah, and if, if you start out that bad 100 years ago and you build upon that generation after generation after generation, uh, more dedicated to apathy, than uh, rectitude. Sorry, you 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 laid down and made yourself the street for them to roll over. You mm-hmm. know, uh, you know, and I mean, people people get pissed off sometimes when when we explain these things to them, and, and they say, "Well, God, we ought to hang every one of the bastards, chop their heads off, like in the Fred, French Revolution." I, I I can't help but thinking immediately every time I hear that. I think, well, what about yourself then? <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, sure, they're the they're the crooks, but you would have been a crook if you could have been, wouldn't you? Did you know this was wrong? You know, is it is it but by experience the experiencing the brunt of it that you you've learned? And what have you learned yet? You know, here you are. We explain this. You need to you 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 agree that uh, oh well, we determined we determined that exactly what you have. And now uh, you know. I mean, the very next day, the guy goes out and he publishes a petition on petitions online or someplace like that that money can't be a debt. <laughs> You know, I mean, it, we're our worst enemy by far. I mean, if if we're that inept, what do you expect from your congressional representatives? You know, it's no wonder. You know, I I, I don't know if you've seen it, but there, you know, we had a a, a congressman who who actually he, he later said he was joking, but it, it it certainly didn't appear to be in a, a joking way, and nobody thought it was funny. But he was actually postulating that if we built some, you know, further facilities, uh, military facilities on Guam, that the island might capsize, you know. And this is <laughs> this this is in the halls of of government, you know. I mean, I, if 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 this was postulated to me, and it was in a testimony, a hearing over the propriety of all this. You know, there is no way that I would have answered that question politely. You know, no, no way in the world. I mean, what a farce. But that is what's going on in government. And it, but it isn't just neglect. Because, you know, if there was a good bone in, in any of these people, you would think, you know, I could send my email to, you know, whoever, uh, our, 
our vice president, Joe Biden, when he was, you know, in Congress, um, or Barack Obama, or Hillary Clinton, or um, uh, Barney Frank, you know. I've, I've written all of them numerous, numerous times, you know, and not a word. Now, how can that be? Not a word. How could you... How could you possibly, and I've approached this every way under the sun, how could you possibly, not even just in today's time of disintegrating economy, how could you hear of a proposition of mathematically perfected economy and not at least read at least just a few sentences, and if the quality of what those first few sentences alone taught was enough to convince any intelligent person that by God there is a solution to these things. And that's so how I try and score right out the gate with this stuff. How could any of these people, I mean, I have still sealed documents, you know, that I've sent to people and have been returned to me. President Obama, unopened, requested by his campaign. Returned unopened. Requested by his campaign and returned unopened. I frankly find that unbelievable. Yeah, I see that as uh, the right hand not knowing what the left hand is doing. You know, well, somebody wanted to maybe see that and somebody who knew what what, what it really was here's, said, here's uh-oh, really and sent going it back. On in every instance of that. And I mean, I've been um, bought dinners you know, $500 a plate dinner so that I could personally provide uh, a, a proposi- written 20-page proposition, a mathematically perfected economy to candidate Jerry Brown, you know, by one of his best friends, you know, Montana Padva, you know. Um, what, what, what usually goes on in a campaign, um, and my dropping in on the Brown campaign office was, Really, truly, a, a spectacularly memorable event in my lifetime because, you know, I knew sooner, walked in the door, stopped at the reception desk, spoke a few sentences, and uh, uh, top campaign people who were whizzing by all put on the brakes and stopped right there from the first few sentences they heard. And um, this escalated into uh, an actual, you know, impromptu presentation um, on mathematically perfected economy to 300 delegates assembled from all over the country who were flying in at the very moment that I walked in the door, you know, um, into the wee hours of the morning. And no one left, you know. Um, The thing is, um, you know, you can call the campaign office of uh, Barack Obama. And you can talk to a a good citizen, a, 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 a diligent, caring person, um, and without wasting their time, uh, you can gain their ear in three sentences. Um, you can demonstrate your credibility and they will listen to you. And as the lights go on in their own minds and hearts, they realize that, by God, this is the guy that has the proposition that the president has to hear so that... He can be the great president that I know he's going to be. And they believe, and this happens regularly, uh, that someone in a campaign um, understands the gravity of this proposition, you know. And it's a very, very strange thing how it, it dies at the candidate. But I have seen it with my own eyes. Um, I wouldn't endeavor to uh, describe the handshake that I got from Jerry Brown 
when I was introduced to him by Montana Padva immediately after his speech to this huge dinner in San Francisco and uh, provided the opportunity to present a manila envelope full of papers, um, which were a proposition of mathematically perfected economy. He literally turned white as a ghost before my very eyes, couldn't utter a word out of his mouth. He had the oddest expression on his face. And I really truly can't think that the person was just so corrupt that they their mind immediately raced about for some way to avoid me, but I was right there and I had a hold of their hand. And they were in deep trouble, you know. I mean, Montana asked me to give him a brief uh, explanation of it. And I uttered about four or five sentences, which were thoroughly convincing to any intelligent person, you know. Start out, you know, quoting Jefferson and explaining what it means in, in terms that they've never heard before, you know. And yet it died right there and I saw it in front of my very face I got the the limpest coldest handshake of a corpse I've ever got in my life and this guy drew a blank there was just something terribly 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 wrong with him I mean, terribly. I mean, to be, to, to to be running for president and be introduced uh, to a proposition of mathematically perfected economy, to shake the hand of the f person as he utters f f four or five sentences at the behest of one of your dearest friends, and to just go into shock, your jaw drops, you can't utter a word in return. Something is really wrong there, and I don't. You know, I'll, I'll spend the rest of my life trying to put my finger on just what it was. But, you know, I think it's probably simpler than we want to believe. Number one, the guy isn't really about what he's parading himself to be about. Number two, he's not really the intellectual he's learned to pretend to be. Number three, he doesn't have the wherewithal to campaign for something so personally dangerous to himself. And the rest extends from just those few things, you know. But no matter how you stack it up, you know, we could meet in Washington, D.C., we could succeed in getting a meeting with Barack Obama tomorrow morning at 10.13 a.m. We could be on time. We could be dressed right. We could walk in the door. We could have a pleasant introduction. We could sit down, and we could begin to present this. And we couldn't imagine that there was such a wall between us that what was spoken from our side, could not breach that wall to get to the other side. Whatever it was that that person was so predisposed uh, or pre-committed to a different course by all the things that he'd already pledged and, and therefore wouldn't have the slightest inclination to think that he could possibly let someone down by advocating mathematically perfected economy or even diligently hearing our appeal. I mean, it's, it's, it's odd like that because these people are already wrong, because they're already heading the wrong direction, because they're people of false commitments, and because the little respect and support they have from those who they do interact with is because they haven't burned uh, any more bridges than they already have and this is likely to ruffle feathers or excite people or cause people not to achieve other goals that they're intending and I'll be in the middle of that get this person out of my office 
I'm not representative government. I'm about another thing altogether, which is cronyism, uh, whatever, you know. My largest contributor was the financial system, the Bank of New York, you know. And here I am, and you're telling me we've got to get those guys out of the picture? Bye-bye, you know. So, yeah, not going to happen. Not, not anytime soon. Well, not that way it won't. No. Not no. that way it won't. But, you know, they're talking about fiscal austerity now. You know, that's the biggest lie that there is. Why is this a debt to this banking system? You know? Start right there with the foundations of the money. And, I mean, there isn't a good answer. Some of these people think they can answer the question, you know. Like Ellen Hodgson Brown would probably shoot something right out there. <laughs> and if we could contain our laughter, you know, we might smite her for it. But the thing is, uh, you know, these people are unfit to govern. And uh, they are... Uh, do go, bound to do even worse things. I mean, this is a, a a thing I saw begin first in England. You know, they 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 you know just just a you know several months ago, where you know they started talking about fiscal austerity. Well, I'm sorry, do the math, but you can't work your way out of this. It won't work. You know, and the and the other thing is, uh, all this debt was multiplied out of other debt because of you know federal overspending, failing to meet it in the first place. And the debt exists, supposedly, to mere publishers of our promissory obligations to each other, who merely launder, launder the principal into their possession. And so, how is this actually a debt to them? You know, if I write on a piece of paper that you owe me a debt, so that because you're such a fool that you think that's the only thing that you can spend, do I actually owe you so much as that piece of paper ostensibly represents? Absolutely, goddamn not, you know. And so, when 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 we insist on 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 seizing payment of taxes, um, uh, when we formally renounce this government, this mandate even requires the military to go in and arrest the bastards. You know, and uh, immediately hold a, a real election afterward. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I think um, I think what uh, what needs to be done. Um, uh, uh, I think Iceland had probably the best idea by basically saying <laughs> "screw you," and now they're at the point of uh, of throwing out the government and uh, probably bringing in a government of the people, literally. Um, um, well, you know. the problem with that, and I'm in, um, I've had uh, extensive uh, discussions with a number of people over there. Uh, the problem is, um, uh, except for one person, who's uh, quite a young fellow and a remarkable young fellow over there. His name is uh, Thoraren Einerson. Um, uh, except for Thoraren um uh, the people that I've had discussions with, and they are, uh, they have major roles, uh, prominent major roles. Um, they are not, uh, so far, at least as they've proven so far, uh, they don't have the Constitution in truth to deal with these issues. Uh, and so my faith has uh, waned um, for Iceland. Um, uh, there are other developments around the world. Um, there are various reasons that, um, that uh, they haven't uh, achieved uh, more immediate success. Um, uh, but, um, in every case that I see, uh, this mandate, um, is the solution. In Iceland, for instance, <clears throat> uh, the, the people, um, 
you know, I, I, I follow uh, what's going on at times. I'll poke, poke my nose deeply into it. And uh, I see the people appealing for uh, what ha- actually has to be done. And uh, what's happening with these people who are uh, in prominent roles of the new leadership, if you will, um, they're forced to negotiate with this, you know, World Bank, International Monetary Fund, uh, Bank of England. Um, And these are not comfortable events for them to negotiate uh, without having mastered the arguments of inevitable failure and singular solution. You know, um, I mean, I'd love to be slammed in the same room with Timothy Geithner myself, you know. Um, uh, But uh, these people... Are, are like I am, just just people, and they haven't mastered uh, the fact of 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 of, of uh, cause, fundamental cause, um, and and singular solution. They're defenseless where they're going, and then by treading into that area, unprepared as they are, um, they in turn develop fear. Well, these people plant threats against them. You know, well, if you'll do this, we'll cut off your that. If you do that, we'll cut off all this. Um, The people of Iceland will starve. You know, we will be laughing. We will own your country. You know, I mean, you know, that's an exaggeration, of course. But, um, you know, they are threats, you know, and they're not even... um, uh, but I don't necessarily think that they're idle threats either, Mike, because I think um, Argentina was a prime example of sure. uh, the IMF, uh, you know, sticking the boot in, so to speak. Sure, absolutely. Um, but the thing is, if Argentina, um, you know, uh, which, you know, is a A very European-like country, you know. Uh, uh, if it if it mastered the arguments and put its own foot down, it would be a whole different story. Because after all, these banks want all this money. Okay, fine. Here it is. What is this money? This irredeemable promise to pay. I'm going to pay you right now. Here it is. And I'll sign my name to it. And there you are. And what do we do? Well, we're going to cut off all your funding to do this. You'll never borrow any money from us again. Thank you very much. Because we will publish our own promissory obligation notes. Just like in my parable of perfect economy, except it's it's for real. You know, it's like, who, you know, what are these guys in our business for anyway? These people are interventionists. Uh, you know, they have no business in uh, publishing the money that our country depends on, monetizing our wealth, laundering the principal into their possession, and then multiplying the, the, the first falsified indebtedness into terminal indebtedness, and then keeping us there forever with one boot on our, our throat and the other up our you-know-what, you know. No, thank you. You know, in fact, you're not welcome in our country anymore. You know? yeah, actually, that that kind of brings up um, a, a question as to what happens with all of the uh, what used to be public resources uh, that are now privatized. Uh, you know, such as the electricity and the gas and you know, whatever else, hi- well, yeah, hydro they would call it, but we call it electricity. So, yeah, I mean, those kind of things, natural resources of the country that are now in private hands. Well, um, each country will have to resolve those issues however it, it deems fit. Um, my personal opinion 
is that once uh, something needfully uh, must be recognized as a vital public infrastructure, it has no business being in private hands, operated for um, unearned profit, that is, um, uh, by the leverage of this banking system, we could take over all the power, you know, utility companies in the world, in each country, all right, easily. And then we could charge exorbitant um, uh, prices for producing electricity. Say it costs us um, a half a cent a kilowatt hour to produce electricity. We charge the public 35 cents. All right. And you can imagine um, what, uh, you know, um, disorder um, and further injustice that would precipitate. Um, so the choices are, of the country are to nationalize um, the privatized infrastructure or uh, to submit it to regulation, um, which allows it to operate at uh, legitimate margins of profit, uh, but not to exploit us by the leverage of being the only provider of our electrical power upon which depend we depend upon. Um, bringing us to our knees to pay 35 cents a uh, kilowatt hour for electricity that cost half a cent to produce. So those are our, our two options. Um, uh, mathematically perfected economy is a perfection of the s system to sustain our uh, commercial interaction between each other. Um, just commercial interaction. Now, in this case that we're evaluating here, we have uh, a, an unjust uh, uh, intervention, if you will, um, uh, a thing we call capitalism, uh, uh, which is leveraging um, an advantage um, into uh, even further disadvantage of our market. And that's not just commercial endeavor by any stretch of the imagination. So I say every country of the world has a right um, to nationalize. Um, and uh, just by the way, this mandate uh, prevents the privatization of public infrastructures, these roads that are being sold to foreign countries and whatnot, um, this is outlawed by this mandate. Um, so uh, we have to understand the difference between true, desirable, just industrial production and manipulation which seeks to gain advantages which translate to means to exploit the subject people you know the latter is 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 absolutely a crime against us and it's not a matter uh, that anyone who engages in um uh, just endeavor uh, would even consider. Um, this is something that, you know, may never go away completely because people are capable of, you know, committing evil. But I would expect um, that, let's just say, that the sources of electricity for this particular country of our example are uh, you know, hydroelectric plants. Well, we could say, well, you know, this water belongs to all of us. 
uh, we built a dam, you know, it's like, this is what you can do, you know. You have 14 people who work here. You have an emergency crew of so many furthers. This costs so much. That translates to about half a cent a kilowatt hour for electricity for the entire country. And excuse us, those are the only people producing anything here. And that's all we're giving you. And that's that, you know. So you can rectify these things, and you, you have to decide to do it. You know, uh, people are attacking, um, you know, Hugo Chavez for many years as if he's a, a socialist. Well, you know, all I see, and, you know, I could be wrong about this, of course, but uh, I see a person who's, who's attempting um, to um, restore the rightful personal prosperity of a free country, you know, and uh, there are difficult challenges in the way of that, um, and, uh, you know, the people who accuse him of a so being a socialist um, are not necessarily um, correct at all, and what's wrong about that from our point of view is that we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't just allow people to sling, you know, to slander a person. Uh, liberally in such a way, um, likely because, uh, you know, they have an axe to grind, they have a personal ulterior mo motive, which they would certainly divulge to us if uh, if they weren't themselves ashamed of it. So, you know, the name-calling stuff, you know, uh, leads you to smell a skunk right away. I mean, smell the sulfur in Chavez's terms, which I really, I, I stood up and gave him a, a one-man standing ovation when I heard that. <laughs> I tend to agree with you, actually, though, Mike, because, I mean, I've, I've looked a little bit into the story of Hugo Chavez, too, and um, about I think it was about 10% of the population of Venezuela were actually... Um, benefiting from 90% of the wealth of Venezuela and of course a big portion of that was the oil and gas industry uh -huh. uh, I think is it Stanley Oil I think was the name of the original company down there I'm not sure. Standard Oil, I thought, was down there uh, stand, yeah it could be Standard then I know it was something similar to that but um, I think what happened is that when he came into power uh, in 1998 he actually set up uh, an actual people's constitution and probably the only true constitution throughout the world uh, because it was one that was uh, created and mandated by the people of Venezuela whereas a lot of the constitutions of existing countries were actually set up by the you know the, the elites and the powers of the country right. a long time ago right. um, you know the people never had anything to do with it yeah exactly yeah the American Constitution included yeah and especially the Canadian I mean that was pretty much set up by uh, Quebec and um, Newfoundland Labrador and then you know ratified and changed slightly by the English Parliament before it, it came back and became the uh, uh, British North American Act. So I, I think he he has been a true, um, uh, you know, a true father, if you like, of uh, a constitution in in Venezuela, and also, as you rightly say, um, trying to return the wealth and power of the country back to the people. Right. Uh, uh, and he was ousted for it in 2002. Fortunately, he had a lot of supporters, not least of which was the, most of the population of Venezuela, uh, who, who got him back in power. Uh, and I believe, funnily enough, the majority of the people who uh, took cabinet positions and that of the president uh, ending up uh, actually in the USA, which probably says a lot for the reason behind the uh, coup the in the first place. Yeah. Uh, exactly, yeah. yeah. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. And um, a, a, a chief gauge, um, uh, you know, I, I saved a copy of, several copies of it actually, um, um, uh, 
there was a video that was circulating years back. It was uh, the revolution will not be t- televised. You you may have yeah have that too <laughs> yeah. Um, well, <clears throat> the thing that's striking about that, I mean, here you have such a um, beloved political leader accused of such dark things by um, um, people here, for instance. Um, and yet, riding down the streets of practically third world country and standing in the back of a pickup truck with everything from mentally retarded children to little boys and men on bicycles, you know, pedaling for all they're worth to stay alongside the truck and salute him and everything. I mean, his people genuinely love him far beyond anything which has happened in this country, in the United States, that is, in my lifetime, you know. I mean, the most beloved president that we had was Kennedy, even, you know, before he was shot, you know. But that was, you know, uh, extremely, uh, an extremely moderate degree and expression of love to compared to what is you know obvious throughout that entire video the revolution will not be televised you know and i mean you know if 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 he was one of the founders you know we'd be we we, we would be considering him one of our greatest leaders of all time. It's because, you know, he stood against the oil companies that, you know, he's a he's a black sheep. And, uh, you know, the worst criminals in the world would like to rub him out, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, the question is, who do these natural resources belong to, you know? And what is the proper reward um, for harvesting them? You know, but to be paid for the cost of your trouble, which is what most of us um, expect for our work. And why is it any different for something like oil? It's different because those who seek it are the major players, and they got to be major players because it's all about leverage. It's all about the deal that you can swing. It's all about getting the most, no matter what the actual cost and just profit are. And that's why people like that dislike men like Chavez. And that's why he's called names, you know, um, a socialist. But, you know, if if we had a, a Hugo Chavez in every country of the world, I don't think it'd be very long before we had mathematically perfected economy. You know, I've had people down there um, contact me and desire to put us into you know, contact for many years. I've had people here, I've had people all over the world say, you know, Hugo Chavez, you have to talk to him. And, you know, it's, well, here, you know, it's, well, I have a friend who's a singer and she's going to see him in two weeks and I'll send her your letter and, you know, and uh, she'll deliver it to him personally. And, you know, I've been told he's written me back. I've never heard from the man. Nothing he's ever sent me has ever reached me. And so far as I know, anything I've ever sent him has never reached him, save for, you know, something that's maybe been personally delivered a time or two and no response has ever come back. And imagine how that could work. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) I don't know whether he's got people around him or not that uh, would prevent that the same as i think you know congressmen and people in power in washington too. i don't yeah i don't think it has anything to do with people that he has around him um i think it it's it's strictly you know um people here you know strictly i mean mm-hmm. i have <clears throat> i have a you know a pretty extensive you know uh background so to speak of you know, experiences um, where, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's obvious that national governments are, are watching me, you know. And, 
it, it's a strange coy game that they that they play it's as if they feel they already understand everything well enough that they'll use what they want out of it for their purposes and since you know it's the understanding of it that they're hoping to you know benefit by gaining some further advantage over other countries which is their whole intent to use it in other words they don't have the right motive at all um and maybe it's different maybe uh maybe there's something going on here um as well but you know it's it's quite interesting because i have security people uh i have intelligence community people you know who volunteer information and and assistance to me because they think what i'm doing is so important um and and yet we can't we can't reach the 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 the, the powers that be and you know it just bespeaks so much ineptitude if ineptitude were to explain it, that ineptitude can't possibly explain it itself. And so there has to be a a very substantial component of corruption in every case. And I mean, you know, I speak about my plagiarists because to me, they're the very, 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 very same kind of people. Um... You know, uh, because they they compromise all print. I mean, you know, Stephen Zarlinga so carefully emulated me in a very amateurish way that you know it's inescapable. Um, you know, for for me at least to 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 even hear the titles of the chapters of his book and realize that son of a bitch. You know, <laughs> I mean, frankly pisses me off because you know how could you be such a a pretentious crank and divert all the attention from solution for your your petty self well you know if what we need to do actually succeeded to reach let's just say the first tier of uh, process uh, that would eventually develop what those guys are going to call a solution in the end. You wouldn't, you wouldn't see the papers that prove mathematically perfected economy disappear as the door shut behind the person that took them in to whoever's office. And already there would be plans to change it from the only thing that would be solution. I just see it. It's just like the little game that you played when you were children, you know, and you whisper somebody, something in somebody's ear, you know. Their politicians just have to change stuff. They have to have their hand on it. You know, if there's, you know, if the paper says explicitly that that it's about to prove that there is one and one only solution, first for inflation and deflation, the first thought in that guy's head is, ah, oh, nah, uh, well, that doesn't matter. Um, I got another idea that I'm going to do. You know, it's it's they're that quick um, to abandon the only principles that can serve us, and that's such a dangerous thing that. Uh, you know the the degree that we've allowed it to progress to at this point leaves only one thing to save us and that is that we the people have to do better than the politicians and the plagiarists we have to realize well this guy says one solution he was here first i can see the one solution in it is it a fact of one solution or not? Why are these other people all over the map? 
Why did they come here in the first place? Why are they uh, uh, plagiarizing his, his parable of perfect economy as if it was actual history, not even knowing any better? <laughs> you know, I mean, proving the whole thing right there, you know. It's, you know, that's why we have the problems we have. If we're not any better than that at is people and we just say, "Oh, that Mike Montana guy—he, he, he grumbles all the time about plagiarism." Well, he sure as hell all do. And what's your problem? You don't believe in intellectual property? Everything I've ever written's got a copyright on it. You know? Mm, yeah. These, these yeah. people discovered this. These people who are pretending to advocate solution unraveled this mystery. And are, you know, there's just person after person is publishing a book about the secrets of money. It's not a secret. You know, I exposed it 40 years ago. These people don't even believe in intellectual property rights unless they're claiming it is their intellectual property and they stole it. <laughs> you know, that's how screwed up we are. You know? Yeah. But that doesn't, you know, that doesn't happen in, um, you know, that. You know, in, uh, in uh, let's say, um, genuine disciplines, these kinds of things uh, just, they don't happen. You know, there's a, a famous story. Um, it's, uh, you know, when, when, when Einstein um, uh, went to formally develop the mathematics of his uh, general theory of relativity. Um, uh, there was a mathematician who attended um, a lecture that Einstein gave uh, uh, where he exposed the basic idea of, of, of his his uh, theory of uh, you know general relativity, which you know explains you know how you know energy determines how matter uh, uh, will look in space and time uh, determines how it behaves. <laughs> you know it's like you know this is excuse me. Uh, you know, Ellen Hodge and Brown is sitting out there. And next thing you know, um, there's a, a new book um, about the Ponzi scheme that explains the theory of uh, general relativity, a, a thing that she can't even articulate, uh, much less develop into its mathematic solution, you know. Well, the, the the thing about this famous story is um, that this mathematician and I, his name escapes me, uh, he realized in attending this lecture that this was a a freaking brilliant idea, this concept, this theory of uh, general relativity, um, a true milestone for mankind but he realized at the same time <clears throat> that Einstein who is um, in truth uh, a very um, accomplished mathematician um, wasn't the guy to do the math he realized <clears throat> from di from attending this lecture that he could figure out the math, and he could do it faster than Einstein was going to do it. Einstein had been working on it for years. And he actually went off and set about to do this. <clears throat> and evidently there's some, you know, controversy over who actually got the math right first. But uh, they did at the same time. But the thing about this, um, a, a true discipline um uh practition uh, pr practiced by um dignified genuine people um while this mathematician came up with the math uh, possibly just ahead of einstein he didn't claim it 
for himself. He said, no, it's Einstein's theory. Therefore, let Einstein have his math, you see. And, of course, uh, that's the only right thing to do. But what we have is we have all these plagiarists running around pretending, not only pretending um, that they're introducing further arguing with me that their solution, which they can't even prove is a solution, deserves better to be passed by Congress than mine. Actually, Ellen Hodge and Brown said her solution was a trillion times, trillion times, literally. That's what she wrote more likely to be passed by Congress, as if Congress was not even going to notice that she took away interest from the banks. And, of course, you know, Congress isn't about to understand that her mere pretended solution is actually solution, especially when there's no proof of it or explanation even how it possibly accounts for stuff. She just basically says that, oh, if I put this money in circulation, it stays in circulation. It it therefore funds all these things, not explaining, well, how is it then that it funds my house if I can't borrow money and money can't be a debt? You know, well, you can save it right out of that. Well, that's the problem, don't you see? The reason that she doesn't realize it is because... She actually hasn't even put her toe in the pool yet of, of doing the math. I mean, the math is following all this stuff out and go, hey, wait a minute. If money can't be a debt, that means I can't issue a promissory obligation to pay for a house, even though I can pay for the house. Is that good for me? How is it? I might be 70 years old before... You know, I can save enough money to buy for the house by cash. And Alan Hodgson Brown is smiling as if that's all to my benefit. <laughs> what was wrong with the concept of paying for the house as they consume of it, especially since I can readily afford, could have readily afford it, and if the, the, the 50 years or whatever you forced me to save over caused me to be exploited by, a, you know, a, a rentier class who... Who, who who sought to drive up the cost of renting far above the cost of ownership because that was its means of, of exploitation and sustenance. You know, you know, you're not talking about justice when you just basically say, Well, this'll work. Well how? You know? But the problem is, you know, I'm sorry, but that person who makes that assertion should be laughed off the planet, not just by me, but by everyone who heard it. Why isn't everyone finding that fault in it? Why are, are literally millions of people standing up now and saying, oh, money can't be a debt. Read, watch this video, money has debt. The video is preposterous. It's, it's produced by people who haven't the slightest idea of the math or what they're talking about or the fact that money can't be a debt. How can money have no obligation whatsoever? And is an obligation a debt? You know, how can money have no obligation whatsoever? You know, they dream that it can. Oh, you could just spend it in circu into circulation. Well, if you have no means of retracting it, then it's inflationary. Well, we do have a means of, of, of retracting it. It's called taxation. Well, then, you're not simply spending it into circulation then, are you? You know, so that's that's how that's how transparent their petty little lie to themselves is that they're spending it into circulation and they've proven it. You know, when somebody points out there's a deficiency in the limitations of that incredibly oversimplistic concept, you know, the first thing they do is answer back immediately with a retort. Oh, well, I can take care of that. We'll just tax it out of circulation, you know. All right, so you may be able to do so in such a way which is, is not inflationary then, but how is it you distribute the burden of the taxation in accord with consumption of the property so that everyone is paying for what they consume in a just way? Well, they don't want to answer you anymore because they know 
that the only answer is to come back to the answer that you already provided and they've stolen from and changed into something else that isn't an answer. But what are they doing the rest of the afternoon and the next day? They're posting to the Ron Paul Forum that money can't be a debt. You know? And that's what we have. That's what our problem is, is that people are actually that pathetically stupid that they actually think that others could respect them for uttering preposterous, simplistic non-truths endlessly, ceaselessly against actual solution as if they were right there with solution all the while. You know, life isn't like that. You know, we all have to meet our, you know, our day of 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 judgment of, amongst each other because one day or another we have to decide, well, shit, what are we doing here? Yeah, I think the money is debt thing is, uh, or at least, uh, you know, not not having money as debt is a ridiculous concept these days anyway because if you if we have to go back to uh uh no debt then we're back to the old system of well we have to have gold or, and silver in our pockets if they believe that's the only value then that's how we're going to be doing business um and I'm afraid you'll have the same system as they had five, six hundred years ago, where the poor people don't have the gold and the rich people do. Um, so, you know, we're no better off. Well, there's there's other possible, you know, implementations of it. Um, you could do better than that. Um, but, you see, the problem is uh, what you have, basically, is mere simpletons um, who are interested more in attention and effect um, than the genuine interest of solving the problem of, of humanity. Because they're, an intelligent person has no tendency to so simplify the issue to think, well, because I read this parable of perfect economy, I don't even want to admit to the guy that I, who, who wrote it that I read it and that it influenced me. And I've just taken off on this tangent that money can't be a debt because that's my gut knee-jerk reaction to the parable, which I don't really understand. I got it wrong because I didn't notice that there's a planted flaw in it, which was part of the instrument of teaching, and, you know, and so, you know, this person is just wrong, 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 right down the whole path, but they insist, nonetheless, that they're right. You can explain exactly how they're wrong over and over to them, and I mean, I can actually name people who do this. There's a fellow in Europe that just, I can't believe that I, I run into him everywhere, and he's claiming money can't be a debt. And it's been explained to him over and over and over again. I mean, essays, you you know, you, a, a regular person want to, would want to frame and put on the wall if they wrote it. Utterly, thoroughly disproving this concept. Can't possibly answer for all the, all the cyclings of the life cycle that money has to account for, you know, and proving what incredible disadvantages this money is, not to mention all of the entirely redundant bureaucracy that it requires to somehow measure the circulation and constantly be adjusting for it if they're maintaining an inflation and deflation circulation as they actually claim. Of course, they're not describing how to do this, but this is what you would have to do if you if you went about it this way. So you'd have to be constantly measuring the circulation. You'd have to constantly be maintain, measuring the remaining value of uh, representative wealth, uh, representable wealth, and you would constantly have as your devices of manipulating this circulation, the options of spending it on things you, you may or may not need at all, but 
if you had to get it into circulation, of course, if your only option was to spend it on something that wasn't necessary, you're creating yet another thing. A problem with that is the two things exist, and the money is is spent in this circulation to re- represent the other thing, not the thing it was actually spending a circulation on. So you have a disproportionate anomaly right there, which you're engendering, and it goes on and on and on, you know, to to get the money out of circulation. Likewise, your options may not be to cause people to spend it out, out of circulation, to pay for something, you know, which is what they're consuming. And yet, if you reattach all these points and, and relationships to what they w- truly relate to, you re- restore their claim to mathematically perfected economy. By the time you account for every cent of circulation so that it is paid out of circulation justly, thus by who consumes of it, to the extent that they consume of it, you have mathematically perfected economy. That's their your obligatory schedule of payment. It automatically maintains an inflation and deflation-free circulation, even without any regulation. You see, so all that all that this idea comes from is plagiarism, and the guy has a a half-baked at best idea that he's come up with a solution to which you can't even articulate, and the original author that he stole from can readily disprove, has disproven countless times, and yet still they go every day about, about, and about, uttering like a, a mockingbird. Money can't be a debt. And all that was was their stupid, knee-jerk reaction to the fact that I raised that interest inherently and irreversibly multiplies artificial indebtedness into terminal artificial indebtedness. But debt isn't the problem. It's the multiplication of debt which is the problem. Debt, especially if it's the only means of monetizing anything, and it's not really debt at all, but an obligation to pay for things as we consume of them, is an advantage because it's the only way, in fact, that you can monetize anything rightly. No one has ever suggested an alternate proposition which works out. They haven't accounted for all of the issues, and that's why these stupid simpletons just simply regurgitate these preposterous, half-baked ideas if they're a, a wholly accountable solution. They're not. In fact, I'm being really polite. I mean, frankly, they're... It's just pathetically ignorant uh, and um, and it reflects a pathetic lack of integrity that anyone is advocating these preposterous things could possibly uh, solve our monetary issues. I mean, a thing that really pisses me off about it, um, you know, I had a woman a couple years ago, you know, uh, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm stammering a little bit because I, you know, I, I'm, I don't really like to, you know, uh, raise something like this because uh, even as it is a truth, that weighs upon me every day. Um, but there was a, a fellow in uh, one of the Ron Paul forums who suggested I be drug out into the street and shot. And, of course, you know, he had asserted all these uh, false precepts and the basic dogma of Austrian economics and just basically called me wrong rather than being able to prove. And uh, everyone else was agreeing that indeed he was wrong, but he suggested I be drug out in the street and shot. And the thing about that is that I actually agree with the uh, severity of the penalty. Um, 
That is, uh, indeed, you know, if you speak about this, your words should be golden. But the thing is, um, who, I spent years reconfirming this, bouncing it off the most intellectual people on the planet, you know. And, uh, you know, uh, I got nothing but validation from extremely disciplined people. Um, And it was, you know, 10, 11 years before I even formally published the ID, even though I spoke about it on virtually a daily basis. But I never stood up until I was so certain of myself uh, to a degree that, you know, people would, would, would rarely impose upon themselves as a standard because it's that important to be right. And that was, even that was over 30 years ago, you know. So I side with this fellow who says, well, you know, the guy who's wrong should be drug out in the street here. And what I'm saying is, all right. So if you're wrong, drag yourself out in the street and shoot yourself. But I'm saying this to Ellen Hodge and Brown as well. You know, um, I asked her, you know, if she was willing to stake the fate of humanity on the veritability of her purported solution. And she disappeared from the forum without another remark, without ever answering. And I have a a huge problem with that. Uh, Not only because I have worked so long, not just to prove I'm right, but to do it tens of thousands of times over, to write software, to test the idea. I've done the math like no one on the planet has even conceived of doing. But a woman called me a few years ago, and, you know, and she was losing her home, uh, and... uh, I know this person uh, remotely, uh, good lady. And, um, you know, uh, she, when she found out about what I do, um, she took the most diligent interest in it immediately and mastered it for herself. And before you know it, I mean, she had several members of her family and friends who actually have immediate family, who are members of the Obama administration. She's got several propositions of mathematically perfected economy um, into the Obama administration, just on her own volition and her own initiative. But she called me a few year, a couple years ago to talk to me about things, and and um, and uh, in the process of our discussion, she informed me, <clears throat> and I don't know that this is a fact, but uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all. She informed me, she asked me, did I know that there are 125,000 children under the age of 12 roaming the streets of Los Angeles homeless? Well, no, I did not know this. But my problem is, well, airheads like Ellen Hodgson Brown are casually musing and being cute about a possible solution here or a possible solution here or saying, in my model, and they haven't even created a model, and they haven't even followed it all out and tested it even in their own minds, much less modeled it. And and, and they put up a site for 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 a, a wiki uh, 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 site for for input from other people wanting to compromise solution into something that's agreeable to all. <laughs> I have a I have a huge problem with that. When you know how however many twelve year old girls uh, are are going to be raped tonight in Los Angeles because they don't even have a a proper home, you know, or protection from whatever, you know, might happen to them. And, you know, I don't think that 
any responsible person, um, uh, and I mean even remotely responsible person, could possibly take these things so lightly as to advocate something is a solution which they can't even articulate uh, at least some facsimile of a proof which would demonstrate, in fact, that it is wholly accountable for the even just the issues that it has to address. Never mind getting it right, but at least to do that much work. To pretend that you have a solution on anything less, I'm sorry, um, but that's, that's, it's unforgivable. Yeah. Uh, well, I have to agree with you on that one, uh, Mike. I'm, obviously, you've put forward plenty of evidence. Um, I've read, um, you know, Ellen's book and a few other of the uh, um, publications that she uh, that she puts out. I haven't really done anything with Stephen Zarlinga, but I have seen the other movies as well that you refer to, the uh, Bill Still movies and um, I forget the actual Paul Grogan is it that does the money uh, money is debt um, and I, I mean I have to agree they, they they talk a lot about the history and a lot about the, the problem um, but I, I don't see anywhere that there's any solution um, you know other than on some circumstances or some parts of it they they talk about uh, interest um, but they, they don't really go into any great detail either. So, uh, and you do, of course. So, uh, so that, that that's where I'm going to be focusing my attention, because if somebody's got a plan and they've got a solution, then uh, uh, you know if it can be backed up with the mathematics as well, and um, you know qu questions answered, then that should be the way we should look. Uh, and you know nothing's ever perfect. Uh, but we have to assume that it's as close to being perfect as we can possibly make it under the current circumstances. Well, on 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 that one point, you know, I, I only like to point out that no, mathematically perfected economy is perfect, and that is, um, you know, uh, what 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 people who 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 uh you know who wh whose disciplines aren't so challenging that um they are required to resolve uh so many factoids into a solution don't understand is that um scope is the whole issue there that is uh the father of solution understands the scope to which I refer to when I say mathematically perfected economy. <clears throat> many, many, many years ago, um, early 70s, I had to come up with a name for this. People say you have to use a name for this because instead of using a name, I would redefine it. I would restate it. And, of course, that's quite verbose um, in the case of something such as this. But uh, the fact of the matter is, is, okay, I had to come up with a name. So what was the process? My mathematically perfected economy. What is the end result? A mathematically perfected economy, <laughs> you know, um, Sounds audacious. It did back then. Um, but then, uh, again, what is this? But simple accounting. Uh, where does it go awry? A couple of places. Pretending to be a creditor. Laundering principal into your possession. And uh, uh, charging interest for it when the only actual risk property is the negligible costs of publication as if that justified interest. The actual rate of interest applied to the risk 
of the cost of publication is an incredible rate of interest if you ever do the math on that. So the thing is that as a father of something such as this, you have tread down every path to the point that it is a well-worn trail and you realize where you get to on the point of the trail where owing to uh, political controversy um, personal imperfections uh, popul the imperfections of a populace um, where people would deviate from this. But what the perfection of it is, is the principles to follow. And that is eradication of interest and a, an obligatory schedule of payment at the rate of consumption or depreciation, which are understood to be um, different in expressions for what is to be understood to be the same thing. That is, the rate of consumption or depreciation uh, are, 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 are to be understood to be alternate expressions for the same thing. A thing which retires circulation so that the remaining circulation is equal to the remaining value of represented property. And that in itself is perfect. And that's where I draw the line in the scope. There is such a thing as mathematically perfected economy. There's nothing imperfect about that at all. And that's the principle. That's the guideline. Now, when we, the people say, oh, but I'm going to take very good care of my, you know, my 1979 Chevelle. It's going to last for 40 years. You know, I want it depreciated over 40 years. And the other guy says, I'm going to race mine around the neighborhood, and I'm going to crash it into the first tree I feel like running into, maybe even sooner. Uh, all right, we'll depreciate yours over six days. You know, these are not imperfections of mathematically perfected economy. This is our immediate tendency to deviate from it. What are we doing with this prescription for uh, depre uh, depreciation and consumption that we have to pay at. All we're doing is determining a general pattern which does not have to be perfect at all so that it accomplishes a relatively perfect f effect um, which is so many times uh, more fit and more capable of sustaining prosperity that it's 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 phenomenal. Uh, you know, immediately we may prosper twelve times as much for a conversion to mathematically perfected economy without even starting to you know embarking on the potential renaissance which which could ensue. The thing is, isn't it? It's imperfect because of the ways that we wrestle over implementing it. Those are things that we do, and our guideline toward perfection always has to be the principle that indeed what we want to do is to depreciate the property at a rate of consumption which reflects the remaining value of it. That's really the only necessary principle that we implement. And yeah, we're going to get that wrong. One country is going to decide, well, we got it wrong, so we'll put some band-aids on it. We'll do an Ellen Hodge and Brown thing. You know, we'll, you know, stab some knives in the cut and then we'll cover up the bleeding and then it's all good, you know. And that's us. That's us deviating from the principle. Would it would a would a mature uh, self-governed society would do, would say, okay, look, all right, 
This is how long that should last. Let's take this de-escalated rate of depreciation, the default one. It works perfectly fine for virtually everything we do. Let's just accurately determine classes of lifespans, fit things in like that, and let's do something else. You know, let's make a person not pay necessarily, but have so much reserve payments, which would also help us um, to protect ourselves from, uh, 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 you know, non-payment. Well, another person would raise their hand and say, no, 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 wait, wait a minute, okay? Under mathematically perfected economy, the remaining value of the represented property is always sufficient to recoup non-payment. Therefore, there isn't any risk. I said, well, that isn't what we want to have happen. There might be court costs. You know, there might be, they might vandalize the property. Let's do something else. Well, the thing is, there's ways of taking care of all these issues, which we introduce to the equation for absolutely needless behavior, which is counterproductive, if not destructive to ourselves. And yeah, we can account for these different ways, and each one of them can be affected, but that's not economy. That's enforcing the obligations upon ourselves. And that's why I'm distinguishing between the two. Yeah, there is such a thing as mathematically perfected economy. But our own disagreement about rate of depreciation or means of enforcement is where we're departing from mathematically perfected economy because, you know, outside of you know, natural catastrophes, um, you know, there isn't any, you know, expectable reason uh, under mathematically perfected economy that debts aren't met um, that at least doesn't exist under any other proposition and in almost every conceivable, conceivable case would have to exist to a far greater degree. Yes, you cannot eliminate uh, human aberration or deviation from the principle because humans are imperfect and they're going to do these things to, to themselves. The fact is, still, there's a mathematically perfected economy and we are the deviants, you know. So that's how I see it, whether or not other people would agree with that or not. It matters none to me because the fact is, you know, if you depreciate and pay for anything according to its rate of depreciation. The remaining uh, circulation is always equal to the remaining value of represented wealth. And that's it. That is mathematically perfected economy. So no further argument about that um, from me. Uh, what, what I think is unfortunate is other people, you know, tend to think that, well, we need to put our hands on it, you know, they don't even have a way that they're going to make it perfect from their perception, which is outside the scope of mathematically perfected economy, which is, you know, the human deviation from the principle. Um, and if we get caught up in, in, in that, not realizing, hey, well, look, okay, so that is true. It's mathematically perfect. Let's follow it for crying out loud. What else have you got to do? You can't make it more perfect, you know. <laughs> it, it perfectly answers for the variables, and we are determining how we are going to implement our own definitions of those variables in our own deviant manner. But that goes beyond mathematically perfected economy. It's, it's implementation. So it's already been done. It's already here to do. Um, and, you know, we could do this tomorrow if, uh, if we were such a people, um, if we weren't the subjects of unjust government, I believe we would do it tomorrow. Uh, you know, I mean, everyone would be sending this file around in the morning and, you know, everybody would spend the day listening to it because, you know, there was you know, no more profitable thing to do, and it was that imperative. And, uh, you know, by the end of the day, we would have decided that, you know what, we're seizing payment on all our debts arising from this system. We're challenging them. We're even too challenging them. To challenge them, we're, we're paying them with a piece of paper, 
Um, and uh, we're only doing that not to uh, uh, relieve ourselves of our debts, but instead to uh, reconstitute our debts to their what they actually comprise, which was originally a promissory obligation to pay principal out of circulation. And the reason it is that, even though we might have agreed to something else stupidly, is the fact is that the banking system pret- only pretends to be a creditor. It never gave up anything equal of value to the debt which ostensibly exists to it and which it claims exists to it. And, and we have to challenge that. And we have to prevail over that because it is wrong, wrong, wrong. Thanks so much for listening. It's an honor to be heard at a time when all of us so direly need to understand these vital matters.